This is Audible. And now, Part 2 of Annihilation, written by B. V. Larson and read by Mark Boyette. Chapter 21 The first report back from Captain Gaines and his recon group came in less than an hour after we'd reached the beach. I decided not to sit around and was making headway up to Tango's ridges. We were moving slowly, expecting an ambush at every twist in the land. I felt we could afford the time. The three battalions at the bottom of the sea offshore weren't drowning yet. They had another forty hours of air and supplies. Major Sloan and I decided they would do best by staying in position. If they could hit the island defenders from the front while we were rolling up their flanks, we could destroy them in detail. Their trap would become our trap. All these fancy ideas faded when Gaines called in and made his report. Colonel Rigged, we have problems, he said. I can see by your locator you're pretty far up the ridge, Gaines. Are you under fire? No, sir, that's the problem. I'm going from gun nest to gun nest. They're all empty. The enemy has clearly been repositioning. I cursed quietly. Where the hell are they? Unknown, sir. They have plenty of those automated gun turrets wherever they are. We've counted twenty-two empty gun sites. I was stunned. You ran into twenty-two gun emplacements just while climbing the next ridge of the island? How many do they have at their stronghold? I'm not sure they have a stronghold, sir. Trust me, they do. Their tactics are clear. They saw us hitting their flank and reacted by sending out worker machines to withdraw their defensive systems from this side of the island. That means they're building up a concentration, probably at the center of the T. That makes sense, Colonel, but I can't confirm any of it. I haven't met up with a single active defensive system yet. All right, keep going until you do. Rig's out. I turned to the mass of men trudging up the hillside all around me. Sloan, I roared. Get them moving. There's nothing to stop us for the next few miles. Let's pick up the pace. Shouted orders rippled through the units. Soon every knee joint was whining and rasping as armored legs moved faster. We stopped crawling over the land looking for an ambush at every turn and began trotting. The power suit batteries were in pretty good shape at this point. We designed the generators to be able to keep up with a light drain and still retain a full charge. A man could trot along for hours in them and never move the needle on his battery levels. But firing his weapon or flying would begin the inevitable drain. Along the way uphill, I contacted the commanders of the battalions that were still sitting off the coast. I ordered them to ready themselves to advance onto the shores. Sloan trotted up next to me as I made these arrangements. I've done a little math, sir, he said. The macros are very predictable, even for machines. Tell me what you figured out, Major, I said encouragingly. Sloan was naturally laid back, some may even say a lazy officer. But when he felt his safety and the safety of his unit was in question, he suddenly turned on the steam. He became a much more efficient officer in dangerous situations, which was partly why I kept placing him in harm's way. They like to use predictable patterns for the spread of their resources, especially when they don't have any critical basis on which to make their placement decisions. Basically, if they had ten square miles to cover and ten guns, they would place one on each square mile. I nodded. So you're saying they've probably covered the island with defensive systems evenly up until now, when they realized they were under threat from two fronts and their systems as placed weren't enough to stop us, they rewrote their algorithm. Exactly, sir. They'll cluster them up on the top of the highest point, making it harder to take the entire island. We pretty much knew that, Sloan. Yes, sir, but I figured out how many weapons they have based on the number found and the number of square miles covered. Ah, okay, I said, getting where he was going with this. That's good thinking and might even be accurate. What did you come up with? Two hundred and ninety guns, sir. That's only if they withdrew all the guns from all three legs of the island. Two hundred and ninety, I said, thinking about it. I didn't like the image that number conjured in my mind. It was grim, in fact. They would tear up my men. 
The number of guns a force faces does not cause a precisely incremental number of casualties to the attacking side, I said. You know that, don't you? Yes, sir. There are plenty of factors, like the shock of the strikes on the men. They'll tend to advance more slowly while their comrades are falling. Also, they'll be able to concentrate fire and take people down much faster with so many guns. Ten guns would be nothing. We'd take them easily. But two or three hundred... That kind of force could stop our attack cold. The enemy will rip us a new one. That's my conclusion. I glanced at him suspiciously. Sloan was not known for his self-sacrificing nature. I guess you're about to request we drop a nuke on the center of the island. I thought about that, but I think it would fail. The enemy is sure to have enough AA to stop a small barrage of missiles— We'd have to abandon the island and pound the place from orbit, expending a large amount of our stockpiles. What is your recommendation in this case? I asked, honestly curious about what he'd come up with. We should call in the fighters, sir. We haven't seen any systems with good AA capability yet. These ballistic guns are good against troops at close range, but they should be easy to take out with fast-moving aircraft. I thought about it, and I agreed with the Major. I contacted Captain Sarin and asked her to throw a wing of fighters into the attack. Striking just as we came into range of these guns and made contact, we could sit back and let them make a pass. The airstrikes should soften up the target. I'll get her to put the gunships on it, too. We'll bomb them into the Stone Age and then mop up with ground troops. I'd like to show you something else, sir, Sloan said. He handed me a pot of some kind. It was crusty and black. What's this? I think it's an egg, sir. A crustacean egg. I looked around in alarm. I'd noticed the bulbous objects in the gun nests of the enemy. I examined the object for a second. It did indeed look like a sea creature's egg, a big one. It was a little bigger than a chicken egg. I thought lobster eggs were carried around by the parents or something, I said. Sloan threw up his hands. We don't know much about their physiology. They do lay eggs, and those are eggs. They're all over the island. The nests form nice circular depressions like little craters. I nodded thoughtfully. And the macros have been using the nests to set up their guns. They're perfect for the purpose. For what it's worth, sir, Sloan said. Thank you, Major. It might be worth quite a bit. Sloan dismissed himself as I pondered the black egg and hustled up the slope after my troops. I knew the crustaceans were in the area. They had troops here, sitting in the shallow areas of the ocean. So far, they hadn't been willing to commit their forces to aid us. I knew they weren't sure we would win, and the risks were high if we failed, and they had to deal with the macros on their own after we lost the battle. But now we were facing a tough fight. This single island had already cost me a number of casualties— there were nine more islands to go, and the machines were building replacements out there under the sea as fast as they could. From the moment I'd landed, I knew I was in a race against time. The basic problem with fighting the machines had always been attrition. They could build a new soldier and load a program into its brain in hours. Human troops took about twenty years to mature and train. We just couldn't keep up. I looked up slope. I could see the peak now, the crown of the island. It was about five thousand feet high, and it was a rocky, ugly crag. Climbing that under fire, just to take an alien island. Marvin? I said, calling him directly. Marvin, are you there? Yes, Colonel Riggs. Marvin, I need you to translate while I talk to the crustaceans. Can you do a video link to my helmet camera? Yes, but the quality will be poor in low light and there will be a transmission delay. That's all right, I said. They don't have to get a perfect picture. They probably won't want one anyway. Opening connection, Marvin said. Testing connection. Link made. Now connect me with the Crustacean Command Council. Connection request denied. What? Connection request denied. I rolled my eyes. I got that. Why are they rejecting the request? No reasons were given, sir. It's a protocol element. 
A handshaking process is established between the initiating transmission device and the... Yeah, yeah, I said, growing impatient. Okay, just send them the video feed. Send it to them as a series of still images if you have to. No words, no two-way channels, just images. Transmitting. I stopped marching and dipped my head down to aim the camera at the broken egg in my hand. The camera on my helmet activated, causing a red light to glow inside my visor. An external floodlight snapped on. Quan came near and stepped from foot to foot. I know he wanted to say something, but I was determined to get the attention of these responsibility-ducking lobsters. They knew why I was calling. They had to know I wanted help, and they didn't want to hear about it. After a few seconds of staring at the damaged egg, I wandered over to the dished-out nest where a gun had been. It was littered with broken shells. What are you doing, sir? Quan asked at last, unable to contain his curiosity. I waved for him to hush and walked to another nest. This one was bigger, and I found it had scars where the tripod had been set. I examined these square holes which had been punched down into the walls of the nest. Are you still transmitting images, Marvin? I've sent approximately six thousand stills, sir. All right, turn off the feed. That should be enough to get them interested. Quan picked up a broken eggshell and crushed it in his gauntlet before I could stop him. About a second after he did so, the camera light went out. Damn it, Quan, quit fooling with that. It's a crustacean nest. They raised their young right here. The kids? he asked, dropping the egg. Did you take a picture of that? I thought about it. Yeah, I think I did. Bad idea he said, then stomped away after the rest of the battalion. I hurried after him, frowning fiercely. I hoped Quan hadn't blown it. I hoped against hope that Marvin had stopped transmitting when I told him to, not when my helmet shut down. But I couldn't be sure. I thought about asking Marvin, but it wasn't worth the effort. The crustaceans had either gotten the images or they hadn't. Marvin called me back about ten minutes later. Colonel Riggs? I have an incoming channel request from the crustaceans. The request is flagged as urgent. I bet it is, I mumbled. Okay, open the channel and translate for me, Marvin. To the being known as Colonel Kyle Riggs, said the aquatic voice, we have received your images of violence and desecration. Your barbarism quotient has reached new unprecedented levels. Please excuse any accidental damaging of your nests, I said quickly before they could call me any more names. The purpose of the images was to inform and educate, nothing else. You have achieved your goals. Never have we viewed such gruesome behavior on the part of a thinking biotic being. We've already commissioned a task force to rewrite our thesis on the topic of brutality among lower species— up until this point, we'd believed the machines were heartless monsters. But you have re-educated us. We now know that biotic beings are worse. Worse? I asked. How so? Because you have young, and you therefore understand the protective instincts of a fellow biotic species. Had a machine crushed our young so callously... Just to make a threat clear, it would have been a lesser crime, as they are incapable of experiencing the agony they are causing. They would have the excuse of the ignorant. Okay, look, I said. Let me stop you right there. I didn't send you those images to threaten you. I sent them to show you what the machines are doing. They're using the beds of your young, your nests, to place weapon systems— Check the images that study the micro-tripods and the imprints they leave. Always, when the cheater attempts to explain his crimes, the discussion goes in this fashion. He vacillates from one lie to the next, hoping against hope one of them will hold sway. We have examined the evidence, and it is damning. Do you think we are mental incompetence? Hold on a second, Marvin— could you dig through the files on my helmet? 
I took video of the original gun emplacements about an hour ago when we first encountered them on the beach. Transmit those. Transmit the battle we had to win to knock out those guns. Searching. Transmitting. The crustaceans complained further while Marvin worked on complying with my orders. I had to hear all about how dumb I was, how cheaters were always caught and harshly punished, and how crustaceans were not fools to be duped by the lowliest student. I endured this invective, trying to understand how they felt. They'd been horrified, and they needed to unload on somebody. Still, I was gritting my teeth by the time they stopped and switched directions. How are those images fabricated? The crustaceans asked suddenly. With my helmet camera, I said. The macros have a treaty with our people. They would not violate it in such a direct fashion. Does that treaty take into account the treatment of your dead? Those sites were exposed and inactive when the macros decided to make them into machine gun nests. The crustaceans fell silent for several seconds. I was about to ask if the connection had been broken when the voice came back on the line. The desecration of grave sites is not specifically mentioned in the agreement, the voice said, sounding defeated and sad. I'm sorry. I said. The machines have no consideration for others. Nothing like what we call common decency. We humans, on the other hand, are fighting to aid you against these monsters. We're not the heartless ones, we're your liberators. And yet you will not help us. The connection was silent for a time. I sensed they were talking it out amongst themselves. I let them make their decision. I figured I had made my point and it was time for them to man up. I'd stopped short of threatening to abandon the campaign, but that thought was in the back of my mind. I trotted after 4th Battalion to catch up. Several minutes later, the crustaceans finally responded. We have reconsidered, they said. We've been monitoring your advance toward the machines. We will march out of the water on the western side of the island to join you. When the attack begins. Thank you, I said. I'll give new orders to my men. They will avoid damaging any more of your nests if possible. Let's hope this combined assault will begin a new era of cooperation between our two peoples. Possibly it will, the crustacean said. Pain is instructive. Let the learning begin. I frowned after the connection was broken. I wasn't entirely sure what they'd meant by their final statement. Chapter 22 Major Sloan was pleased to hear I'd gotten a commitment from the crustaceans. In his mind, they'd been entirely too complacent during this campaign. Those lobsters have been lying back and milking it all along, he said. It's about time you got them on board, sir. I nodded disinterestedly. Everyone I'd spoken with felt that way. But what seemed like a no-brainer to most of my officers was a big move for the crustaceans. I understood that they'd already suffered significantly in this war, and if Star Force failed to push back the machines, they'd suffer a great deal more. They were taking a big risk. The change of heart on their part was a very serious decision. What made them do it? asked Sloan. I looked at him vaguely. I'd been thinking about how to take down the fortifications we were about to walk into. What was that, Major? I asked him. How did you get those water chickens to join us? How did you talk them into it? I thought about Quan and his starring role in the egg-crushing vid I'd sent them. What a brutal image that must have been for them. I decided to leave that detail out of my explanation. I just put out the facts as I saw them, I said. They've been watching us, and they know the score. They know we're pushing their enemy back for them. The machines have mistreated them horribly, and there was a tipping point that made them decide to act. I went on briefly to explain the desecration of their nests. I showed him a few stills of the crushed eggs and told him how the nests were being used by the machines to emplace automated weaponry. Ah, Sloan said, eyeing the pictures. They finally got mad. Yeah, I guess so. A lot of wars are declared that way. 
About a mile ahead of us, I heard the ripping sound of heavy automatic weapons firing. I zoomed in with my visor, but could only see a few plumes of smoke. Looks like the recon team has made contact, Sloan said. I attempted to contact Gaines, but with no success. While I was doing that, the sounds of combat became louder and more widely dispersed. I still couldn't see anything as the action was occurring higher up on the mountain, out of my line of sight. I felt an urge to fly up and have a look around, but resisted it. There was no sense in making a more visible target of myself. Finally, Captain Gaines responded to my queries. Pin down, sir. We've lost one man, another injured. Three of the gun nests woke up at once. We've taken cover for now, requesting assistance. Gaines, light up the nests for me, I said. I'll call in air support. Will do. I worked my HUD system to contact fleet. In the meantime, Major Sloan tried to get my attention. What is it, Major? I asked. I just wanted to remind you that you told the lobsters we'd leave their nests alone, since we recently reached a new level of relations with them. That's just too bad, I snapped. We can't take out those weapons without breaking a few fossilized eggs, I'm afraid. I'm calling in the strike. Sloan threw up his hands in defeat and got out of my face. I called Saren and learned she was one step ahead of me. We've tracked the enemy positions, and a squadron of fighters is dropping. They're suborbital now, and will be there in about fifty seconds. Tell your men to duck, Colonel. Will do. Rigs out. I relayed the information, got every Marine to take cover, and we watched the show. It happened so fast it was hard to track with the eye. The fighters fell like curving meteors. They were fireballs in the sky. There was no mistaking where they were, as they left contrails of burning vapor. The whole mountain is lighting up, Major Sloan said in awe. It was true. In response to the airborne threat, streams of enemy fire rose up into the sky. Good, I said. They're giving away their positions. The enemy guns send a storm of bullets upward to greet the fighters, but they were shooting where the fighters had already been. They couldn't track fast enough to hit our ships. Making an extremely fast, low run over our heads, the squadron performed a hit-and-run strike that lasted about two seconds. Before we really knew what was happening, they were past the central mountain range in two groups of twelve, one veering north and the other south. As they passed, they fired a stabbing series of laser pulses down at the enemy targets, both those lit up by gains and others that were showing themselves now. As far as I could tell from the ground, not a single fighter had been shot down. That's it, I shouted over the general channel. Fleet did their part, now it's our turn. All companies advance double time. Let's finish the job. A roar went up in my headset as men gave their battle cries and got their metal-encased legs churning. We charged forward on a wide front. At the same time, reports flooded in from the other battalions offshore. They'd been crawling up to a point where they were just under the surface of the sea. Since it was mid-tide now, that let them in considerably closer than they'd managed to get before. Unfortunately, not all the gun nests had been knocked out. We quickly discovered this as we rushed into range of one defensive fortification after another. There was no clean way to slow down or break off at this point, so I ordered the companies to get in there and take the nests apart with their gauntlets if they had to. The fighting became intense when the enemy troops finally made an appearance. I'd known all along that someone had to be moving these gun emplacements and servicing them. I realized that the macro marines had been hiding up here all along when they surged forward out of the burrows and the limestone crags. They'd been letting their automated weaponry do the defensive work, but something had changed macro command's mind about that. I suspected it was the hard-hitting strike by Saren's fighter squadron. Even as we charged, they boiled out of the ground to meet us. I hadn't fought a macro marine in close combat for nearly a year, and I'd forgotten how big they were when compared to the workers and technicians. Like termite soldiers, they were twice the size and weight of the workers. They were outfitted with ballistic weaponry as well as lasers this time. I immediately theorized the design was meant to make them operational in the varied environments of Yale. 
The head sections had heavy beam weapons mounted alongside most of the optical inputs. The thorax sported dual heavy guns to back up the swiveling head section. These were fixed directional fire, and the machines had to move themselves around to get a bead on a target. Once they did, however, the results were impressive. The output of high-velocity lead hammered a marine in power armor, pushing him back physically. The swiveling head-mounted beams burned and slashed, scoring our suits and leaving inch-deep gouges in our chest plates. That was about all I had the chance to observe before I was in the middle of my own private firefight. I'd been working my way around a spur of rock out of the enemy line of sight— when I was in position, I sprang up using my suit's grav lifters to propel me forty feet into the air. When I came down, I was standing almost on top of an enemy automated gun. Taking two crunching steps forward allowed me to lay my gauntlets on the steaming barrel. I had surprised it, and it was busy showering my men farther down slope with thousands of rounds. The machine's reaction was almost human. It began to struggle and twist in my grasp. I held on and heaved. The strength of my exoskeleton combined with my own physical power was shocking. I ripped the gun loose from its moorings, despite the fact it had to weigh more than a ton, and hurled it down to crash on the nearest set of spiky rocks. There it squirmed and malfunctioned. I experienced a surge of triumph, but it was short-lived. Now that I was up high on a nesting site, the rest of the battlefield participants took notice of me. Passing Marines struggling up the cliffs waved and gave me a ragged cheer. The machines, however, were not so accommodating. They unleashed a barrage of bullets and laser fire. I dropped to the ground and rolled off the steepest side of the hillock I was on and crashed onto a pile of fallen boulders. A single crack had appeared in my visor making a jagged line of bright white that obscured my vision. I laid there for a full second, stunned. A huge figure loomed over me, and I struggled to get up. For a moment, I thought it was a macro-marine moving in for the kill. Your armor is smoking, Quan said over proximity chat. I groaned and let him help me up. I wondered how many times he'd helped me to my feet. I didn't want to know the answer, really. I was sure it was depressing. I'm getting too old for this shit, I said. You say that all the time, Quan said. I'll be old when I fall over dead. Until then, I fight. I nodded and stood beside him. The world was no longer spinning, and the cracks in my armor had been sealed over by the industrious nanites. Internal injuries were also being repaired with similar steady efficiency. You're a philosopher, Quan. Thank you, sir. We marched back up the hill I'd just been blown off of. By the time we reached the peak, this section of the fight was over. My Marines had done well. I counted no more than a dozen men on their backs, and most of them were probably going to make it. They only had to be left alone long enough to heal up. I wasn't sure they were going to get that chance, unfortunately. The enemy Marines had dug in on the next ridge— I could see them up there now, hundreds of flashing metal bodies moving around. They were obscured by the ridge they were hiding behind, but showed enough of themselves to tip their big lasers down and take pot shots at my struggling marines. In turn, we were firing back. We'd taken out all the gun nests at our elevation, but there were plenty more above, and plenty more enemy marines supporting them. All right. I said, contacting Major Sloan. We've advanced as far as we can with this rush. If we push up that next ridge without support, we'll be cut to pieces. Tell every company to seek shelter and find a rock to hide behind. Put half the men on digging, half the men on pinning down those macro snipers, and the rest on clearing the tunnels. That's three halves, sir, Sloan complained. Are you telling me a Star Force Marine isn't worth an extra half man? Wouldn't dare, sir. I'm on it. While he relayed orders and assigned specific companies to specific tasks, I made some calls to find out how the beach assault was going. The short answer was, not good. Colonel Riggs, sir. This is Captain Grass, 2nd Battalion. I squinted my eyes, trying to recall having put a centaur in charge of a battalion. I failed. 
I was pretty sure I'd put a major in charge of every battalion. What happened to Major Dansk? Her blood waters the grass, sir. I see. You're the most senior officer in the battalion, right? I'm placing you in acting command of the second. Do you read that? Yes, Colonel. Now report your status. We've taken the beach, sir, but we can't get any further uphill. The dishonorable enemy had hidden a portion of their forces. They're fighting with Marines now, sir, not just automated turrets. I frowned. I know that. They can be taken out. We're pinned down and waiting for support from the heavens. My frown deepened. You're not getting another pass from the fighters, if that's what you mean. Not right away. The fighters are back up in orbit, and the macros know we have them now. They might have set up AA in response to shoot them down if they make another pass. I understand, Colonel. The machines feel no wind in their fur because they have none. What are my orders? Your orders are to take the frigging ridge. If you can get up there, you'll be able to link up with the Ninth. It's only about a mile. I don't think that's too much to ask. What are our rules of engagement, sir? I was getting angry. For a moment I forgot I was talking to a centaur. They had good hearts, and they'd learned to interact with us more naturally, but they still weren't human. I thought back and relived the conversation later. If I'd made a mistake, it was in believing the little mountain goat's brain operated the way a human's brain did. But they didn't and they were about to re-educate me on this point. Stop hiding on the beach. Charge up there and take the next ridge by any means necessary. Do you understand, Captain? Your words are like cold spring waters, Colonel. I broke the connection, shaking my head. I walked over to Quan and went over a computer scroll with him for about a minute. The scroll depicted the battle situation in detail— I frowned as I went over the fresh data transmitted from fleet by Saren. There were an alarming number of red blocks lined up against the beach the second was on. I looked at that and suddenly understood. They were never going to take that ridge. If they tried, it might turn into a slaughter. Cursing myself and the centaur, who hadn't clearly told me what he was up against, I tried to raise Captain Grass again, but couldn't. As I tapped on my helmet... My visor went pitch black. A tiny fraction of a second later, the blackness brightened as the filters were overwhelmed by the intensity of the light. I staggered back and threw myself on my chest. Everyone down! I shouted over my headset to every Marine in the force. I don't think anyone heard me, as a tremendous roar had swept over us by now. I was lifted up and slammed down again. It felt as if the rocky mountainside under my body had bucked me into the air. I rolled and loosened rocks rolled with me. When I could stand up, I fought my visor controls, forcing them to let my eyes see what was happening to the north. In my heart, I already knew what I'd see. There was a rolling cloud there less than a mile off. It was just beginning to take the traditional mushroom shape as I watched. The core of it still glowed with fire. They say one of those crazy goats ran up the ridge and blew himself up, Quan said, coming to stand next to me. Yeah? I asked, feeling a little sick inside. Yeah, he blew up his troops with him, too. Must have gone nuts. Maybe, I said. Or maybe he just thought he was following orders. Quan looked at me strangely and shook his head. I watched the mushroom cloud until it dissipated. I decided then and there that centaurs weren't going to be rising in ranks above the level of captain again any time soon. Chapter 23 In the end, the sacrifice of Captain Grass helped our assault. First of all, it blew a hole in the enemy line. Secondly, it made me realize the enemy wasn't going to give this island up without a hard fight, and that I didn't want to suffer those kinds of losses. I decided it was time to call upon fleet again. I ordered a heavy bombardment by every gunship I had, followed up with another series of airstrikes by the fighters. 
I knew I might weaken my ships for a later battle in space, where the fighters would be far more decisive, but I couldn't take this mountain without help. Besides, if we didn't use them when we needed them, they might as well be knocked out already. I gritted my teeth and squinted as a squadron made another pass. This time the machines were ready. Beams stabbed up into the murky sky to meet my fighters. Three were lost before they reached attack range. Three more were lost as they passed by and vanished into the sky again. Damn it, I roared. Twisted, flaming wreckage showered the island. Glowing flares of red light sprang up all over the island at the same time, showing where the fighters had made their strikes. I quickly contacted Saren. Did you get those AA positions zeroed? Yes, sir, she said. The gunships are already bombarding them. Do you want another pass by the fighters? I took two hissing breaths before answering. Yes. One more pass, I said at last. Don't send them until the gunships have suppressed all known AA sites. After that, have the gunships soften them up for ten full minutes, then I'll order another ground assault. When I broke the connection with Saren, I turned to Sloan. I wasn't in a happy mood. We're about to lose more fighters, I said. I heard. Where are those troops the lobsters promised us? Major Sloan tapped at the roll-up screen we had spread over a rock between us. We've got contacts here, he said. Four blue rectangles had appeared on the shoreline at the foot of the central mountain we were assaulting. They're still on the beach? I demanded. Not really, sir. It's still high tide, so they're underwater. Those bastards. What did you call them, water chickens? They're worse than that. Chickens have no choice. They're born cowards. No one expects a chicken to help you. I'm relying on these foot-draggers. I contacted the Crustacean High Command through Marvin. There were some gurgling sounds before the translation kicked in. You told us there would be no nuclear strikes, complained the High Lobster or whatever it was he called himself. Listen, I said. We're having a tough time retaking your planet for you. I'm sorry if a few things are being broken on the battlefield, but you're not helping out and we have to do what we must. False logic. Attempts to shift blame always fail to move us. Many nests have been destroyed. We're monitoring you closely. I closed my eyes in frustration. If you can see what we're up against, you can see that we need help. You have four large troop formations offshore on the opposite side of the island. We're going to hit them again from the air in a few minutes. If you want us to kick the machines off your homeworld, you'll assault your front after the bombardment stops. If you don't, it will be the last assault Star Force makes on this world. We'll pull out and leave you behind to face the machines on your own. Quan had shown up to listen to this speech. He clapped his big hands together slowly, making loud popping noises. Tell him how it is, Colonel. Sir, Sloan whispered, can we really afford to make that threat now? I ignored them both and listened closely for the crustacean response. It took a few seconds, but they finally replied. Message understood, they said. Then they broke the channel. What does that mean? Quan asked. I looked at him sourly. Quite possibly it means we're screwed, I said. Maybe they figure they'll sit out another round and see how we do before they make their decision. Who knows? I bet they're milking us for one more attack, Quan said, before we dump them. I nodded, admitting he could be right. There's no way to tell, but I am certain the fighters are about thirty seconds out. Time to duck. The third screaming pass by the squadron wasn't as devastating to either side as the last one was. The enemy AA was thin, but there were fewer fighters hitting them, too. We lost two more fighters, and the rest went back up to the safety of space. Above us, the mountain was a haze of smoke and bright flames. The gunships sent down a steady drumbeat of railgun salvos. They streaked down, looking like white balls of lightning. When they hit, I could feel my steel boots shiver under my feet. After the ten minutes had passed, we called the all-clear and began the ground assault. We'd been repelled before, but this time the enemy resistance was ragged. 
The macro defenders that managed to aim down at us and fire were slow-moving and obviously damaged. They looked like bugs that had been accidentally stepped on but were still struggling to fight. An uphill battle is never fun. The enemy was hidden by the contours of the land while our bodies were fully exposed. Often we could only see the muzzle of the enemy's weapons and their optical pickups staring down at us. They showered us with bullets, laser bolts, and heavy ripping fire from their last operating gun nests. It was a grim fight. Battles like this were worse for me than for the average Marine, in my estimation. A trooper on the hill only had to worry about his own skin, his rifle, and what was in his sights. But I had to worry about all those things, plus what was happening across the planet. We took the next ridge, and the one after that. I took a chance to tip my visor out from behind cover long enough to see the last peak, the mountain's crown. A splatter of fire greeted me, and I ducked back before they could blow my helmet off. All right, I said, breathing hard. Snake power up from the support units below. My suit is down to 29%, and some of us have to be about empty. We'll keep pressing to the top after we take a breather. Quan slumped his form down next to me. We both leaned against a rock and sipped the water the suit recycled to our lips in a slimy straw. My neck hurts, Quan complained, pushing a gauntlet at his shoulders pointlessly. You're wearing about a foot of armor, I said. You can't possibly feel that. No, I can't, but my hand wants to rub there where my neck broke. It will feel better in the morning. I don't know. Second day after bones break, sometimes that's the worst. Nanites start coming out of the bone. They always leave those tiny little holes, you know? I did know. It wasn't good when they did that. The holes were pinpricks, but somehow they caused pain. The nanites had to get out of the bone somehow, and they knew our body's natural healing process would fill in those tiny holes with fresh bone cells soon enough. Still, knowing why they did it didn't make it feel better. It wasn't any Marine's favorite experience. We'll take a break after we take the crown, I promised. I don't believe you, he said, but that's okay. I don't want a break. I get bored. I clapped his back and then pulled my hand away quickly when I saw him wince. Sloan, Major Sloan, where are you? I'm coordinating the transfer of the wounded to the rear line, sir, he said over my radio. I made a face. Get up here. It took a few minutes, and there were splattering moments of enemy fire that came showering down the mountain when he was exposed, but Sloan worked his way up the mountain to me. When he finally made it, he didn't look happy. Take a good look around, I told him. This is what's called the front line. Yes, sir. You should see more of it. Yes, sir. You ready for the final assault? In ten minutes, we go right over the top. I could see through his dusty visor an expression of grim determination. This man was the polar opposite of Quan. He preferred to fight with his brain, preferably at a great distance. But he was game, and he didn't object. Fourth Battalion is ready, Colonel, he said. Don't worry, soldier. The machines are down to ten percent effectives and nearly broken, in my estimation. I'm not worried, sir, he said. I knew he was lying, but I didn't call him on it. It was all right to be afraid in combat, just as long as you did your part, you were still a solid Marine, in my opinion. The ten minutes passed quickly. We had just long enough to tap into a silver thread of nanites worming their way uphill with fresh power. We didn't get a full charge, nothing like it, but we all had enough for one hard fight by the time we moved again. I didn't bother to tip the machines off with another bombardment this time, figuring it wasn't really needed— there were limits to my count of fighters and the number of salvos my gunships could launch. I decided to save the firepower for another day. There were plenty of islands left, after all. We ordered the attack, and when Marines were streaming past us upslope, we joined the second wave. Quan was in the lead with Sloan and me in his bulky shadow. It was going to be daylight soon, but for now, second night still shrouded Yale— we were thousands of feet up and surrounded by inky black seas. A yellowish moon loomed close to the northern horizon, providing some light. It was bigger than Earth's moon, but looked just as barren. As far as I knew, it didn't even have a name. 
The moon's reflection on the inky black seas below us shimmered and cast a ghostly light over the battle scene. The machines waited for us. When we reached the last open stretch of ground below their rocky peak, they finally scrabbled forward and blazed at us with everything they had left. Fortunately, it wasn't much. I saw two Marines on the front line go down, but they both bounced up again. We returned fire and kept marching upward. My steel boots were grinding on loose stones. Everyone has permission to fly for the final assault. Don't save your suit power any longer, men. This is it. I barely got the words out over tactical chat before dozens of figures leapt into the air. They'd been waiting to do this all along. Flying isn't always a good thing in combat. It's cool, and it rattles biotic enemies, but it also makes you a target without cover. More significantly, these machines didn't get flustered. They just kept fighting until you dismantled them completely. What flying did do is move an army quickly, especially if the ground is rough. I followed my leaping horde of marines a few seconds later, seeing that Quan was airborne. Even Sloan got into the spirit of it and came after us, roaring and firing his beamer almost continuously. If we'd had much more fighting to do, I would have admonished him to conserve his charge, but I knew we didn't. We reached the crown in a rush. There was surprisingly little there. The space was crowded with damaged machines. I grappled with the first one that grabbed me by the waist and pulled me down. The machine was a marine, equipped with pinchers, two bullet-dispensing carbines, and a laser projector mounted on the head section. Unfortunately for the macro, none of this gear was operating at full capacity. The pinchers squeezed, but the carbines rattled dryly. They were either out of ammo or jammed, I couldn't tell which. The laser projector did work, however. It stitched a line across my armor at point-blank range. I couldn't get my own projector into the fight, as it was pinned to my side by the pinchers. Instead, I grabbed the laser projector with a gauntlet and levered it away from my body. The tube ground and whined as gears tried to force it back on target— my arms were vastly more powerful, however, and it was an uneven contest. I tried to crush the tube itself, but couldn't manage to exert that much pressure with my gauntlets. My next move was to wrench the laser from side to side, heaving it back and forth. While I did this, the macro fired a rippling series of laser bolts into the night sky over my head. I finally managed to wedge my head and shoulder under the base of the projector, then used a free arm to lever it down. That did the trick. My shoulder served as fulcrum, and the machine's construction couldn't take the stresses exerted on it. There was a ripping sound, and the projector came off like a loose tooth. Cords and metal strips hung from the projector, which I tossed to the ground. By that time, a team of Marines had come to help. They pushed their lasers against the thorax and let loose. My visor darkened, and so did the optical pickups of the macro. The pinchers relaxed, and I was back on my feet. I looked around and saw that the battle was about over. As I'd predicted, they didn't have much fight left in them. I told you, I shouted to Sloan when I found him gazing down over the far side of the cliff. An easy win. I doubt they killed a single man. That's what happens when you do it right, Major. You might want to hold up on the celebration, sir, he said, pointing down into the darkness. I peered over the edge, hunkering down beside him. I quickly saw what he was talking about. The side of the far mountain was crawling with metallic shapes. What the hell? I asked aloud. I think it's their reinforcements, Sloan said. Smaller machines they must have called up from burrows that go back out to the sea. I studied the approaching troops. There must have been thousands of them. I think you might be right, I said. Chapter 24 The following few minutes were tense. The fourth had reached the crown and taken it solo, as it turned out. The other battalions had been slowed by heavier resistance on the lower ridge lines. What that meant in practical terms was that we were the only ones up here to face this new arrival on the battlefield. 
Let's get those damned lobsters on the line, I said. They should be coming from that direction. I don't see any kind of fire down there. Neither do I, sir, Major Sloan said. He was flat on his belly beside me. We were both peeking over the cliff wall down toward the horde of metallic shapes that moved up the mountain toward us. Quan walked up, munching on something. He stood at the edge of the cliff and gazed downward. What are you doing, Quan? I asked. You've got your visor open. I was hungry. Well, get down here in the dirt before you get your nose shot off. By who? I thought those lobsters were our allies. I stared at him for a second or two, then looked back down at the metallic humps below. I fiddled with my visor, trying to get the infrared contrast up. The night vision on these things was far from perfect. The visors were more concerned with protecting our eyes from laser fire than they were with enhancing our sight in darkness. The shapes below were rather lobster-like, but their suits were different than the ones I'd met up with in the past. They were bulky and armored, rather than bag-like survival suits full of liquids. I stood up slowly, exchanging glances with Major Sloan. Right you are, Quan, I said. Quan flipped his visor open again and pushed a snack bar into it. He chewed for a few seconds before he finally caught on. You guys thought they were machines, didn't you? He asked. Major Sloan looked embarrassed. My fault. Those suits, they didn't look like anything in the briefing. That's true, Major, I said. They must have built a new armor prototype. In fact, they look rather like us. It wouldn't be the first time the crustaceans copied our technology. Quan produced his huffing laugh and wandered off. I looked after him in annoyance. There was a definite discipline problem in my outfit. I guessed it was due to working on the front for so long together. In our case, the lines between officer and non-com had been blurred. I soon forgot about it and went back to working with Major Sloan. We had to consolidate our position. After going through so much effort to take these islands, it would be unacceptable to lose them again. I spent the following hours reorganizing troops, distributing supplies, and talking to fleet. I also talked to the Crustacean High Command and thanked them for their help. After reviewing the data Captain Saren had gathered, I saw that the native troops had indeed contributed. They'd marched up the hill against only light resistance, but had served to cut off any route of retreat for the trapped enemy. They'd performed as an anvil against the fourth's hammer, and that was good enough for me today. They were in the fight now, one way or the other. In typical fashion, the machines had fought down to the last kicking grasshopper-shaped metal marine without asking for quarter. That was fine with me, as I hadn't been in a merciful mood anyway. By the end of second night, I was feeling pretty good about the whole thing. Sure, we'd lost a thousand marines and a few fighters, but we'd given the enemy a bloody nose. If we kept up the pressure we would eradicate them all in time. But as I soon learned, that wasn't how this war was going to play out. It was about an hour after dawn that the enemy made the next move. Captain Saren alerted me as she was in the sky, ever vigilant and on the lookout for new threats. Colonel Riggs, she said into my ear, we have a serious problem, sir. I threw my hand up in the face of the lieutenant that was reporting to me about our supply situation and turned away. I listened to the feminine voice in my helmet, and to gain privacy, I flipped my visor back down. Go ahead, Jasmine, I said. The machines. They're coming to take the island back. Which one? Tango. The island you're on now, sir. Okay, I said, stepping out of the command tent and looking around. I didn't see anything. I took a moment to examine my computer screens, but they were empty as well. I'm not sensing anything, I said. They're in the water, sir. They've been building up under their domes. They're marching. Big machines, about two hundred of them so far. So far? I asked in surprise. Two hundred and they're still being deployed? Am I reading you right, Captain? I'm afraid so, sir. I'll transmit the latest data down to your command post. The readings are new. 
I felt a wave of something. I almost felt sick. We'd fought so hard, and it had looked as if the enemy had been beaten back. But now that I'd taken this mountain, now that I sat upon its lofty crown, I was going to have to defend it. Captain Sarin was still talking, but I was no longer listening. While she did so, the computer scroll spread out on a makeshift table in my command tent began to update. It now showed dozens, no, hundreds, of large red contacts. They were in the sea, and they were coming up toward us slowly, marching on the bottom. They were going to surface all around the island and assault it, just as we'd done ten hours earlier. I'm sorry, I said, tuning back into Captain Saren's report. Could you give me that updated count again? I was shocked when I got the final numbers. Somewhere between 300 and 500 of the big ones were coming. We had the high ground now, and we had the crustaceans backing us up, but that was a whole lot of giant robots. With a veteran crew, it took a platoon a minute or two to take down one of the big ones. Theoretically, we could beat them all, given time. But it wasn't going to happen that way. When they had numbers, when they had the crushing weight of massed machines, they would break my lines. It would be the machines that were ganging up on platoons of men, not the other way around. I'd seen them do it before most vividly during the South American campaign. It would be a feeding frenzy, with each machine competing to see how many of my troops it could kill. I'm not sure we can hold against those numbers, Captain, I said. She hesitated. I know. What are your orders, sir? Instantly, I knew what she was thinking. It was time to pull out. That made me angry. I didn't want to give up this island. Why had we fought all the way to the highest peak and lost so many good marines if we were going to run away back into space a few hours later? I didn't want those earlier sacrifices to have been made in vain. At the same time, I wasn't sure that I had any choice. The machines weren't going to just wait around until I made my decision. They weren't charging up the beaches yet. But when they had their entire force positioned, they would. Prepare for evacuation, Captain Saren. I took the liberty of drawing up a plan for our withdrawal, Colonel. Do you want to see it? I compressed my lips tightly. Had she predicted this? Maybe up there, safe in space with fleet, she would pass her hat around to collect on her bets. But no. I knew that wasn't how we'd gotten to this point. Saren was a good officer. It was her job to anticipate contingencies. There was always a chance we would fail, and she was the type who thought of everything. How long ago did you draw up these plans? I asked her. Before you dropped, sir. I've been updating them steadily as the campaign has progressed. Of course you have, I said with a hint of bitterness. I didn't develop the plans because I had no faith in you, Colonel, she said. I felt it was my duty. I know, I know. I'm just sorry things turned out this way. We don't seem to have the strength to battle the machines this time. We didn't have time to build armor or enough specialized equipment. I'd forgotten just what kind of a sidekick Captain Saren was. She wasn't a masterful strategist who looked for enemy weaknesses, but she was a logistical wizard. As was the case with most wizardry, she achieved her results through hard work and discipline. I'm glad you drew up plans, I told her. But I'm changing them. We aren't withdrawing from Yale. We're withdrawing from Tango. We'll shift our force over to the Big Island and set up heavy defenses there, with all our troops in one place. Sir, Sandra is requesting to join the channel. I sighed. She's insisting, sir. I bet she is. Okay, switch me over and get to work on prepping the escape. We don't have much time. Kyle? Sandra asked a moment later. What is it, hon? I hear you're coming back up here. I want to see you the moment you arrive. I hesitated for a second, wondering if I should tell her about the change of plans. I had no intention of withdrawing from Yale just yet. At the end of my one second pause, I decided not to tell her. Now was not the time to start a domestic argument. Yes, I said enthusiastically. We're wrapping this up. It'll be good to see you again. Anything else I've got to... There is something else, she said. 
There are a couple of things, in fact. One is Alexa. My voice grew cautious. Is she still alive? Of course she is, Kyle. What a terrible thing to say. We're getting along quite well now. She seems sweet in a military way. She's told me a lot about life under the Empire. I smiled. That was just like Sandra to be jealous of another woman, then make friends with her later on. She got along well with other women, but she had trouble when they paid too much attention to me. That's good, I said, making my second play to disconnect. But I've got to... There's something else. It's about Marvin. He's been acting weird. Even for Marvin. I think you should have a talk with him. What's he doing? He's roaming around outside the ship. He's been out there crawling on the hull all day. It sounds like we have giant metal rats. I'm sure he's scarred up the ship. The nanites are worked up about it, and the ceiling in our quarters never stops shimmering now. I frowned. What's he doing crawling in the hull of the ship? He says he can get a better signal out there, whatever that means. A better signal? I asked, my frown deepening. When Marvin began behaving oddly and went off on his own, that sometimes signaled a dramatic shift in the tactical situation. The robot was often sneaky, especially when he was doing something he wasn't supposed to do. Connect me over to Marvin immediately, I said, my irritation growing. First it looked like we were going to be kicked off this island, and now Marvin was up to something nefarious. I couldn't believe my misfortune. Aren't you forgetting something? Sandra asked. What? Oh, yeah. I love you. Good. I do, too. Here's that crazy robot. There were a few odd sounds, then Marvin's voice came in. He sounded distracted. Hello, Colonel Riggs. What are you up to, Marvin? I demanded. Have you been talking to the macros? I'm seeing a lot of evidence down here that they're building equipment that reminds me of your designs. I'd finally said it. I'd been thinking about it for a long time, but I'd finally gotten around to telling Marvin about my suspicions. I reminded myself that they weren't just my suspicions. Several people had noticed the similarities between new macro equipment designs and Marvin himself. I'm taken aback, Colonel, Marvin said. If I did contact the macros directly and independently, I'm sure they wouldn't trust me enough to take my advice on self-design. It was a pretty good argument, but I pressed ahead. You haven't directly answered the question. Have you been engaging in independent communications with the macros? Not lately, sir. I ground my molars together. Not lately? That's another dodge, Marvin. I did have contact with them some months ago. It is possible they misconstrued my efforts to transmit data through the rings as a communications exchange. I frowned. What? Recall that I pioneered the technology we all now use for instant interstellar communications. Not exactly, I said. You pioneered the effort to steal the technology from the blues. A minor but noteworthy detail. In any case, when I transmitted data to the test system, I did so at that time using an unprotected data format. Ah, I said, catching on. So the macros were listening to you, is that it? What did you tell them by accident? Did you happen to send along a roster of our ships or our personal records? Nothing like that. I transmitted design documents I'd been working on, random data, I thought at the time. I nodded. And these design documents were of equipment you thought we might want to build? Something the macros might pick up and find useful? No. The design documents were all optional configurations for my own body, ideas I'd worked on while my backup brain boxes were relatively underutilized. I chuckled. You're telling me you sent them imaginary configurations of yourself? Is that amusing, Colonel? I thought about the mining robot I'd met up with that had a thousand twenty-foot-long tentacles for legs that had essentially been one of Marvin's doodles— the macros must have believed they were getting classified information and had attempted to build some of the things Marvin had designed. Yeah, I said. It is funny. <laughs> All right, just don't do it anymore. 
What are you up to now? Why are you out on the hull sending messages again? I'm following your orders, sir. In fact, this is excellent timing. I wanted your permission. Permission for what? Permission to transmit the final sequence. I rolled my eyes. I have no idea what you're talking about, Marvin. Have you sustained an injury, sir? Several of them, but I haven't lost my memory, if that's what you're implying. Just tell me what you think you're supposed to be doing. I'm breaking the Yale Ring's code, sir. You told me to turn it on again and flush the macros back out into the system they came from. Oh, yeah, I said. I did tell you that. How's that coming along? I'm ready, sir. When? Right now. I froze for perhaps two heartbeats. I looked over my shoulder and then turned around fully to see the ocean. North of Tango, the ring lay at the bottom of a thousand-foot-deep bowl of seawater. I couldn't see it, but I knew that the macros had placed their factories under domes down there. Do it, Marvin, I said in a hushed, excited voice. Flush them all to hell. Transmitting, sir. Message sent. Is there anything else? Yeah, I said, frowning with an immediate afterthought. Can you turn it back off again? I mean, after the macros are sucked down? My orders did not include an imperative to research a third reversal of the ring state. The enemy is jamming my transmissions in any case. Just getting this command to the receiver... Marvin, I said, interrupting him. I need you to turn off the effect again. You did it before. I'd been watching the ocean to the north while we spoke. As I stood there on the mountaintop witnessing the event, the water, miles out to sea, suddenly blackened. A white ring grew around the dark region. I knew a vast whirlpool had formed, like a giant drain sucking the ocean down an endlessly deep throat. You have to turn it off again, Marvin. You've got five minutes. It took me several days to figure out how to reverse the flow on each occasion. The ring does not have a simplistic interface, I'm afraid. It's not user-friendly. Let me explain. The encoding system seems to alter itself on the basis of the last command successfully executed. When an operation is performed, part of the artifact system rewrites the code. I suspect this is some kind of internal security precaution against tampering. For God's sake, Marvin! I shouted. Everyone had stopped what they were doing and was now staring out to sea. It was impossible not to. The sky had even shifted, and the winds were picking up. The mass being transported off-planet must have been tremendous. A singing, roaring sound rose up and up in volume as I listened to Marvin. I realized a hurricane was forming out there, a few miles from shore. Can you stop it? I'm sure the flood you've created so far is enough. The machines must have been sucked down by now. We're having trouble with confirmation on that point, Marvin said. Are you sure you want to stop the procedure without confirmation? Yes! Damn it, Marvin! Turn it off! I felt sick inside. All around me, the men were moving again, getting over their initial shock. Major Sloan came close, shouting at me. I couldn't hear him, and I didn't care what he was saying anyway. I pushed him aside with a single shove and stepped to the edge of the cliff. The wind was so strong now I could feel it through my bulky suit. It was like having a hand pushing on my back, pushing me toward the drain in front of me. Marvin was talking to me about dry technical details while he attempted code sequences to turn off the growing whirlpool. He was hacking and talking, and I was barely listening. My men stopped asking me what was happening as it was becoming painfully clear by now. I staggered away when the water level all the way to the coastline of Tango was affected. Even this far out, the water turned white, like one endless series of breakers going down into nothingness. I knew the entire planet was draining away, the way it had been before we'd come out here and interfered. I knew the crustaceans were watching this turn of events with horror. I wondered if they knew we had been the ones to turn the ring on again— I wondered, too, if they'd ever figure out I'd failed to ask if it could be turned off a second time before I'd ordered Marvin to pull the plug. If they did figure it out, they'd know the truth, that I had killed them all. Chapter 25
For the next seven long hours, the oceans continued to drain. Marvin had made no progress at all. I hooked up my maps to fleet's sensors and watched as the macros were indeed swept away into the hole at the bottom of the ocean. The power of moving water could carve rock, and even with their shields and vast weight, the machines couldn't hold on to the seabed. The armies they had offshore sat quietly at first, but when they realized they were being exposed and many had been dragged away into the unquenchable maw behind them, they charged the beach. It was a vicious battle, but one where we had the upper hand. Most of the forces were swept away to sea and down the hole in its black depths before they managed to struggle up onto the rocky beaches. When the last of them did reach the beach and make their ragged assault, there were less than a hundred of them left. As any accountant can tell you, numbers matter. We met them as they rushed out of the water and destroyed them before they could press up to the heights. Even the crustaceans joined in. I gathered from some of their messages they were under the impression the machines had opened the great drain in the sea again with the intention of killing all life on Yale. I didn't enlighten them on this point. Three races of biotics fought side by side, and when the last machine was brought down and the last Star Force Marine raised his fist with a shout of victory, the beach was wider than it once had been. No low tide in the history of Yale could compare. The water was leaving this world, and I knew the rest of it would soon heat up and begin killing those who'd survived the first great bleeding. I imagined in the Crustacean Archives this would go down as a bittersweet day. At a terrific cost, we'd swept the machines from the planet with a single hard push. We'd cut out the cancer, but killed the patient in the process. Marvin kept working at his hacking effort. I checked in with him twice an hour, but his answer was always the same. He was working on it. I knew there was no speeding up something like this. I'd worked with software myself. Technical projects tended to get done when they got done. Beating on the workers didn't always yield the results anticipated. But I beat on him anyway. I complained, raved, and almost frothed at the mouth in our discussions— Seeing the ocean drain away and knowing it was all our fault was just too much to take. I paced atop Tango's highest peak and growled at anyone who came near. First night came and lasted a long, long time. When we were in our thirtieth straight hour of unrelenting darkness, the miracle came at last. It stopped, sir, Quan said, shaking me awake. I'd been dreaming of running water, faucets left on, and flooding bathrooms. I came awake with a lurch and grabbed his hand. He was one of the few people in the world that didn't flinch when my hand closed on his. He pulled me to my feet. What are you talking about, Quan? The water. I think that crazy robot has done it. I walked out onto the cliffs and stared down. It was storming lightly outside. It was hard to see through the night rains, but using my visor with the light enhancers and zooming optics engaged, I determined that the waters had indeed settled. They were still sloshing and disturbed. Tidal waves would race around the planet for months. But the draining had stopped. I contacted Marvin immediately. Well done, I told him. It wasn't me, Colonel. As much as I'd like to have solved the problem, I didn't do so. After a few more questions, I realized he didn't have a clue who had closed the ring or how. I disconnected and stood in the wind and rain, wondering what to make of it. If the macros had done it, could they reverse the ring yet again? Could this entire thing start over again? Or was it a trap, baiting my marines to go down to the seabed and investigate? A few hours later, I contacted the crustaceans. I knew almost right away what was going on. They were insufferably proud of themselves. We have stopped the machines, they said. We've been studying your primitive algorithms, watching as the ring is vibrated day and night. Is this truly all the sophistication Earth creatures have when dealing with a quantitative problem, to simply install a random answer into the equation and check to see if it works? 
such wasteful iteration. Congratulations, I said, so relieved that they weren't all going to die and blame me that I didn't care if they made a speech about it or not. And speech they did. I was forced to politely listen to every technical detail of their achievement. Like all nerds with wounded pride, when they finally got one right, they crowed about it for hours. I gave them ten minutes, then five more, before giving them something to get off the subject. High command? I asked. I'm sorry, but I must get back to my duties. The crisis here seems to have come to an end. Perhaps we can discuss the matter further at the next council meeting. I waited one second, then two. I knew their translators were generating question marks. It made me smile just to think about it. At last, they spoke up again. What is this council meeting? Haven't you been informed? Now that you've joined Star Force officially, we can proceed to place your representatives on the council. Joined Star Force? I'm afraid you're under a series of misconceptions. Possibly the translation equipment has failed us. It is highly inadequate. We've been working on designing our own superior model. I'm sure you have been, I said. I'd given them brain boxes that knew English and their language to ease our conversations, but they'd never quite accepted any of the technology. It wasn't good enough for them. Perhaps I'm presuming too much, I said. But after you ended your state of neutrality and declared open war on the machines, I thought it was clear that you would have to become part of the local alliance of biotic species. The macros are our shared enemy now, and that simple fact keeps us together. We do not object to occasional cooperative acts. We are not ungrateful for your aid in this recent misunderstanding. But we do not consider ourselves to be at war with the machines, nor do we accept a state of alliance with Star Force. I heaved a sigh. I thought it might go this way. The lobsters were takers, people who wanted whatever you could give them and always begged for more. They did precious little in return, however. All right, then, I snapped. We'll be lifting off and shipping out within ten hours. Glad we could be of service. Another hesitation, then. Your service was appreciated. A continued presence on Yale might benefit both of us, in fact. May we propose... Sorry, I said loudly and with perhaps a touch of relish. No, we can't spare these forces any longer. We'll be moving back to our own borders. As non-alliance members, your neutrality must be respected. It's in our charter. The conversation soon ended after that. I could tell they weren't going to budge and they'd wasted my time. I was glad to have saved billions of lives, but it had cost me time, resources, and manpower for very little gain. Ten hours later, I was back on my command ship. I headed immediately to the observation chamber, which had real windows that let out on the profundity that we call space. Yale hung there under my feet, and I examined it moodily in my shipboard uniform. Simple smart clothes were more comfortable than armor, but they felt flimsy after clanking on Yale for the last several days. I felt like I was walking around in pajamas. The storms hadn't subsided yet on the moon below. There were white swirls dotting the atmosphere over slate gray waters. The islands were still there, but rarely visible through the cloud layer. To me, they seemed like floating bones in the flood. It could have been my imagination, but they looked a little larger than they had a week earlier. Sandra came into the observatory to join me. I was surprised to see Alexa in her wake. Hello, ladies, I said. I'm sure you've seen this view before. Quite fascinating to look down upon a world you were standing upon only hours ago. Especially when you help tear it up, Sandra said. Oh, no, Alexa said, speaking up. She no longer seemed timid to me. I guess hanging around Sandra for days had given her some self-confidence. You did the best you could under the circumstances. We all looked down at Yale for a quiet moment. 
I couldn't see the tidal waves and the rains that I knew were lashing the planet along with sheets of lightning. Most worlds looked peaceful from the sky. The text told me the storms would go on for years, I said. This world will take time to heal. But there are still hundreds of billions of live lobsters in that ocean, and they aren't going to boil or go down a giant drain today. Star Force has accomplished its mission. I'd love to hear the details, Alexa said. We've watched the vids, but you only get so much from those. What was it really like down there, Colonel? I looked at her and saw her eyes were bright with interest. I smiled. You're right, I said. Vids aren't like being there. Alexa, Sandra said with a new cold note in her voice. I think it's time we left the Colonel to his strategic planning. He has to figure out his next move, and he prefers to be alone on such occasions. I looked at her for a second in surprise, then I caught on. Sandra didn't want me getting too close to this young lady, not even for a conversation. I nodded, thinking perhaps she was right. I'll catch up with you two at dinner, I said. Alexa looked disappointed, but Sandra ushered her out of the chamber successfully. I looked after them both hoping Sandra wouldn't get angry and take it out on Lieutenant Brighton. I couldn't help but notice both ladies were attractive from every angle. In fact, it was something of a contest as to who had the best curves. That bothered me for just a moment. It did seem that Alexa Brighton was uncommonly attractive. What were the odds that one of Earth's best-looking female officers had suddenly become determined to defect to Star Force? Could she be a spy after all? I decided to pursue the matter with Sandra later. She knew the young lady better than I did, and she was in a much better position to judge the veracity of her story at this point than I was. Besides, I had a feeling I wasn't going to be allowed close enough to the girl to ask her any probing questions. As all seemed quiet now in the Thor system, I decided to pull out. The crustaceans weren't joining up, so I figured they needed to feel left out. Maybe when they didn't have our fleets protecting them, they might be in a more cooperative mood. We flew back to the Eden system at a stately pace. I debriefed Marvin and Saren on the tactical details of the operation. We'd done fairly well when all things were considered. I want to thank you two for your expertise on this mission, I told them. Marvin, you were flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, tentacles. I know conducting scientific experimentation and research under fire isn't easy. There were a few screw-ups, but at the end point, we came out alive and so did the biotics we came to assist. That's what counts in my book. I'm disturbed, however, Colonel, Captain Saren said. The crustaceans still aren't fully accepting our help. I know, but I think they'll come around eventually. At this point, they're at war with the macros. Don't they know that? I think they do, but I also think they've managed to maintain a semi-neutral stance throughout this war. They assaulted us, but only with a few ships full of troops. They were attacked by the macros, but only indirectly by the draining of their oceans. I think they believe they can keep pulling tricks like this, and they think it's in their best interest to maintain a balance because they're in a precarious position. Jasmine shook her head. I don't agree with them. They must commit. They'd be safer firmly on one side. This way they could suffer great consequences. Arguably they already have. History isn't without precedence in this regard. Nations have been stuck between two military powers before and worked hard to maintain neutrality. Turkey in World War II is an excellent example. Hitler wanted to invade, but could never find a good pretext for doing so. Russia was kept at bay as well on Turkey's eastern front through careful diplomacy. A similar example would be Switzerland in the same time period. What about Poland? Jasmine asked. I cleared my throat. Yes, well, I didn't say that every nation manages to maintain their neutrality when circled by wolves— most fall, but maybe crustacean history is different in this regard. It sounds like you approve of their position. I don't, but I understand it. Maybe it's an exercise in self-denial. 
In any case, I want to withdraw to put pressure on them. And if the macros attack again while we're out of reach? I shrugged. They probably won't. And we're watching. We'll maintain the fleet at Welter Station. If the machines put a new fleet in the Thor system, we'll fly out to meet them again. Marvin, who'd been quiet throughout this exchange, ruffled his metal tentacles. Knowing he did this when he wanted attention, I turned to him. Colonel Riggs, he said, the crustaceans have made a critical error. I agree with you, I said. But how can we convince them of that? I don't believe we'll have to. They will figure it out on their own. I frowned at him for a second, not quite sure what he meant. I hope you're right about them figuring out the situation, I said. We could use them as allies. I don't think they'll join us until they have no choice, however. Another day and night passed. The following dawn, my ships reached the ring and slipped through to the far side, where the battle station stood vigilantly at the border. It was there that my life would take a turn for the worst. The next day we awoke on Welter Station, and I started my usual morning routine. Sandra and I got reacquainted in the shower capsule, and I came out refreshed and ready for work. There was plenty to do. Miklos had left a raft of reports for me. The first news item on the list surprised me. General Kerr had left Eden 8. He'd said he couldn't wait any longer and couldn't accept my proposals as stated. He was going to have to consult with the Emperor personally and get back to me. I wasn't happy about it, but I figured I could understand it. I'd left him sitting around Shadow Guard eating air swimmers for a full week. Probably he'd just gotten antsy. But I knew he didn't have to fly all the way back to Earth to get word from Crow. He could have transmitted a message to communicate. It would have taken quite a while, but it would have been faster than flying back home. I shrugged, throwing the hard copy on my desk. I couldn't expect to go from a state of war to a productive peace in a few days. Such talks always seemed to drag on, even if peace was in the interest of both parties. I downed a mug of real coffee and headed for the battle station's bridge. We'd finally found lands where we could grow actual coffee beans on Eden 7, and the first crops had been harvested. The brew tasted a trifle bitter to me, but I was glad to leave the fake stuff behind forever. It was just before I reached the bridge that I got an unusual call. It was from Sandra, or at least that's what the channel indicated. The unusual thing was that the red urgent flag was blinking beside the call on my comm link. Sandra didn't mark things down as urgent unless she meant business. I halted in the passageway and tapped at it, frowning. What's up, hon? I asked. There was a moment of rustling. I frowned and was about to repeat my words when a voice spoke. It wasn't Sandra's voice. There's been an accident, said the voice. It took me a second to recognize who it was. Alexa? Is that you? What's wrong? Could you come quickly? It's Sandra. I'm using her comm link. She's not responding. I don't know what's wrong. Where are you? We're in the pool room on deck nine. I was already running. I was close to the lift, and I rode it impatiently down. Just in case something serious had happened, I contacted our medical people and ordered them to send a team down to the pool room. Pool was possibly the only sport that the members of Star Force had invented among themselves. It wasn't a game that normal humans could play, and even if they tried, it had to be played in low gravity. Our kind of pool did involve hard, colored balls, just like the traditional game. But the pool sticks were essentially baseball bats, and the pockets were the other players. The goal of the game was to nail your fellow nanotized marine with a pool ball by bouncing it off the walls. The game often became dangerous. I could easily believe Sandra had been showing off and knocked herself out by firing pool balls on wild banking shots to impress Alexa. She was good at pool, possibly the best I'd ever seen, but everyone made mistakes sometimes. I was worried, but nothing could have prepared me for the scene that met me when I reached the pool room. Since it was the start of a new shift and technically morning aboard the battle station, no one else was around. 
People normally played our favorite violent sport in the evening after dinner. I pushed on the sealed door, and it swished open. I felt a little resistance, and I knew instantly what it was. I'd felt the dead weight of a body against a door before. I slipped inside and looked down at Sandra. She was a mess. A puddle of foam tinged with pinkish blood matted her hair and face. I knelt beside her, putting out a gentle hand onto her shoulder. Sandra, honey? What did you do? I heard a sob. I turned and saw Alexa. She stood behind the door, trembling. She had a hand to her face and the other at her side. What the hell happened? I demanded. She shook her head and didn't answer. I could see she was in a highly emotional state. I turned back to Sandra and reached down to caress her hair. She was a fallen flower to me. I felt my emotions surging. I saw Sandra's eyes then. That was when I felt cold fear hit me. They were open, staring, blank. Up until that point, it hadn't occurred to me that she was actually dead. My hand left her cheek and went up to my comlink. I planned to open a channel to medical and order them to get their butts up there pronto. We could cure practically anything, even death. But she could be out of commission for months if they didn't get her under emergency care right now. I felt for her pulse, but there wasn't any. I looked for other vital signs and found nothing. My mind was filling with memories. It was impossible to stop the flood. When I'd first met Sandra, she'd died soon after. She'd fallen into the cold, cold ocean. I'd gotten my ship, Alamo, to fish her out and repair her body that fateful day. Later, when battling with macros, she'd been seriously injured again. In a coma for a long time, she'd been called a turnip by my charming medical staff. But she'd come out of that one, too. It was such a twisted joke if she could be taken out in a pool room accident now. Alexa said something behind me at that moment while I stared down at my dying lady love. She whispered, Sorry. That was all I needed. I didn't have to see her, and I couldn't really, because I didn't have time to turn my head and see what she was up to. Instead, I threw my arm back behind myself and made a sweeping motion as if hurling something. My body is unlike any human known to me. My bone and muscle density is, in fact, inhuman. My flailing arm had unspeakable power in it, even when I wasn't in armor and even when I wasn't in a good stance to deliver a blow. I struck her. I heard a cracking sound and felt her lift from the floor and go flying. Alexa sailed a good twenty feet to the far wall and smashed into it. Something reflective fell from her hand and tinkled on the floor. I rose up on the balls of my feet and advanced. My fists were at my side. I was breathing hard, ready to fight. But the fight was already over. She was unconscious and possibly dead. At her side was a silvery needle attached to a rubber bulb. Liquid dripped out from the tip onto the floor. Paranoid, I felt my back with my hands. Had she managed to scratch me with that thing, whatever it was? I'd been poisoned before, and it wasn't fun. As far as I could tell, she hadn't managed to jab me with the needle. When the medics arrived, I explained the situation as quickly as I could and screamed for Marvin to get down here and perform an analysis on the liquid and the rubber bulb. When I was certain both women were getting the best of care, I headed up to the bridge. I wanted to get to the bottom of this assassination attempt. I reminded myself as I sat in my command chair that this time it had been more than an attempt, as Sandra was technically dead. Normally I would have stayed at her side in the infirmary, but I knew that every second lost might be critical. I also knew who my prime suspect was in this case, the amazing, vanishing General Kerr. Chapter 26 I seethed with emotions and was barely able to sit on my command chair. Both armrests were seriously damaged due to my hammering and cursing. The staff was staying quiet. 
Word had gotten out about the attack, and no one wanted to approach me right now. I shouted for Miklos until someone went and got him. He stepped up, standing at attention. Are you aware an Imperial assassin was in our midst for over a week, undetected? I demanded. This is your command territory, Commodore. Security is part of your duties. I'm holding you responsible. I'm sorry, sir. I hope Sandra will recover. You have some explaining to do, I told him. When I left, I put you and your carrier on duty at Helios Ring. If you were there now, you could chase down Kerr. He's running and has reached the Helios system by this time. Miklos looked concerned. The carrier itself is still there, sir, he said. But I don't think that ship could catch the general in any case. Recall your removal of several of the ship's engines. Don't try to put this off on me, I shouted. I shook my head and took a deep breath. All around me, everyone else had frozen again. I suspected they were waiting to see if I had another violent outburst. I tried to calm down, but didn't entirely succeed. I was suckered, I said. This entire thing from Earth, this sham about peace talks, Kerr just wanted to come out here and kill us. Bravely, Captain Saren approached me. I was surprised to see her aboard the battle station. You're away from your post, Captain, I growled at her. Why have you left your carrier? I heard about what happened, she said quietly. I wanted to see if I could help. I barely listened to her. I wasn't looking at any of them. Last time Crow sent some newsy to sucker us with her charms, I said. This time he sent an old acquaintance and worked the knife again. This time he drew blood. Why am I such a fool? What do you mean, sir? Miklos asked. I focused my eyes on him. Isn't it obvious? I asked. Crow is clearly behind these last two attempts on my life. But there have been many in the past. Remember the first? The young Asian girl he'd just hired? Or the Dutch commandos after that? I blamed Major Barrera for those plays, but now I think it went higher up. Barrera and the rest of them were all working for Crow. Miklos and Jasmine exchanged glances. I noticed, but I didn't react. Let them think I was crazy. I could see everything now. It was all so very clear. Crow hadn't been able to arrest me and remove me from power directly, so he'd made a half-dozen underhanded attempts to end my life. Now he'd managed to strike down my closest confidant, my best bodyguard. If nothing else... I would be an easier target for the next blade that came out of the dark without Sandra watching my back. Get Quan up here, I said suddenly. Startled, Miklos and Jasmine both relayed the request. Less than thirty seconds later, Quan walked onto the bridge. I felt my face smile, even though it was only a grim twitching of the lips. Quan was in full battle gear. His visor was shut and his laser projector was cradled in his arms. I see you came well prepared, First Sergeant, I said. Actually, sir, I thought you might call, Quan said, placing himself beside my command chair. I was standing in the passageway outside. Of course you were. Well, I have need of you now. I don't know who's going to poison or shoot me next. Since Sandra's out of the picture for the moment, I want you on hand to do her job. Very good, sir. I noticed that the command staff looked intimidated. I often wore armor on the bridge, but somehow, seeing Quan there, staring at each of them in turn as if he suspected them of treachery, unnerved people. I turned to Miklos. What assets do we have in play to catch General Kerr? I assume he's crossing the Helio system on full burn by now? That's correct, Colonel. We don't have much in range, actually. The task force at that end of the Eden system is small and slow. If you recall, you placed a squadron of gunboats and a single carrier there as a defensive force. None of these ships can catch General Kerr's battleship. 
as it is now too far ahead on the acceleration curve. I asked for the data and got it immediately. I walked to the planning tables and did some calculations. We couldn't catch him with a ship, but... What about a missile? I asked. Or better, a lot of missiles. What do we have on Defiant? Miklo squirmed. You didn't authorize missiles to be placed on the new carriers, he said. Yes, but it just so happens that the ship in question has some aboard. I snorted. I knew Miklos loved those ships and loved to improve their designs. I knew I'd ripped his heart out when I'd torn up his plans and deleted so much optional equipment. At this point, I was unsurprised that he'd continued outfitting them to match his original plans. Under the circumstances, I said, I'm glad you made certain improvements upon the agreed carrier blueprints. Captain Saren, please check my numbers, if you would. She eyed them closely. I think they're correct, sir, she said. But there isn't enough time. The missiles could reach Kerr's ship if they were fired right now. But the command to fire must cross the Eden system. That's nearly twenty light hours. By the time the command reaches the carrier, it will be too late. Maybe, I said. I turned back to Miklos. I recall that your original design placed a ring-to-ring -ring communications unit aboard these carriers. Did that deleted item somehow make it back onto the roster? Uh, said Miklos, his eyes sliding around between the two of us. He seemed flustered and mildly embarrassed. Yes, it did, sir. I thought that since the carriers were natural task force command ships... Enough of that crap. Call them up and order them to fire everything they have. Miklos nodded and hurried to the communications consoles. Jasmine stepped closer to my chair. Quan twitched at her approach, but she ignored him. How did you know he would disobey orders and build that equipment onto the carrier? I didn't, I said but I probably would have done the same thing. His design was superior, and he knew it. I changed it because his plans would have taken too long to build at the time. Since I've been off campaigning in the Thor system, he made some worthwhile edits, that's all. Kyle, she said quietly, her voice almost a whisper. I know you're upset, but are you sure you want to kill Kerr this way? We don't know everything yet. There hasn't been any kind of investigation. If I wait for an investigation, Kerr will be safely home on Earth by the time he's been declared guilty. There might not be enough evidence to be certain anyway without capturing and questioning him. But you might be making a serious mistake and a major diplomatic error. I stared at her coldly. I liked Captain Saren, but she didn't always know what she was talking about. I play the odds, I said. I always do. Instinct must be part of any commander's arsenal of tricks. I trust mine in this instance. Kerr was behind the assassination, and Crow was behind him. I stood up and towered over her. She looked up at me, clearly unconvinced. I brushed past. Which reminds me, I need to check up on Sandra and her would-be murderer. I headed down to medical, and Quan stayed firmly in my shadow. We didn't talk, which was just fine with me. I wasn't in the mood to explain anything to anyone. I left Quan on guard in the main passage as I inspected the facilities. Marvin's body filled a good portion of medical. He was bigger than the last time I'd seen him. Today, I would estimate he was the size of a pickup truck and twice as heavy. The medical staff wasn't too happy about his presence, but they were tolerating it. They had little choice. Marvin's tentacles seemed to have been elongated. Maybe he'd made some special changes just for this occasion. In any case, the tentacles flowed over the floor and up to the ceiling like black metallic ropes. Then they dangled down directly over the patients or snaked up from the floor like self-mobile cables. 
Occasionally, the doctors and nurses stepped on one of the appendages and muttered a curse. In a modern Star Force facility, the doctors and nurses didn't do much. They were mostly there to monitor the process, make executive decisions, and fill out reports which I normally read later on casualty update screens. This time, I was more emotionally tied up with the process than usual. Do you have a moment, Doctor? I asked, grabbing the arm of a passing woman with a fleet medical insignia on her shoulder. She turned to me, startled. Colonel, I wasn't expecting to see you so soon. We're not done yet. Nothing's been determined. I frowned. She seemed nervous. I checked her name tag. It read, Kate Swanson, M.D. What do you know so far? I demanded. She looked down at her computer tablet and shook her head before she replied. I could see she was building up to give me some bad news. Even before she spoke, I felt butterflies in my stomach. It had been a long time since I had experienced that sensation. It was a neural toxin, sir, Dr. Swanson said. Something we've never seen before. It was tailor-made for this purpose. Designed to kill a Star Force Marine who is otherwise unkillable? She looked me in the eye for a second, then dropped her gaze again. She nodded. Yes, that's a good way to describe it. Fast acting. Too fast for the nanites or the microbials to adjust. Tissues were damaged so quickly the body didn't have time to respond. But the nanites and microbes should clear toxins. They flush them before they can do much harm. Normally, yes. By the time we got to Sandra, they were flushed out of her system, but they'd already done their work. Where did you get your data? From the empty syringe. There was a residue, enough to run tests. I nodded, thinking hard. You mentioned tissue damage, but you said it was a neural toxin, right? She nodded, eyeing me, then looked down at my hand. I realized at that moment I still had a grip on her arm. I forced myself to release her. She seemed to breathe more easily after that. You're talking about brain damage, aren't you? I asked. She compressed her lips together into a tight line and nodded. But we can rebuild her, I said. Any cell that's been damaged can be reconstructed if there's something left. She gave me a wan, flickering smile. That's true, sir. So why are you looking at me like someone killed your cat? It's too early to tell what we're dealing with, she said. Her voice was soothing, but I didn't feel like being soothed just now. I stared at her with hard, narrowed eyes. You're telling me Sandra's mind has been damaged, I said. She shook her head. It's been less than half an hour. We don't know everything. Give us some time, Colonel. I tried to think. I felt as if I'd been given a dose of neural toxins myself. Can she breathe? Is her heart pumping? Yes, sir. With help. What about the other one, the assassin? Lieutenant Brighton was severely injured, the doctor said. Apparently you struck her very hard. I looked at her sharply. Was that a reproachful tone in the good doctor's voice? Don't be taken in by her youth and attractiveness, I said. I was fooled, and she almost got both of us. She's an accomplished actress, an assassin who succeeded where a half dozen others have failed. Well, I don't know about that, Swanson said, refusing to meet my eye again. She was reading a chart from a computer tablet. She has a fractured clavicle, two broken ribs, and a broken wrist. There's also a hairline fracture at the base of her skull. She had a blood clot in her left lung due to a complication from the broken ribs, but we managed to dissolve that with a nanite injection. I put a hand out again and touched the doctor's wrist. Don't give her nanite injections. She doesn't deserve that. I'd rather see her die of her injuries. Dr. Swanson looked horrified, but she made a note on her tablet. I left her and went to talk to Marvin. Hey, Marvin, can you fix Sandra up? Unknown, Colonel, Marvin said. 
He didn't sound sorrowful, but then he never did. I looked around for cameras. They seemed to be split between me and Sandra, who was lying on her back on a table. A few more cameras followed Quan and the assassin. What do you mean, unknown? I demanded. Unknown, as in not yet determined, or dependent on input not yet gathered, or... Yeah, yeah, I get it. Listen, I want you to do whatever you have to do within reason. I need her up and around again within a week. There are some options, Marvin said. More cameras had swung to regard me now. I knew he was interested in my reaction. But they will take longer than a week to accomplish, and I'm not sure if they fit in with the category you described. You mean they might not be within reason? That point of judgment is very subjective. I would find the treatments reasonable, but I'm also aware that some human beings might not agree with me. I frowned at him. When Marvin got into the business of healing people, funny things tended to happen. I was also concerned to hear that Sandra's condition was so grave. I lightly touched Sandra's cheek. It was warm, and she was breathing. But I could see she was being aided by apparatus that had been cemented to her face by a silvery ring of nanites. My eyes ran down the length of her body. There were electrodes and veins made of nanites which formed themselves into mercury-like tubes. There were other devices attached to her as well, most of which I couldn't even identify. They were all over her. Can she breathe on her own? I asked. No. Those motor centers have suffered damage, Marvin said. He had a lot of cameras watching me now. I took in the part about damaged motor centers slowly. I'd never heard of a poison so strong it could kill such basic functionality for a prolonged period. But then I thought about it and I realized something as simple as botulinum, commonly known as Botox, could do that. Nerve damage? Brain damage? How serious is this? Will there be long-term effects? Undoubtedly. I didn't like where this was going. Usually any Marine that wasn't killed outright could be repaired from drastic battle injuries. The medical people had gotten to her pretty fast, but her condition wasn't as simple as a severed limb or a blast hole. This was a specially designed poison. I was about to question Marvin further when a call came in from the command center. It was Miklos. The missiles are away, Colonel, he said. They should catch the Imperial ship about two hours before they reach the ring to Alpha Centauri. Are we at war with Earth again, Colonel Riggs? Marvin asked me. I threw him a displeased glance and turned to walk away. Marvin had excellent hearing and vision, but he didn't seem to know when it would be considered impolite to use them. He always eavesdropped whenever he could. Good, Miklos, I said. That should give the general a little going-home present. If they take him out, will he have the opportunity to contact Earth? Unlikely, sir. But Earth will require an accounting in any case. I considered that point. Technically, the general was under diplomatic immunity. We haven't declared war, Miklos pointed out. And we haven't finished an inquiry that proves he is guilty. I wouldn't have given the order to fire the missiles if I wasn't very sure Kerr was guilty. I snapped. I know that, sir. I just wanted to point out that there are larger issues at stake. We are starting a new conflict by doing this, and we might not have all the facts as yet. I'm willing to take the diplomatic risk. An independent political group can't stand as a nation for long if it allows its leaders to be assassinated by another power and does nothing about it. That is your call, sir. I disconnected and turned back to Dr. Kate Swanson. She didn't look happy, and I surmised she'd listened in to at least half of my conversation. Fleet doctors were rarely pleased when a conflict started. I had to question their rationality on this point, as there would be no point to having them in Star Force if we never fought anyone. In fact, there would be no point to Star Force, period. How long until I can question the prisoner? I asked the doctor. She made a face that indicated she thought I might do something barbaric to the girl during this questioning. She can't even be moved. She's in an induced coma while the nanites do their work. 
I opened my mouth to say that I'd ordered her not to use nanites, but I closed it again. If I wanted information, I needed her strong enough to talk. I nodded my head. All right, I said. Use everything you've got to heal her, but stop with the painkillers. Let her feel what the nanites are doing. I want her awake and talking as soon as possible. I also want both these patients moved to my personal ship. The doctor shook her head. That wouldn't be wise, she said. We have the best staff and facilities right here on Welter Station. I know, I said. That's why you're coming with me. I didn't bother looking at the questioners as I marched toward the door. Dr. Swanson is in charge, I loudly told the rest of the staff. She'll fill you in on what you need to do. You are all fleet medical personnel, and key members will be going for a little voyage. I ignored them all after that announcement and headed for the command center. Swanson's sputtering exclamations didn't interest me. Swanson had her job to do, and I had mine. Quan stumped after me. He had to hustle because I was moving fast. Before I hit the doors and left, the word had already spread. Every staffer followed our march with stares that were disapproving and stunned. Where are we going, sir? Quan asked. The CC. And after that? We're going to fly to the Helio system and have a little talk with General Kerr. Ah, uh, Quan said, frowning. I thought he was running away. He'll turn around, I said. You can count on it. Chapter 27 when I reached the command center, I headed right for the tactical board. Quan stood around in the background. Everyone tried to ignore his battle-ready stance. Miklos was there, and he tapped at something as I arrived. I looked around, and Captain Saren showed up a minute or so later. She'd probably been getting some well-deserved rest. If I'd been in a better mood, I would have smiled. The Commodore had called in reinforcements. You're right in your assessment, I told him. Pardon me, Colonel? You've judged that I'm not in a reasonable mood. You're correct in that regard. Miklos looked at me seriously. He didn't ask what I was talking about because we both knew the score. What are your intentions, Colonel? Here are my orders. I'm leaving you in command of the system defense here at the battle station. Not that I expect anything serious will happen. I'm taking Saren and the fastest cruiser we have on hand to fly after Kerr. There is no mathematical possibility that you will reach him, sir, Miklo said patiently. I was always bad at math, I said, but I passed the classes anyway. And how did you do that, sir? I took shortcuts, did heuristic reasoning to derive answers, and I cheated a little. I see. Now's the time to cheat. Saren, since you're here, I need you to connect me to the sentry ships we have at the Helios Ring, the one that connects the system to Alpha Centauri. She tapped at her screens for several seconds. While she followed her orders, Miklos looked increasingly concerned. Sir, he said, leaning over the command planning table, what are your intentions? We only have a few escort class ships out there. They can't possibly stop General Kerr's battleship. I know that. Then what are you doing, sir? I gave him a dark look, but he didn't wilt. I took a deep breath. All right, I said. I suppose as my exec you deserve to know what I'm planning. I would have brought you into this earlier, but there hasn't been much time to have a staff meeting about it. Miklos waited patiently. Our scouts out there have systems capable of communicating with us instantly via the rings. I'm going to give them a message to relay to the worms. It is the worms who will stop General Kerr, along with your missile barrage. Miklos' face registered alarm. This is another breach of the peace, he said. Sir, I understand that you want revenge— I agree with you that General Kerr was probably involved in the assassination attempt, 
but I feel this is taking our response too far. If the worms destroy Kerr's ship, it will get back to Earth. They are our allies, but are outside our protective reach at this time. Earth would be well within its rights to reach out and destroy the worms. I nodded. You're quite correct. Under the circumstances you describe, Emperor Crow would be well within his rights to snuff out the worms. In fact, I believe he's been looking forward to just such an opportunity. Miklo stared at me with wide eyes. You see this? You agree? But you still persist in these orders? Very well. I can tell by the look on your face that you will not listen to reason. I'm going to let that slide, Commodore, I said severely. But you should control yourself in the future. I did not say I was going to have the worms attack Kerr's ship. What are we doing then, sir? Just then, Saren signaled me. The scout ship commander is on the line, sir. Hello, Commander Becker? Yes, sir, she said. I recall your name. Didn't you serve as a scout when the macros attacked the battle station last year? Yes, sir, that was me. Still on scout duty, huh? Well, you did well last time, so I'm glad I'm talking to someone with experience. What you're going to do is ask the worms to fly to the ring and stand guard. A hundred ships ought to do the trick. What are their orders going to be, sir? No orders, just to stand there at the ready. Tell them it's an exercise, or that we wish to test our targeting and navigational systems with our forces in close proximity. Commander Becker was quiet for a few seconds. Do you think they'll believe that, sir? I'm sure they can see the Imperial battleship racing away from our missiles across their system. I smiled tightly. I think the worms will understand. They're smarter than people think. All right, sir, I'll relay the message. Can I get help from Marvin with the translation into pictographs? Of course, I'll transfer you right over, I said then nodded to Captain Saren, who passed the connection to Marvin. Miklos was smiling thinly and had his arms crossed when I looked up at him again. You had me worried, sir, he said. I'm sorry about that. No, you're not. But it's okay. You think that General Kerr will stop? He might just crash your little simulated barricade. He's seen the worms in action before. We'll give him a few hours long enough for him to see the ships waiting for him and detect the missiles on his trail. Then we'll transmit an ultimatum to him. You'll demand that he turn around and come back? Yes. He'll have to surrender his ship. Will he do that, Captain? I nodded confidently. I've known General Kerr a long time, I said. One thing that stands out from his resume is the ability to know when he's beaten. He'll turn around. Don't worry. I walked off the bridge then and boarded a small transport which took me out to the cruiser Lazaro, which I had commandeered for this special mission. Several hours later, I was joined by Marvin, a stunned-looking Dr. Kate Swanson, and two critical care units. They were coffin-like affairs, full of nanite arms and gurgling liquids. Long glass windows allowed me to see inside. One of them held Sandra, and the other held Alexa Brighton. We converted the ship's hold into a large medical center for these two patients. Alexa was aware now and twitching in her coffin. Her eyes were squinched shut. She looked scared and her mouth was twisted in pain. I forced myself to remember what she'd done and not to feel sorry for her. It was hard on me as a male to watch her suffer. My kind naturally wanted to protect her kind. I steeled myself. She'd use these same instincts and Sandra's against us. As it turned out, I never had to make the call to Kerr. He called me just after we'd cast off and begun accelerating across the Eden system. I was down in the hold helping to adjust the gravitational dampeners to prevent the acceleration G's from affecting the two injured women when the call came in. As it turned out, it was good timing. B-1 
Being in the presence of Sandra put me in just the right mood to talk to Kerr. Riggs, this is General Robert Kerr of the Imperial... I know who it is, General, I said, interrupting him. The communication system using the rings was amazing. They operated on the basis of entanglement theory and used a sympathetic resonance between our phonic system and the giant rings in space that interconnected our star systems. The actual device that interacted with the rings was a miniature model of the ring in question, which, when altered physically, caused tiny vibrations in the structure of the titanic rings in space. This effect altered the state of the transmitting device, the ring, and the receiving device simultaneously, no matter where the three objects were. After that, it was a simple thing to detect the vibrations and transmit them to my personal comlink. The system was so fast and efficient, we were able to talk as if we were on the phone. It seemed like we were only a few miles apart. I bet you know why I'm calling you, too, Riggs. Is this how you start a peace talk? By firing on the diplomat if they decide to leave before you want them to? I'm not usually in the diplomacy business, but me, this is a capital F for failure on your part. Are you done with the bluster yet? I asked. You know why I'm stopping you. Your little care package went off. What the hell are you talking about? Is this another of your fantasies about bombs and women rigs? Because if it is, I think you need to see an entirely different kind of doctor. Growing tired of the general's tirade, real or acted, I made a spinning gesture to Captain Saren, who had a vid queued. She transmitted it to Kerr's ship now. It detailed the attack by Lieutenant Brighton upon Sandra and myself. For several long seconds after it ended, Kerr was quiet. I can see how this looks bad, he said at last. Yes, sir, it does. Is Sandra okay? No, sir. She's technically dead. I'm sorry about that, Kyle. I never suspected Brighton was a fanatic. Some people are just really into Crow. It's odd, I know. Probably downright unbelievable to you but he has a cult of personality going now back on Earth. Young Alexa must have fallen under his... Cut the shit, General, please. We're adults here. Now let me tell you how this is going to happen. You're going to pull the emergency brake on that battleship of yours, and you're going to turn it around. When it reaches a full stop, I'll transmit the order to the missiles to self-destruct. I'll also tell the worm ships to hold their position. They won't fire upon you unless you try to run their blockade. This is a huge breach, Kerr began. I was happy to hear the nervousness in his voice. Not as big a breach as coming to my system and sitting down at my dinner table to place a mole in my headquarters. You used my hospitality to violate the peace, General. If you'll allow me to give you a few words of advice, Kerr said. You'd best be careful, Riggs. We're playing with interstellar relations, and it appears to me that you're doing it on an emotional basis. Everything you've told me is conjecture. I'll tell you what's not conjecture, I snapped. I'm pissed off. If you don't turn around, I'm blowing up your ship. The next move is yours, General. Rigs out. I closed the connection before he could utter another word. I was tired of his lies and excuses. I didn't even care if there was a grain of truth in any of them. I wanted him to sweat for a change. I wanted him to agonize. Nothing changed for the next hour. Every ten minutes or so, Jasmine informed me Kerr was requesting to talk again. I ignored every call. I hoped he was raving, walking around his battleship, kicking asses and ripping out hair. The very image brought a glimmer of amusement to my deadened face. At last he stopped trying to engage me in pointless talk and took action instead. I'd half expected him to wheel and fire on my ships, 
If he turned to fight now, he'd avoid tangling with the worms. My force outclassed his, but with a well-fought battle, he could hope to take a few of my vessels down with him. If he wanted to play it that way, I was ready. They're breaking, Colonel, Captain Saren said. Commander Becker is able to see the exhaust plume visually now. They've stopped their burn, and they're breaking with what looks like full power. From my calculations, I'd say they started doing it right away after you got off the phone, as they are over a light hour out from Becker's position. I nodded, unsurprised. Have they fired anything? Any missiles on the loose? Nothing like that, sir. Too bad, I said to myself. There's another message coming in, Jasmine said. It's General Kerr again. Do you want to talk to him now? I shook my head. I stared out of viewport into the blackness of space. No, I said. Let him twist in the wind for a while longer. Chapter 28 As we flew across the Eden system, I became more and more concerned about the state of Sandra's health. They had her on full life support. She couldn't breathe by herself, and her heart didn't beat without constant stimulation. After living in a world where tiny nanites and microbial creatures could repair any sort of damage to tissue, I was accustomed to people getting better and doing it quickly. This was not happening in Sandra's case. I went down to the medical center frequently to check on both women. Quan was no longer following me around, as we were pretty sure by this time the assassin had been working solo. The assassin herself was doing much better. Alexa had sweated a lot due to the pain of nanites healing her without anesthetic, but she was past that stage now. I hadn't felt sorry for her during the ordeal. It was nothing every Star Force Marine hadn't gone through. I'd noticed that the staffers were avoiding me when I went down to check on Sandra's status. It was about when we reached the ring that transported us to the Helio system that I'd decided I'd had enough of dodging nurses and evasive answers from Dr. Swanson. I grabbed the good doctor's arm again, firmly. She was just about to slip by, saying something about being very busy. I looked at her, and she looked at me. Doctor, I said. Then I caught the look in her eye. It was undeniable she was afraid of me. Among my subordinates, my physical strength had become the stuff of legend. I'd never intended to be a superman. It had just turned out that way. Part of being able to withstand the gravitational field and atmospheric pressures of a gas giant was the necessity of possessing an extreme physique. I'd often performed tricks on vids for the staff— that sort of thing built morale for fighting men, especially Marines. No doubt Kate Swanson had seen me bend girders and work trees from the ground with my bare hands. She was fleet, and had bananatized like everyone aboard my Star Force ship. But she couldn't hope to face me if I lost my temper. I could rip the arms off a normal Marine, and she knew it. Not wanting to be a bully, I let her go. She looked relieved, but no longer attempted to slip by, or to give me weak excuses. Kate, I said, forcing my voice to soften. I need to know what Sandra's real prognosis is. She's not getting any better, I can tell that. What's wrong? Dr. Swanson licked her lips, then squared her shoulders. Around me, I noticed the room had quieted. I looked left, then right. The orderlies had vanished. I saw that the place was pretty much empty except for Marvin, who was panning his cameras like mad, and Sandra in her box. I caught sight of Alexa's box and frowned, as it was empty. Dr. Swanson finally began talking. As you must know, Colonel, she said, Sandra's situation is far from ideal. She... Wait a minute. I said, my frown deepening. Where the hell is that woman, Lieutenant Brighton? She's been transferred to the brig, sir. So she's fine, but her victim is still in a box? Tell me why. Sandra's body has fully recovered, sir, she said. 
There are a few spots of scarring, but really she would normally be fit to return to duty in another day or so. Normally. Right. Just tell me, I said, trying not to become angry. In the back of my mind, I figured I was going to hear something about a coma state, something that had triggered in Sandra's mind that they couldn't reverse as yet. I honestly thought Kate would tell me Sandra was going to sleep for a long time, maybe a month or a year. But when she finally did wake up, this would all be over. Sometimes the human mind can ignore the evidence set before it. Possibly the trait was one of the things that kept us going in times of great strife. She's never going to recover, Colonel Riggs, Dr. Swanson said finally. I looked at her. I saw her turn her face to one side, then the other. She glanced up at me briefly each time before finding some reason to look away again. She was about my age, but was still an attractive, vivacious woman. I could see that in her youth she'd been a rare beauty. I saw all that in her face in a single moment, but mostly what I saw was pity. Pity for me. It was not an expression I encountered often. I don't... I don't understand, I said. I mean, I know there was brain damage, but a brain is just a mass of cells like any other organ. It can be repaired, can't it? Yes, she said. But it's not her brain that's damaged, really. It's her mind. There's nothing there, Colonel Riggs. She's been erased. Erased? I felt funny then. It was an old sensation, one that I'd almost forgotten. Then, in a flash, I remembered when and where I'd felt it before. Years ago, my wife had died in a car accident. Sometimes I still dreamt of her. And my two children had died years later, the night the machines came to earth. This felt like those times. It was a sinking feeling, as if my guts were falling out of my body onto the floor, as if I weighed a million pounds suddenly and couldn't move. Dr. Kate Swanson kept on talking, but I no longer heard her. My mind was racing. I wanted to fix whatever had happened to my girl. I didn't need any more input. I needed to act. I threw up my hands suddenly, and she flinched away. She'd finally stopped talking and now watched me with big, round eyes. I took several deep breaths, staring at the floor. I didn't know what to do. That was a shock all in itself. As a man of action and decision-making, I rarely was met with a moment like this, a moment that required drastic thought and action, when I had absolutely no idea what to do next. I was a problem-solver, an engineer, someone who lived by his wits and made things work, no matter how difficult or impossible-seeming the task was. But this time my mind was a blank. Almost as blank as my lady love who lay in a glorified coffin full of feeding tubes and gently pumping bladders of oxygen. Alexa Brighton, I said aloud. I wasn't sure if I'd whispered it or shouted it, but I knew I'd spoken the name. I turned and walked out of medical with a determined stride. I knew where I was going and what I was going to do. Behind me, I heard Kate talking again. He's going to kill her. Marvin, you have to do something. What would you like me to do, Dr. Swanson? Stop him. He's going to kill the prisoner. Colonel Riggs is in command, Marvin said. His voice possessed none of her alarm or concern. He sounded calm and curious instead. That doesn't give him the right to kill a prisoner. That is debatable, Marvin said but in my honest opinion, I don't think any of us are capable of stopping him. I could no longer hear them behind me, and I no longer cared what they were saying. I headed back to the very farthest aft portion of the ship. There, between the main hold and the engines, was a closet-like chamber that served as a brig. 
It was rarely used, but sometimes one of our Marines got too drunk and beat a couple of other Marines unconscious. Our version of military justice had somewhat less strict rules in these situations. Our people could recover so quickly it wasn't a court-martialing offense to strike one another. However, there were exceptions that required discipline. If the disagreement was between men of the same rank, that was all well and good. But if it involved a superior officer, or if the aggressor just wouldn't settle down and apologize, we had to lock him up until he came to his senses. Usually this resulted in a loss of rank for the drunk. Today there was a single occupant in the narrow steel cage. I saw they hadn't even bothered to post a guard. If a nanotized, drunken, raging marine couldn't get out, this young woman was staying put. I stepped up to the bars. Alexa jumped up and stood at attention. She stared straight ahead at the forward bulkhead, which was only about three feet from her face. I felt sure she knew why I was there. How could she not? She'd known what the poison would do. She'd known how I would respond to her treachery, if she knew anything about me at all. I reached out my hands and placed them on the steel bars. I gripped them and squeezed. A strange sound erupted from the bars in my hands. It was like the sound of heavy old springs being pulled apart. Lieutenant Alexa Brighton, I said loudly. I hereby charge you with treason, murder, and assassination. How do you plead? Guilty, sir, she said softly. This surprised me somewhat, but not enough to take me off the track I was on. I summoned the strength that Marvin's baths and a million tiny alien robots had built into me. I summoned physical power I barely knew I possessed. The bars were like wire in my hands. I pulled them apart and snapped them in places. The hinges gave me trouble for a moment, but not the lock itself. The bolt had nothing to latch with after I'd pulled the door off and held it over my head. Twisted, groaning, and wrecked, I hurled the door up the passageway. It clattered and rang, making a horrible din. Up that way I knew Marines were watching. It wasn't that big of a ship, after all. They could hardly have missed this strange business. I felt their eyes on me from the dark passage, but I didn't turn to look. I sensed that Jasmine was among them. She was the only one who might have been able to stop me, I thought vaguely. But she didn't say a word. None of them did. That threw me into a greater rage because I knew what it meant. They all knew Sandra was dead. They all knew that she had no mind left, that somehow this imperial assassin had finally struck the blow that so many like her had tried to land before. She'd brought down one of our best and truly hurt me personally. I took a step forward. Alexa stiffened, but she still stood at attention facing the wall. I have witnessed your crime personally, I said. I have heard your plea. I will now pronounce the sentence. Death. Do you understand, Lieutenant? Yes, sir, she said very quietly. I was impressed with her resolve. There were no tears. There was no begging or lies. She didn't even tell me what a tin-plated bastard I was. She just stood there at attention, staring at the wall, waiting for death. I took another step closer. I now stood in the cell with her. It was cramped and stank lightly of urine. How was I going to do this? I thought about it. I'd never executed anyone before, at least not a human. I felt a surge of anger, not about her crimes, but about the conflicting feelings she was causing within me. I stepped closer and stood between her and the wall. Her eyes finally met mine for a moment. Why? I asked her. She opened her mouth, then closed it again. Please, sir, she said. Carry out the execution. I blinked. You don't even have the common decency to tell me why you tried to kill me. Did I kill your family in South America or Florida or Italy or somewhere else? No, Colonel. Why, then? I demanded. 
she did not answer. I narrowed my eyes, suspecting a rat. Was I being recorded? Was this a propaganda vid I was making this moment? A million bizarre scenarios played out in my mind. I didn't want Crow to win this one somehow. I didn't want him to gain anything through my actions. I think there will be a stay of execution, I said. I think we'll question you. We'll get every detail from you. She shook her head and drew her lips tight. It was a determined but sad expression. There was a weariness in it that I didn't quite understand. No, you won't, sir. I'm sorry to disappoint. My mind was racing. I decided to try to lay a trap for her. All right, I said. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ship you back to Crow. I'm going to tell him you tried to cause some harm, but you failed utterly. I'll tell him Sandra and I are both fine. Finally, at long last, her demeanor changed. She looked up at me and stared into my eyes. I saw fear there. No, you can't do that. Sandra is dead. I killed her. I almost killed you, whether you know it or not. I nodded slowly. Yes, you and I know that, but Earth doesn't. The Ministry of Truth will be fed doctored vids of Sandra and I alive and well. We can do that, you know. Hell, I'll make a fake Sandra if I have to. She'll walk and talk for the cameras. You won't win. Not this one. Please don't do that. It serves no purpose. I'm not going to serve your purpose, whatever it is. Nor am I going to let Earth get whatever it wants out of this. It will only hurt me, not Earth, she said. My father, my entire family. Explain. She finally told me why she'd become an assassin. Her father was indeed a marshal in the forces of Earth, but he'd gone against Crow and tried to remove him from power. The entire family had been arrested and imprisoned in the ruins of Sao Paulo. I frowned. South America? I said. There's nothing there. I've seen it. I was there when the city died. There are spots of life on the continent, but Sao Paulo isn't one of them. In the middle of a blast zone hot with rads, it's a massive prison now. The Committee for Public Safety sentences people like my father to be imprisoned there. It's where the unwanted go to be forgotten forever. I suddenly began to understand Lieutenant Brighton. If what she said was true, she was here to keep the rest of her family alive. So that whole thing with General Kerr was an act? A stunt? Designed to gain our confidence? Yes, sir. That's all I can tell you. What else do you need to know, really? The Emperor wants you dead. Everyone on Earth must obey the Emperor, or everyone they love will be horribly mistreated. I felt sick at the idea that Earth had fallen under the spell of such a monster. I knew Crow, or I thought I did. Was it possible that great power warped weak men? I'd always heard that, but I'd never witnessed it firsthand. If you think this confession will gain you forgiveness for your crimes, you are sadly mistaken. There was a tiny popping sound in Lieutenant Brighton's mouth. I stepped back away from her. She kept her mouth shut, but she looked at me. She turned her head and exhaled away from me. A strange gas rolled out of her mouth. It was bluish-white like cigarette smoke. I took another step back, staring at her. I'm dead now she said. And I could have killed you, but I didn't. Remember that, and have mercy, Colonel. I... She slumped onto the floor. I walked out of the chamber and called for a bucket of constructive nanites. No one moved for a second, and I repeated the order much more loudly. Then Captain Saren ran up to me. She handed me the container and stared into the cell. Lieutenant Brighton lay on the steel floor, twitching. Liquids bubbled from her mouth. 
I'd seen the effects before. She'd erased her own mind. I threw the bucket over the entrance, sealing it. The nanites knew what to do. They covered the open space, forming an airtight door. Captain Saren, I said. Jettison the brig into space with all its contents. You really did it, Kyle? I didn't think you would. I looked at her, not quite knowing what she was talking about for a second. But I understand, she said, staring up at me. I could see sympathy in her dark, pretty eyes. Your grief overcame you. It could happen to anyone. I got what she was saying now. She thought I'd struck Alexa dead. Another woman would have called me a murderer and possibly never seen me the same way again. But not Jasmine. She was already making excuses for me. That's not exactly how it happened, I said. Follow me to the bridge. I'll fill you in. Chapter 29 Some people have called me a hothead. Other people say the opposite is true, that I'm as cold and unfeeling as a glacier. There is truth in both these accusations. I have a temper. I act rashly at times, especially when under great stress. But I also get over things faster than most people. I can take stress in stride and keep functioning. For me, life always went on. I think it is this quality above all others that has contributed to my success as a commander. The Imperial British believed that one of the greatest attributes an officer could have was the capacity to remain calm under fire, to take death, blood, danger, and pain all in stride, to think clearly and act the gentleman even when others might run, fall to their knees, or cry their eyes out. I truly believe at this point in my career that a natural capacity to take emotional punishment has placed me where I am today. I am not sure I am happy about it, but that's how it is. That was the kind of man I am. I'd presided over a thousand tragedies and millions, no, billions of deaths. What kind of man, I asked myself, would not be broken by these events? Could anyone hold up under the weight of it forever? So far, I'd never cracked under the strain. I'd made countless mistakes, but I'd never been broken. I'd done the incredible often, and the impossible occasionally, but frequently failed when it came to the mundane. With all that said, the death of Sandra's mind struck me hard. I think it might have been easier if she died in battle against the macros. This lingering nonsense with her body kept alive in a truly vegetative state. It was painful for me. How could you say goodbye and move on when she was still lying there, breathing through a tube of gleaming nanites? When under serious stress I had a surefire, short-term cure. Beer. I know it might sound childish, but I'd never been in a truly bad state of mind that could not be improved by six or twelve brews. That was where I found myself after Lieutenant Brighton's suicide. I sat in my office, downing beers. I'd laid down a stash from Eden 8, the only planet cool enough to grow good barley and hops. The farmers among us had found an excellent business almost immediately, growing and selling crops we'd transplanted from Earth. Right now I was very glad someone had had the wisdom and foresight to bring along the essentials for brewing one of man's greatest creations. There was a tapping at my office door. I took no notice of it. Instead, I popped open another brew. It was number nine, I think, or maybe eleven. For some reason, those numbers sounded extremely similar to me at the moment. I didn't worry about who was at the door. There had been a number of lost souls tapping out there since I'd placed myself inside, and as the ship was still in one piece, I decided they could all just wait until I felt like opening the hatch. Right now, I didn't feel like doing that at all. Tapping again. Soft tapping. I could tell, even in my hazy, alcohol-soaked mind, that the tapping was feminine. There was something about it. Quan would have hammered. That was just a reality when you had fists like ham hocks. 
Marvin's knocking always sounded like someone was working a ball-peen hammer on a piece of sheet metal. Metal on metal had a distinctive clink to it that couldn't be imitated. But this sounded like a small hand tapping on a hard door. It was a woman, I was sure of it. For some reason, possibly it was the beer, I'll admit. Coming to this conclusion made me grow curious. I wanted to know who was there, and if I was right about the persistent knocker being a female. I stood up, walked to the door, and caused it to dilate open. It was Jasmine. I didn't smile at her, however. I just stared, wondering what she wanted, what was so damned important she had to invade my worst hour. Excuse me, Colonel, she said. I'm so sorry. I know you're not in a good state of mind, but General Kerr's ship is nearly at the rendezvous point. So what? Don't you think you ought to sober up before you meet the general and accept his surrender? This is a matter of state. The stakes are high. You have to pull yourself together, Kyle. I stood straight and tried not to sway on my feet. I stared at her flatly. You knew, didn't you? I asked, just like all the rest of them. Jasmine looked worried and slightly hurt. I knew she wasn't responding to treatment, but that's all. Nope, I said, sucking in air through my nostrils. I don't buy it. I stepped out into the passageway and looked right and left, expecting to see others out there lurking but the passage was empty. As there wasn't anyone else handy, I turned my anger toward Jasmine. You knew Sandra was a turnip, and you didn't have the guts to tell me. No one did. I noticed I had a fresh beer in my hand. I wasn't quite sure how it had gotten there, but I was glad to see it. Very glad. I took a big hit on it and walked back into my office. Kyle, she said urgently, you only have a few hours before you have to meet with Kerr and talk to him. Maybe you should do it, I said. I'm busy. She followed me into the office and sat across my desk from me. Behind her, the nanites hastily rebuilt the metal skin that served as my office door. Let's talk about Sandra, if you want to, she said. I was worried about you and her and all of us. But I actually didn't know it was hopeless. I thought she might recover. I've been as busy with matters of command as you have been. I handed her a beer. She looked at it in surprise. A cool vapor of frost wound up from the squeeze bottle. How do you get it so cold? she asked. I smiled. I showed her a compartment in the floor. There's a tube from this box that leads right out into space. A few seconds in there and it's just right. Marvin taught me the trick. She shook her head and put the beer down on the desk. I'm very sorry for your loss, Kyle, she said. I haven't had the chance to tell you that. No one has. I've been holed up in this office since I figured it out. We were both quiet for a moment, and my mind wandered. I thought of Lieutenant Alexa Brighton. I have to admit, I said. She was dedicated to her cause. Who? Alexa. She stood there, you know, ramrod straight and eyes ahead, just standing at attention up until the very moment she dropped dead. Awful and strange, Jasmine said. I shrugged. I don't know. How do you want to go out? That was her way. Not on her knees, begging and sniveling. She maintained her dignity until the moment her mind was gone. Jasmine fidgeted, looking uncomfortable. What is it now? I asked her. With an effort of will, I set aside my beer. I decided it would be my last. It was a painful decision, but one that every drunk has to make at some point unless they utterly fail nature's test and pass out. We did what you said. 
we sealed her in that cell. Then we jettisoned the entire chamber. Yeah, so? Well, we could have possibly revived her, put her on life support. I laughed. It was probably one of the least appropriate moments of my life for a laugh, but I was in an odd state of mind. What? I asked. Did you want two turnips in medical? She wanted to die, and I'd just pronounced a death sentence for her. In my opinion, an officer deserves to choose to take their own life in such a situation. I can only hope that in the future someone will give me the same privilege. Jasmine shifted in her chair as if uncomfortable. I hadn't thought about it that way, she said. There's another reason I wanted that cell sealed permanently. She released the toxin in a new way, via gas from her mouth. Probably she cracked a false tooth and exhaled it. That worried me. I knew that the poison had been delivered as a liquid injection before. We have no idea how long it might linger in the cell, erasing the mind of anyone who came near. Yes, she said, nodding. I think you did the right thing, then. You couldn't take the chance. I almost yelled at her that this wasn't about chances. That girl had deserved to die right then and there, and the best way for her to go out was the way she'd taken down Sandra. It was a fitting end to an assassin. I was happy, actually, that she'd been erased the way Sandra had been. But I didn't say it. I had that much self-control left. I realized I was already sobering up, unfortunately. It was the nanites and the microbes. They were metabolizing the alcohol in my blood nearly as fast as I could drink more. They knew a toxin when they saw one, and they worked pitilessly to eradicate such substances from my body. In my mind, though, I kept seeing Alexa standing there, begging me to tell the Imperials that she'd been a success. That, more than anything made me believe her story about being coerced into the attack. In my experience, people were pretty truthful in their dying moments. What are you going to do about Kerr? Jasmine asked me. I looked at her sharply, then nodded. That's why you're really here. You're worried I'll do something crazy, right? Well, don't be. I stood up, and she stood up with me. I took two steps toward the door. How long do I have? I asked. About twenty minutes. I can delay them if you want. No, no. I'll meet him at the airlock. He must come alone to this office. You already self-destructed the missiles that were headed to destroy his ship, didn't you? I turned off their engines and blanked their targets. We'll retrieve them later. That made me smile. Always the efficient frugal one, aren't you? I didn't mean it in a negative way, but her face fell. She didn't say anything. I frowned and then shrugged. As usual, I had no idea what was wrong with what I'd said. I didn't get most women. Hell, I hadn't even known what Sandra was thinking half the time. I stood near the door, straightening my kit. Jasmine stepped forward to help. Her small hands felt like the fluttering touch of a bird to me. She arranged my epaulets and smoothed my smart cloth uniform where it had bunched up. Then she reached up and combed my hair with her fingers. Have you got a mint? I asked. She handed me three without saying a thing. I crunched them and enjoyed the biting flavor. She did something then that took me totally by surprise. She gave me a tiny kiss on the cheek. I shied away immediately. I glared at her. I knew my eyes were red and bloodshot. I still felt the burn of alcohol in my blood. A gush of words came out of me, and I regretted them all almost as fast as I said them. You'd jump in Sandra's grave so fast? She's still alive, you know, technically. She's not even cold yet. Jasmine looked as if I'd slapped her. She cast her eyes down and reached out to touch the door. I could tell she was about to run off. I... I'm sorry, I said. I'm not feeling well. No, I'm sorry, she said quietly, looking at the floor. 
I shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. Jasmine left then, and I stared after her. There were more than a few crewmen in the hallway. They took in the scene and tried not to gape. She moved quickly, not quite trotting, but almost. Good God, I thought. I hope she's not crying. Then I saw her hand go up to wipe her face. Yep, she was crying. I let out a long sigh. I retreated back into my office. The door melted shut. Already I could hear and feel the ship making adjustments to its attitude with shivering jets. We were decelerating, coming into dock. General Kerr was probably already boarding a tiny pinnace to fly over to my ship from his. I moved to the tiny mirror in my tiny lavatory. I splashed some water and tried to sober up faster. I looked at myself and frowned. Those red eyes were going to give me away. You could have handled that one better, Riggs, I said to my reflection. So far, it was looking like a stellar day. I'd lost one girl, sentenced another to death, and sent a third running down the hall crying. Chapter 30 We met Kerr and his four guards at the docking bay. The door melted away and there was a hissing sound as the two pressurized chambers evened out. General Kerr looked extremely unhappy. He wore what I thought might be the glummest expression I'd ever seen on his face. He knew the score. He'd helped deliver an assassin into my inner circle. I wasn't going to be whining and dining him this time around. What he didn't yet know was what had happened to the assassin— we told the Imperials nothing about Alexa. It was obvious I'd survived, but how had she fared? I wondered if he would have the balls to ask the question. It must be burning on his mind. Just you, General, I said. Leave your guards in the boat. Kerr hesitated. The hard-eyed Imperial crewman at his side looked resolute, but fearful. Looking at them, I figured they were probably nanotized. After all, Crow had nanofactories back on Earth. He was probably busy churning out troops faster than I could hope to do out on the frontier. The Imperials wore fancy uniforms, dark blue with gold braid at their wrists, shoulders, and caps. They were all noncoms. As space veterans, I respected them. They'd probably seen their share of combat against the machines— when they'd fought the macros, we'd let slip by Eden on their way to Earth. I wasn't contemptuous of the men. I was confident in Star Force superiority. My men were Marines, after all. Out here, that meant more than it ever had. But right now, I didn't care about any of that. I made a shooing gesture toward the men surrounding Kerr. He opened his mouth, closed it again, then nodded. Go on back to the Carrington chief, he said. I'll be fine. Riggs and I go way back. Indeed we do, I said. The crewmen retreated reluctantly. My own guards relaxed somewhat behind me. Kerr stepped forward with the air of a man walking into a viper's den. Do you intend to kill me, Riggs? He asked. I think I ought to know I think you owe me that. I shook my head. I wore a grim smile. You don't want to know what I owe you, General. Right this way, sir. I ushered him down toward the aft of the ship. He looked concerned. This isn't the way to the bridge. Not unless you changed your designs all around recently. Wait. You're heading for the brig, aren't you? One old man has you worried? Gonna put me in chains, are you, boys? None of us answered him. I stopped at the door that led to medical. The nanite door melted and Marvin loomed close. What in the nine hells? Is that your crazy robot? What did you do, give him steroids? I wanted to show you something, General, I said. I led the way to the coffin that held Sandra. Kerr eyed the coffin in alarm. I saw understanding dawn at last on his face. 
your assassin wasn't entirely unsuccessful. I said, As you see here, your dinner hostess has been terminated. Her body still functions due to external impulses. We breathe for her, we pump her blood, we feed her glucose through needles. But she's quite dead. Her mind, as you know, has been erased. What the hell? He said. Erased? Is that what the plan was? I can see how that might work against your kind. He turned to me. I knew something was going to happen, but I thought it might just be a spying mission. I slammed my fist into his skull then. I didn't think it over, I just moved. It happened so quickly, I don't think I even knew what I was doing before I'd lifted my hand. Kerr recoiled and flew several feet into the waiting arms of a startled Marine who'd been marching behind him. I felt an instant surge of regret. I figured I'd probably killed him. A blow like that? An older, normal Earthman could never take it. His skull would be fractured at the very least. Internal bleeding, possibly a stroke. It was the beer, I thought bitterly. I still had half of it in my blood, and even though the nanites were working their microscopically small tails off, I knew it was affecting my judgment. I took two steps and stood over Kerr, who was still in the arms of the Marine who'd caught him. General? I asked aloud. His right eye snapped open. It was wide, and there was blood in it. His left eye had already swollen shut. Eh? <laughs> he said, struggling to his feet. He shoved away the man who'd caught him. So that's how you treat prisoners of war and star force, is it? I'd thought all those vids by the Ministry of Truth were doctored up until this very moment. If I hadn't experienced it, I wouldn't have believed it. I stared at him in amazement, then nodded. You are full of nanites, aren't you, sir? I asked. You should be down and out permanently. But you didn't know that I'd been nanatized, Kerr said. He looked at me with his one good eye. So you meant to kill me? I shook my head. No, that was just an emotional reaction. I've grown tired of imperial lies. They've cost me quite a bit lately. I lost my temper, that's all. You shouldn't have been able to one-shot me like that, he said. You've got more than nanites in you. That's classified. Kerr nodded. His one operating eye drifted back to Sandra again, lying inert in her case. I didn't want it to go down this way, Riggs, he said. I'm tired of all the bullshit, too. Whatever happens, I want you to know that. Sometimes we do things because we've made a choice between two evils— not because we wanted either of them. Do you understand me? Yes, General, I believe I do. Your girlfriend wasn't supposed to be injured. I imagine she got in the way. She did. She wouldn't let Alexa get close to me. All right, he said. I've come here, been clobbered, and I've apologized. I hereby respectfully request that I be allowed to return to my ship and leave your territory. I laid a heavy hand on his shoulder. I closed my hand with crushing force, grabbing up a handful of his smart cloth uniform. It was a testament to the strength of the material that it didn't rip, not even as I lifted him up and marched with him held at arm's length. His fingers clawed at my hand with surprising strength, his musculature was nothing compared to my own, however. The collar of his shirt cut into his neck, making him wheeze. I walked with him suspended above the deck, kicking and coughing. I saw his one working eye roll around in fear in its socket. Mercury-like metallic liquids were already shining in his wounds. What are you doing, Riggs? I'm granting your request, General, I said. I marched him across the central passageway to a circular door, which I tapped open. General Kerr had a weapon out, I noticed. It looked like a pen, but I saw the dark glass projector at the end, which he was trying to point in my direction. 
With my free hand, I slapped it away. His wrist snapped at my touch. He didn't scream, but he did hiss, sucking in his breath between clenched, bloody teeth. That's the second time you've broken that arm, he complained. I stepped into the sally port chamber. I waved for my marines to stay out in the passageway. Reluctantly, they obeyed. The door closed behind us, and Kerr and I were all alone in the steel chamber. I hit a big button on the wall, and Kerr's bulging eye followed me. The indicator light on the wall went from green to yellow, and the air began being pumped out of the chamber. Out of this very room, I told him. Platoons of brave Star Force Marines have made death-defying leaps into the void. In a way, it's an insult to those brave men that I'm allowing you to use the same portal. I should be tossing you out of the garbage chute. The light shifted from yellow to orange and a warning buzzer sounded. The air was decidedly thin now. You can't do this, Riggs, Kerr rasped. You'll be at war with Earth. There are only a few thousand of you out here. You're mad. The light changed from orange to red, and I snapped my visor shut. Kerr wasn't wearing one. Then I reached out toward the portal release. Kerr lurched in my grasp. Despite his injuries, he managed to wrap his legs and his one good hand around my arm, but it didn't do him any good. He strained and heaved, but I pushed the button anyway. The gases still left in the room exited with a forceful gust. I shook the general loose from my arm and let him float outside. There, in the cold void of space, his eye stared back at me. You see that? I shouted, pointing into the darkness. That silver line out there? That's your ship. All you have to do is swim over to it. I'm doing as you asked, General. I'm sending you back to Carrington. Kerr ignored my speech. I wasn't even sure he could hear it as the air was gone. He knew what to do, of course. He was a space veteran. It was pointless, but he exhaled letting all his breath out. He had to depressurize his lungs as quickly as possible or they would rupture. It could last a few seconds longer in total vacuum that way. Unlike common misperceptions, humans do not instantly freeze in space. They do depressurize. The body is too hot and too tightly compressed for space. Our blood begins to boil and the lack of oxygen quickly does its inevitable work. But nanotized marines are a thing apart from normal humans. They're self-repairing, and the little microscopic bastards just don't know when they're beaten. Kerr hung out there in agony. He's twisting all right, I thought to myself. But there's no wind. A lot of things went through my mind as I watched Kerr die outside my ship in the heartless nothingness that is space. I thought of the moments we'd shared both good and bad. We'd always found a way to live together, he and I. Others had died all around us, but we'd never struck the final blow against one another. Maybe that was because we were alike in some ways, determined men with iron resolve, men unafraid to order others to die or to die ourselves. It had always been difficult not to admire Kerr. I had to admit in my heart of hearts I blamed Crow for his recent turn to dark deeds. Something about the way he was going out impinged on me. I just witnessed Lieutenant Alexa Brighton standing at attention, accepting her death as calmly as she humanly could. Here was Kerr, fighting it hopelessly to the final second. Alexa had died for her family. I believed that part of her story now. She was an honest young woman, and as Kerr himself had said, she'd chosen one devil over another. Not because she loved either, but because she had no choice. Crow would no doubt punish more innocents back on Earth due to my actions today. Someone had to fall. Someone had to be proven disloyal. Wasn't that the way of every dictator, or at least most of them? They ruled via terror. The terror of their subjects and of the dictator himself— both were afraid of the other. 
and that fear kept everyone in line, forcing them to do horrible things. And here I was, reacting killing Kerr for revenge, despite the fact he hadn't given the order in the first place. I cursed under my breath and said, Tether! A nanite line extended from my suit to the wall of the ship. I threw myself out into space after Kerr. I reached out a hand and grabbed him. I tugged on the liquid steel tether and it drew me quickly back into the ship. I hit the button on the wall and the lights went from red to orange to yellow and in about thirty seconds turned green. I opened my visor and stared down at Kerr. There was frost on the walls, forming ice crystals in the cold chamber. Kerr had stopped moving. In fact, he looked extremely dead. As I watched, frost formed on his eyelashes his face was so cold it was causing water vapor to condense and freeze upon it. But nanites are cruel, heartless things. They don't quit. Dead bodies, charred and swollen, might look beatific the following day, after the tiny robots inside worked their magic pointlessly on a corpse overnight. I waited a minute, and I thought I saw something, a slight rise and fall, a redness replacing the bruised purple around the nostrils. Are you still in there, General? I asked the corpse. The right eye popped open. Although the eye rolled around, I knew it was too frozen to see. His breath wheezed and rattled in his throat. It sounded like the last gasp of a man on his deathbed, but he was breathing. The blind eye kept moving as if looking for me. I'm right here, Robert, I said. It didn't look like you were going to survive your little journey to Carrington, so I had to reel you back in. Finally, the one good hand the general had left rose up slowly. It curled, gesturing for me to come closer. I bent my ear to his blue lips and listened. Fuck you, he wheezed. Chapter 31 I felt better after killing Kerr. Oh, sure, I'd revived him, and I was now allowing him to recover in the very same coffin where Alexa had spent her final days. But I had killed him. I took some perverse pleasure in that. He'd gone through the pain, the anguish, and the fear. He'd experienced the hopelessness, the final black moments of succumbing. He died out in space, with the full and certain knowledge that he was well and truly screwed. I'm not going to say that was good enough for me, because it wasn't. I'd kill a thousand General Kurs to save my Sandra. But of course, she couldn't be saved. The ordeal I'd put Kerr through didn't atone for his part in this evil scheme. I never would have reeled him back in except for one thing— I didn't want to make Alexa's family suffer for nothing. That woman had struck a hard blow against me and mine, but she'd done it to save her own people. I could understand that. If it had been my own family on the line, I probably would have done the same to her. My family was all dead now, but her people back on Earth were presumably alive and possibly suffering under Crow's harsh rule. That's the part that had changed my mind, and had saved Kerr's life in the end. Sir? Captain Saren said, approaching me cautiously. Everyone was treating me like I was a feral dog on the street these days, even Jasmine. No one liked to make a sudden move in my presence. Probably that was wise on their parts. What is it, Captain? It's the Carrington again, sir. The Captain is demanding that General Kerr be released. If I did hand him over, he'd probably die. They don't have medical equipment as good as ours. Our medical systems included microbial baths, not just robotic arms, brain boxes, and intravenous nanites. I knew Earth didn't possess our capacities to dispense life at will. Jasmine paused after my last statement. She was probably hoping I was going to go on and say more. 
She was disappointed. Should I relay that to Carrington, sir? No, I said. Jasmine gnawed her lower lip. They might fire on us, Kyle, if we don't even tell them what happened to the general. I shrugged. Let them attack, then. I'd like to take out one more Earth battleship. Sir, I don't understand your... I heaved a sigh and straightened. I'm sorry, Jasmine, I said. I'm being self-indulgent. I'll now give orders that make sense. Tell Carrington that we've got their general and he's alive. But he's had an unfortunate accident. We'll return him shortly. After this, I honestly expected her to turn around and go. But she lingered in the passageway outside my quarters instead. Yes, I asked. What is it? Why didn't you kill him? She asked, her voice just above a whisper. I know you wanted to. I know you almost did it. I nodded and looked at her. My quarters were dark except for a few LED lights that ran along the floor for emergency lighting. I liked it that way right now. Dark. He couldn't pull the LEDs up without using a screwdriver, so I hadn't bothered. Her face and body were silhouetted against the relative glare of the passage behind her. Eyeing her, I thought her hair was perhaps a trifle longer than it should be. Certainly it was past regulation length. But I didn't complain about it. She'd gotten away with that for months, and we both knew it was because I liked her to wear it long. Because... If I kill him, Crow will abuse Alexa's relatives back home. The poisoner? Why would you care about her? And why should we worry about what the Imperials do to each other? I shifted uncomfortably in my chair. It felt constrictive to me, so I stood up and began pacing. They're our people, Jasmine, I reminded her. Star Force has sworn to defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But it's more than that. I feel partly responsible. What? She said, raising her voice. That's nonsense, Colonel. Everyone knows Crow is to blame. Exactly, I said. And who do you think had the opportunity to take him out of the equation long ago? The kind of sin I've performed is one of omission, of inaction. I let Crow live and thrive like a spider in the dark, and now countless invisible people are suffering because of my oversight. Now you're blaming yourself for what Crow does? That's silly. I took a few steps toward her. She backed away at my approach, out the doorway and into the hall. I wasn't surprised that she was physically afraid of me, but I was saddened. I guess that after you kill a few people with your bare hands, the rest get nervous. Burke once said, All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. But you didn't know he was evil, Kyle, she said. Not back then. I didn't know exactly what Crow was going to do, I said. But I always had a pretty good idea. I let it slide. That's why I'm taking part of the blame for this situation. The rest I lay at the feet of humanity. They could have stopped him. The men who follow him now could shoot him rather than serving under him. They must know what he is. In any case, I want you to relay my message to Carrington. Yes, sir, she said, and left. The door solidified behind her. A few minutes later, a light tapping began again. It was a feminine knock, and it sounded almost timid. With a grunt of frustration, I opened it. What is it now, Jasmine? I demanded. But when the door melted away, it wasn't Jasmine that stood in the hallway. It was Dr. Kate Swanson. She looked wary, just the way they all did lately. I rumbled in my throat inarticulately. What do you want? I asked, finally. Then I caught sight of something. It was a camera on a stalk, peeping over her shoulder. I leaned forward and followed it back. About ten feet away, 
Marvin filled the passage with his bulk. I nodded in sudden understanding. You figured I would open the door for a female, is that it, Marvin? Profiling me again? There's something we'd like to discuss, Colonel, Marvin said. I glanced at Dr. Swanson. She looked pale and her eyes were big. She hadn't said a word yet. I take it the topic of discussion isn't going to make me happy, I said. On the contrary, Colonel Riggs, Marvin said with a touch of excitement in his voice. It may well be the best news you've heard all day. Marvin had me now, and we both knew it. Out with it, robot, I said. I've begun a series of experimentations in necrological reconstruction. It's possible these efforts will bear untold benefits in the future. I squinted at him. Necro what? Necrological. It's a new term. Do you like it? I've just coined it, actually. As the inventor of this new science, I felt I'd earned the privilege. Dr. Swanson cleared her throat at this point. I eyed her and thought she looked worried. Marvin, she said, it's not actually a science. It's a theory, a research proposal to be exact. This is about Sandra, isn't it? I asked. I tried to keep my voice steady. I don't want you cutting her up or anything like that. No, no, certainly not, Marvin said. I stared at Marvin's cameras and they stared back at me. They shifted and whirred. Neither of us said anything for a few seconds. We both knew he'd laid out the bait and I was on the hook. By this time I'd pretty much figured out what was going on. Marvin had gotten a crazy idea about healing Sandra, and it was so awful that Dr. Swanson wasn't sure she wanted to be a part of it. I knew right away I should just steer clear of the whole thing, that I should tell him no, and march down to medical and pull the plug on Sandra's coffin myself. Let her rest in peace, some part of my mind told the rest. But there was another voice there, too a voice that whispered of hope and the powers of science. I recalled that voice from my distant past. Miracles of healing had happened. I'd witnessed them with my own eyes. Once bitten by hope, a man is forever its plaything, I said. Is that an idiom, Colonel? asked Marvin. I'm not familiar with it. Can't you just leave well enough alone? Sandra's condition is hardly well enough. I believe I can improve upon it dramatically. Do you want me to try, Colonel Riggs? Do I have your permission? By this time I was leaning against the wall. I felt the faint vibration of nanites against my skin. No wall in a nano ship is ever completely still. You know you do, I said, beaten. Marvin didn't say another word. He knew enough not to blow it. He slithered away on a dozen rasping metal tentacles. There was excitement in his movements, and he held his cameras higher than before. I turned to Dr. Swanson. She looked a little green and a little frightened. Did everyone think I was a wild-eyed murderer today? Kate, I said. I shook my head, looking after Marvin. Is this going to end badly? She was quiet for a second. Then she sighed and shook her head. I honestly don't know, sir, she said. But that's not the only reason I'm here. What are we supposed to do with General Kerr? Can he survive outside his box yet? Yes, sir, but he looks like hell. Good, I said. Release him. Put him back on his pinnace and have him transported back to Carrington. I don't want him completely healed up before they get a good look at him. Don't worry, Colonel. It will take more than a few days for his nanites to clean up the damage you inflicted upon that man's body. With that, she turned and walked away. I watched her disappear. Had I just been scolded? I was pretty sure that I had been. Chapter 32 I was dubious in the extreme, but I couldn't deny that Marvin's injection of hope had brought me back to life. Even if he failed to do the same for Sandra herself, I reflected, he had done his work on me. 
I knew it could be a sugar high, a temporary state of mind that may come crashing down, forever weighing upon my spirit. That's how it had been with my kids. But I also knew I was a tough-minded person. I didn't feel emotional damage the way others seemed to. When I suffered a loss, I was shaken, but I never went to pieces completely. At least, I hadn't been broken yet. When I was sure General Kerr had made the transfer over to Carrington and the battleship had wheeled and blasted away without bothering with a farewell, I headed up to the bridge. I'd pretty well sobered up by now and wanted to get back into the game. I told myself along the way that Sandra's state was due to my choices as much as Crow's or Kerr's. I'd tempted fate on a regular basis. I'd taken my love into combat, for God's sake. How could one expect to live forever in a heartless universe like the one we inhabited when you continuously took grim chances? We'd rolled the dice enough times and we'd finally lost the game. It could have happened to anyone, but it had finally happened to my Sandra. I arrived on the bridge and greeted no one. The conversation among the staffers, whatever it had been, immediately died. I sat in my command chair, brooding. I glanced around and noticed that everyone was evading my eye. Then I figured it out. The topic of conversation had been me, or possibly Sandra and Marvin's crazy plans. I didn't know what Marvin was doing down there in medical. I didn't want to know. I'd come back to the bridge because I knew I needed something to keep my mind off the topic. I was here to keep myself from going mad. Give me a sit rep, people, I barked suddenly. A timid ensign brought me a tablet brimming with charts, written logs, and numbers. I flicked my way through it until I found a few items of interest. I frowned as I read data coming in from Eden 12. Something was happening back home. I snapped my fingers until the ensign came back. She was young and had a scared look about her. I figured they'd sent her because she was junior among the group. The staffers were brave enough in battle, but a bunch of cowards when it came to talking to the titular leader of Riggs Pigs. I read her name tag. Ensign Kestrel? I asked. What's this? I pointed to a spike on the charts which indicated increased activity at both the Eden and the Thor system rings. Emissions reading, sir, she said. A single lock of her brown hair slipped down into her face, covering one eye. She didn't seem to notice, but I found it distracting. Is your hair regulation length, Ensign? She opened her mouth and closed it again. I don't know, sir, she said. I'll check. I'm sorry. I took in a deep breath and tried to relax. Never mind, I said. It looks okay, and lots of fleet people cheat on the regs anyway. Forget about it. Thank you, sir. I went back to poring over the charts. I touched the emissions spike, and a box came up on the screen, giving me more data. These numbers are out of bounds, I said. I should have been alerted about this activity at the rings, not to mention these planetary anomalies on Eden 12. I'm sorry, sir. I think we did try to contact you. She looked over her shoulder helplessly at the others. They were studiously involved with their screens. Ensign. I said, regaining her attention. It's all right. I've been out of sorts lately. I guess it isn't staff's fault. She looked so relieved she seemed to melt. Thank you, sir. I nodded, pondering the numbers. These readings on Eden 12, they're spiking again. I want to know what they are. I want a scout ship sent to the gas giant. We've got to ask the Blues what they're doing down there. How do we do that, sir? I nodded thoughtfully. How indeed. We hadn't had the best relationship with the Blues since the very beginning. They were an enigmatic cloud race that seemed to be made up of structured aerogels. They lived in the soupy atmosphere of the Eden System's only gas giant, swimming in the thick air like it was an ocean thousands of miles deep. The Blues had originally built the Macros and the Nanos, the machines that plagued us today. They'd let them loose upon the universe. They'd let them do their exploring and conquering by remote control. 
As a victim species of the machines, humanity had taken offense to these actions. We'd attempted diplomacy, but rarely been successful. We'd only managed to force them to cooperate in a single instance, and that had only been after bombing their homeworld indiscriminately. Now there was something strange going on down there on their massive world. They were quietly doing something, without telling us what it was. I looked up again and saw the ensign was still lingering, uncertain what her orders were. We're going to go to Eden 12 ourselves, I told her. We're going to scan the planet as best we can, and we're going to ask the Blues what the hell they think they're doing. Now, go relay that order to the navigators. Tell them to lay in a course and fire up the engines. Ensign Kestrel nodded, taking the tablet from my hands as I offered it. I gave her a flickering half-smile. I didn't really feel like smiling, but I forced myself. My fractionally softer expression worked on her like magic. She relaxed and smiled back. I watched as she returned to the others and reported to them how her little mission had gone. They seemed relieved. They talked in low voices and studiously avoided looking in my direction. The next two days were tense. There were precious few reports, either from medical or from Shadow Guard. The strange energy surges on Eden 12 continued, as did the transmissions someone was attempting to send via the rings. I ordered that the transmissions be recorded and analyzed. Without Marvin's help, however, the analysis was going very slowly. We were jamming the rings ourselves by sending garbage signals to them an infinite series of random, meaningless vibrations constantly buzzed and shivered the big artifacts. But as the transmissions continued, I became increasingly worried. I summoned Captain Saren as my carrier task force approached the massive gas giant Eden-12 and parked itself in orbit. Captain, I said, going over the data with a deepening frown. Could they be overcoming our jamming somehow? I don't see how that could be possible, she said. Yes, but they must know we're jamming their signal. Why would they continue to transmit if it wasn't working? She looked concerned. We could monitor the data at the far end to see if it's related. We don't need Marvin to do that. I nodded. Do it. Jasmine spent the next few hours working the staff. She soon came back with a worried frown. I've sent something to your tablet, Colonel. I paged through about a hundred reports. Sometimes I found the modern age of information overload to be frustrating. We had more data than ever, but the sheer volume of it was overwhelming. It was difficult to sort out valuable items from what amounted to a massive pile of spam. I considered assigning an underling to going over my reports, trying to find the proverbial needles in the binary haystacks. My eyes left the tablet and drifted toward Ensign Kestrel. She'd been handling my input over the last few days, a job Sandra used to have. She had her back to me, and her jumpsuit was alarmingly tight. I thought to myself that she might work out as a spam detector. She might work out very well. Captain Saren cleared her throat. I took in a deep breath, then went back to the reports. Finally, I found something interesting. Right here, I said, touching a data point that proved my theory. About seven hours ago, the ring on the far side of the Thor system shivered in a pattern that matched the activity at the Eden ring. Saren came close. She leaned near me, and I smelled her faint perfume. She had a hot smell to her underneath the perfume— I knew it came from long hours of work on the bridge without a break. I began to feel a little warmed up myself with her leaning so close, but I knew that if I moved she'd realize we were in close contact and be embarrassed, so I just sat there and stared at the screen she was reading. Why do they have to make these tablets so damned small? I see it, sir, she said at last. It's buried in the data, but the signature is there. I'll work on a filtering program. I'll take out all the data that represents our jamming pattern, and I'll see if it becomes clearer. That's the problem, I said. Our jamming isn't random enough. There is a high-frequency signal buried in here. 
We're hitting the ring with our own random garbage, and that worked for a while. But now they've become more sophisticated in order to bypass our crude techniques. I don't get what you mean, sir. Well, let's say we send a signal that shifts every millisecond. That means that in between those time slices is a window to squeeze in some data. Maybe they can hit the rings ten times inside that millisecond and then skip a beat for our pulse, then go right on sending. The receiver knows to ignore our signal because it is too regular. She narrowed her eyes and bit her lip. She turned back to the data. She nodded slowly. They're communicating, she said with certainty. I mean, someone is. But who is talking, and what are they saying? I think it's pretty clear, and that's why we're orbiting Eden 12 right now. Her expression changed to one of alarm. You're saying the blues are talking to the macros again? She asked. She leaned close to me again and spoke in a low, urgent tone meant only for my ears. You aren't going to bomb them again, are you, Kyle? She asked. The last time, the Blues called it barbaric, and I think they were right. I don't know. Was the bombing of Dresden barbaric in World War II? Yes, she said seriously. I think it was. Well, if they don't stop plotting with the machines, I won't have any other choice. I don't want to do it. I've done everything I can to convince them to ally with us. They don't even have an excuse not to be on our side. They aren't exposed like the crustaceans. They're right here in Eden where we can protect them. Maybe they don't want to be a part of our alliance because they're too proud. I think they want to lead the alliance or at least stay independent. That's not going to happen. I said. The only logical thing for them to do is join us. Unfortunately, the Blues don't see it that way. I have to admit that in the end, the Crustaceans turned out to be the more trustworthy race. They were shooting at the machines during this last battle. So far as I can tell, the Blues have never helped us willingly. But, she persisted, are you going to bomb them? If I have to, yes. Jasmine retreated from my command chair without another word. I could tell she wasn't happy. I reminded myself it wasn't my job to make the people under my command happy. It was my job to beat the machines. Getting in touch with the Blues was never an easy task. We'd gotten better at it with time, but it was still a frustrating process. We spent the next three hours transmitting down into the stormy methane soup they called home. There was no response, not even an acknowledgment. What we did notice was a cessation of the signal going through the rings. They'd stopped sneaking transmissions in between our ham-handed jamming techniques. As hour four began, I became restless. We'd been patiently knocking on their door for long enough. Let's drop a few, I said, going over our stocks of thermonuclear weapons. I'll set the depth that— Sir, Captain Saren said, can I speak to you? I looked up in surprise. She and all the rest of the staffers were staring at me. Most of them looked pale. I frowned back, becoming annoyed. Do you have unexpected news? I asked. Let me guess, the Blues have announced they're ready to talk, right? No, sir, it isn't that. What did they say, then? Why, nothing, Colonel— They've yet to respond. Captain, I said, leaning back in my chair. You're from Calcutta, aren't you? I failed to see what... Indulge me. She muttered something I didn't catch. A few of the staffers struggled not to grin. My frown deepened. What was that? I asked. I said, yes, sir. I'm from Calcutta. Right. Now imagine you're a suspect in a serious criminal case back home. When the cops come to your door in your hometown and they hammer on it and yell for you to open it and talk to them, how long do they wait before they break it down? She hesitated. Not long. Far less than four hours, I'll bet. Well, that's the situation we have here. 
We're the cops and the blues are our prime suspects. I'm not waiting any longer. Load the missiles and set the warheads to explode at a depth of 6,000 miles. There was some confusion amongst the staffers. Excuse me? Ensign Kestrel said as they nudged her in my direction. Sir? What is it? According to our intel, the blues reside much deeper than that. Thanks for the trivia, Ensign. Now drop those bombs. I want ten warheads going off in a descending pattern. Start at 6,000 and work your way down to 6,500. Fire them off slowly with a ten-second interval between each of the launches. They programmed it in, and we all watched as the first burning spark went down, 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 plunging into the coffee mocha cream atmosphere. The spark was swallowed up like a match being dropped into liquid. I ordered more missiles to be launched. We'd fired three by the time the first one went off. A brilliant light flared deep inside the sea of gases below us. A hydrogen bomb, twenty megatons of force, looked like a lightning strike seen through a rain cloud from our perspective. After the seventh warhead was launched, Jasmine waved at me frantically. I lifted my comm link to my ear and listened. Your presence has not been requested, said a strange voice. I knew in an instant that I was talking to a blue. I signaled Jasmine and the staffers worked to stop the bombing and disable the last warhead we dropped. Well, I said to the blue, I thought maybe nobody was home. What's your name, creature? I am known as Tolerance. That's an encouraging name, I said. Have I spoken to you before in some previous iteration? No, said the voice. I would have remembered a dense thing such as you. The being known as Colonel Kyle Riggs is notorious on our world. I'm notorious in a lot of places. Now let's talk business. As a part of our previous agreement, it was stipulated that you would not attempt to contact the machines. We know you have breached... There are limits even to my pity, and you have exceeded them. Do you understand that your weapons have brought this matter incredibly close to the end? Do you understand that annihilation is at hand? I frowned. Sometimes the translator brain boxes didn't interpret idioms quite right. I figured that this might have been one of those times. I'm sorry, I said. I'm not sure I understand you. We dropped our weapons to force you to give us your undivided attention. We have no intention of destroying any of your people today as long as you answer our questions to our satisfaction. Answer your questions? The conceit is amazing. I was informed of this unbridled arrogance, but I did not credit it. Now, however, the evidence is overwhelming— your species must have a very low regard for life. On the contrary, I said, not quite sure again if I understood the blue, but trying to go with the flow. We regard life highly. We do not regard the machines highly, however. We plan to destroy the artificial race we call the macros in any way we can. Toward that end, we'll promise not to drop any more bombs into your atmosphere if you will accede to our demands— you must not converse with the macros in any way. A strange sound came over the speakers. It took me a moment to identify it. Excuse me, tolerance? Are you laughing? I almost do not know where to begin. Your misunderstanding of the situation is almost total. All right, then, I said. Enlighten me. You spoke of annihilation, yet we don't intend to harm you. I was not speaking of the annihilation of blues at the hands of dense things such as yourself. I was speaking of the annihilation of humanity by my species. I sat there in my chair for a second. Then I stood up and slowly walked toward the central console. The staffers made room for me in their midst. I muted the audio pickup on my collar. Jasmine, I said, have they fired anything at us? 
Nothing that I can see. I relaxed a little, but not much. I unmuted the channel again. Tolerance, I said. Are you claiming your people have the power to damage us? No, said the voice. I'm informing you that we have the capacity to erase you from the cosmos. All of you. Chapter 33 How did that old saying go, that you should be careful what you wish for? Well, I'd wished for the blues to talk, and now I was regretting it. Our conversation continued for another half hour after Tolerance had informed me that the blues were considering the annihilation of all humanity. I got nothing else of use out of him. Rather than presenting any evidence of his claims, he discussed my shortcomings as a sentient being at great length. We've encountered a number of creatures claiming to possess self-awareness. But your kind stands out as unique, he said. Yeah, how's that? The details are too numerous to list. But in the interests of raising your collective consciousness, I will stipulate your worst traits. I'm looking forward to it. Without a doubt, the greatest flaw in your species is a refusal to recognize the wisdom of your elders. You want respect, is that it? You've been technologically advanced for more centuries, so... Not centuries. Countless millennia. I nodded, pushing out my lower lip thoughtfully. Maybe you're right on that point, I conceded. We might not have exhibited the proper respect for you as an elderly species. You must understand that we've naturally interpreted your slow, deliberate actions as incapacitation. It's only natural when dealing with weakened beings. Weakened? Asked Tolerance, his voice rising. I could tell I'd pissed him off. He was threatening me, and I told him he looked pathetic to me. Captain Saren came close to my chair again. She was wearing a deep frown. I muted Tolerance as he went into a huffy speech about how cool and powerful his cloud race really was. Why are you baiting them, Kyle? To find out what they have. I want him to brag. She nodded, but kept frowning. I could tell she didn't appreciate my diplomatic techniques. Insulting them is hardly the way to win a new ally. I shrugged and unmuted the line. It is the bitter destructiveness and lack of comprehension that astounds us the most. Tolerance said in my ear, I don't recall any species we've encountered who were so utterly naive and ignorant of their place in the universe. How many species have you encountered, exactly? Tolerance hesitated. Many more than you have. What's happened to them? Where are they now? Most of them have fallen to the machines. I leaned forward, sensing I was about to reach some new tidbit of data, some kind of explanation as to the number of star systems that the ancient rings interconnected. Are we talking about twenty star systems? An order of magnitude higher. My heart pounded. Two hundred systems? Could it be true? We've seen nowhere near that number of systems in this chain of rings, I said. How can that number be right? Are you saying the macros have two hundred stars under their control beyond the six we know? Possibly. It is unknown. I narrowed my eyes. Was he pulling back? Becoming reluctant to share information again? My mind raced. I was trying to think of something to say that would get this blue to spill some further hard data. At the same time, I was worried he'd clam up again if he knew what I was really interested in. I decided to steer the discussion closer to our original topic. Well, I said, I have to admit I'm impressed. I did not know there were so many stars in this chain of rings. You've shown a great depth of knowledge concerning this topic. Naturally, indisputably, undoubtedly. 
Realizing how pleased he was with my snippet of praise, I decided to take it away again. But, I said, you did use a term that undoes all the rest. I'm afraid I must withhold my opinion of your claims for the time being. What word? A small word, but a critical one. Explain, frustrating creature. The word was unknown, I said. It's a powerful word because it unravels all the rest. If you control the machines, how can you not know the extent of their spread? We do not control the machines. We created them, yes. But does any parent fully control its adult offspring? Usually not, I admitted. But you're at least in communication with them. Why not ask them to clear up this unknown value? Surely they must know the extent of their own conquests. You do not understand, Tolerance said and it is not my task to enlighten you further. This interview has been taxing, and now draws to a close. All right, I said. I'm tired of you, too. What I want to know is this. Will you continue to use the rings to communicate with the macros? We will cease the transmissions for the time being. Will your species continue to damage us? No, I said. We will not. Then your annihilation will be postponed. I frowned and asked him what he'd meant by that, but the channel had been closed. I tried several more times to strike up the conversation again, but they were ignoring me. I put aside my comlink. They got what they wanted out of us, I guess, I said to Jasmine as she came near. They wanted us to stop bombing, and I promised we would as long as they stopped transmitting to the macros. What do you think they meant by destroying all of us? Do you think they have some kind of special weapon? They've been building something down there in the deep gas, that's obvious. Something so powerful it could wipe us out? I shrugged and leaned back in my chair. I yawned. Probably not. If they'd had a real doomsday weapon that could get rid of us cleanly, they'd have used it when I dropped the first bomb last time around. I'd say they have something real, but they don't want to pay the price of fighting with us directly. That's why they've been trying to talk the macros into doing it for them. She watched me as I stretched in my chair. How can you sit there so calmly after all that, Kyle? How can you walk around the bridge so tense day after day? Jasmine shook her head and went back to the main console. I strolled over and joined the staffers circling the holo tank and the primary display, which had the size and general configuration of a pool table. How long have you been on duty, Captain? I asked her. She avoided my eyes and shrugged. I pulled a double shift. Ensign Kestrel caught my eye. She made a gesture pointing upward behind Jasmine's back. I figured it out after a moment. She meant the captain had been on duty for longer than that. Most command staffers don't really want their execs to be on the bridge all day. It makes them nervous and makes them feel they should do the same. I decided it was time that we all took a little break. How about we get something to eat? I asked Jasmine. All right, she said. Together we walked off the bridge. I could feel every eye in the place on our backs. I regretted the move almost immediately. I knew what they'd all be saying. Sandra's still warm and he's already chasing tail again. But I wasn't. I honestly had been thinking of Captain Saren's well-being. Running a ship took more than dedication and iron resolve. You had to have good personal judgment concerning your state of readiness, too. In space, there is no night and no day. Technically, every hour was the same as the last and people had to pace themselves or they would burn out and make mistakes. We made our way to the ward room, and I sat Jasmine down at the single table inside. There was no one on duty at this hour, so I fired up the grill and microwaved some fresh coffee. Saren watched me quietly. Do you think this is a good idea, Kyle? She asked. Don't worry, I said. 
I know you don't like to eat anything heavy right before bed. Also, I'm pretty bad at cooking. How about a couple of frozen waffles? She laughed. You know I don't mean that. Jasmine, I said. I'm trying to get you to relax for a few minutes. You need to take a solid eight-hour shift in your bunk. She looked at me in mock alarm. I didn't mean it that way, I said. I know, I know, she said and sighed. How do you feel about Sandra right now? I love her, and I hope she's going to come back to life. But I doubt she will. I guess I'm in a state of delayed grieving. We stopped talking for several minutes. I cooked the waffles, then brought them over to the table and sat across from her. You certainly know how to lighten up a conversation, I said. Sorry. These are good. I ate half my waffle and was surprised to realize she was right. They were good. I think we've got real grain in here somewhere, I said. None of that reconstituted crap in this meal. When we'd eaten most of our waffles, Jasmine drew herself up and squared her shoulders. I'll do it, she said. I stopped chewing and stared at her in surprise. Do what? She gave a little bewildered shake of her head. I did the same, baffled. She leaned across the table and put her hand on mine. I'll come to your bunk tonight, she whispered. If it will make you feel better. I was more startled than ever. I swallowed and coughed. Suddenly the waffle was like cardboard in my mouth. I washed it down with coffee. I realized I was on the spot and I had a big decision to make. I'd wanted to spend the night with Jasmine for years. It wasn't a big secret that she and I had a thing for one another. But it seemed wrong to me. Very wrong. I... I'm not... ready for that, I said. Sorry if I misled you. I honestly came down here to feed you some waffles. Her hand leapt away from mine as if stung. I reached out and patted her hand, but... She pulled it away farther and crossed her arms under her small breasts. She was staring down at her half-eaten waffle. I thought maybe she was going to cry again. Hey, I said. I'm not telling you I don't like you. I'm telling you I'm not ready. You're a girl. You understand that, don't you? She heaved a sigh and uncrossed her arms. Okay, she said. Sorry. Fine, drop it. I knew that from her point of view, she'd made a fool of herself. She'd misinterpreted my actions, and I'm sure she was very upset that she now appeared to be the aggressor. I half expected her to get up and leave, but she didn't. Sensing she had something else to say, I finished my waffles quietly. They really were good, the best I'd had since leaving Earth. What do you think of Ensign Kestrel? she asked suddenly. I didn't even look up. I knew a trap when one was laid at my feet in plain sight. Barely competent, I said in a professional-sounding clipped tone. She's too young to be on a bridge, in my opinion. Jasmine glanced up at me in surprise. Really? Why, what do you think of her? I think she wears her smart clothes too tight, she said. She must stand in front of her mirror for ten minutes telling the nanites to cinch up. I snorted. Then I lost it and openly laughed. It was my first laugh since I'd seen Sandra drooling bubbles on the floor of the pool room. I couldn't help myself. Sadly, the laughter died as quickly as it had come. I think you're right about her clothes, I said. She's doing it for your benefit. You know that, don't you? Come on, I'm an old man to her. A very powerful old man. She's the kind that's attracted to that, I can tell. I thought of a dozen rude things to say, such as it takes one to know one, but I managed to say none of them. Usually my mouth acts like a self-destruct system when around women, but today I held on. She's part of your bridge staff, I said. Transfer her if you want to. Jasmine sat quietly. I could tell she was thinking seriously about doing it. 
I sipped my coffee as if I couldn't care less. No, she said at last. That would be unprofessional of me. I'm sorry. I don't know what's gotten into me lately. I shouldn't be jealous of her. Why should I be jealous? You were never interested in me in the first place. I certainly was, I said. But now is definitely not the time. She stood up. Good night, sir, she said. Thanks for the waffles. I nodded and watched her go. I wondered to myself as I watched her posterior shift under that sheer layer of smart cloth if the whole nanite thing had changed our sexual behavior patterns. I'd have to say that Star Force Marines, both male and female, were a randy bunch. We had bodies that brimmed with energy and recovered quickly. We looked younger and fitter than normal people, and we were often placed in stressful, isolated situations. All of this promoted an active sex life. Affairs between troops were common, and we generally didn't frown upon them. We were all disease-free, after all, as the nanites cleaned out our bodies routinely from stem to stern. There was some concern about the females becoming pregnant. The topic had rarely come up in staff meetings, but when it had, the general consensus was that if pregnancies happened, they were good things. No human colonists had ever planted themselves on a new world before, and we'd just done so on three lovely planets. It was in our best interests to go forth and multiply vigorously. There were bound to be other social implications dictated by our situation. I guess it was all part of our new way of life. It was totally unplanned. We were feeling our way, figuring out how our culture would behave one step at a time. A harmless, healthy relief of stress. That's what my old college teaching colleagues would have said. And they were the ones who ought to know. Chapter 34 I went down to visit Sandra in medical before turning in for the night. There was no significant change in her status reported by either Dr. Swanson or Marvin. Marvin had, however, made progress after a fashion. He'd built something big, strange, and vile. I recognized it the minute I saw it. A bulbous tank from which thick vapors arose. The numerous PVC pipe connections leaked, creating a steady patter of droplets hitting the floor. The entire medical chamber was dank now with condensation dribbling from the roof and trickling down the walls. Something was going on inside that bubbling tank, and I thought I knew what it was. Microbes, Marvin? I asked, inspecting his work. He'd been watching me since I came into the chamber, but he hadn't said a word. Hello, Colonel Riggs, he said. I'm glad you stopped by. As you can see, I'm completing my first developmental step. The colony is alive and well. I'm teaching them to work with neurological synapses now. Dead ones. Where the hell did you even get a colony to start with? Microbes are everywhere in our environment. Human bodies typically encompass more than a trillion single-celled organisms. Of course, I said. We have them inside us. All you had to do was steal a sample from Sandra and build the environment. Marvin didn't confirm or deny he didn't have to. I approached the tank, which was made of layered smart cloth and pipe fittings. It pulsed and gurgled. I wrinkled my nose in disgust. I performed a brief inspection, and I noticed two things that were especially upsetting. First, there were what appeared to be brains floating in the tank. I wasn't sure if they were human or bovine or what. Second, there were electrodes hooked up to the tank. I knew what that meant. When we'd first run into the microbe race on a macro cruiser, the machines had been shocking them to force them to cooperate. I seem to recall having forbidden this kind of work, I said sternly. I ran a hand down a nanite wire that led to an electrode. Nanite wires tended to be like shaped mercury, almost liquid in nature. They were rarely shielded. I could feel the current in it like a buzzing sensation on my fingertips. Marvin lifted a black tentacle. 
He snaked it under the tank and touched a large valve at the bottom. He studied me with his countless cameras. This is the release valve, he said matter-of-factly. If I open it, the contents of the tank will spill into the drain you see below the tank. Drain? Where did that come from? I had the nanites form it. The pipe leads down through the main hold and out into space. I pursed my lips. What are you saying, Marvin? You're willing to abort this abomination right now? No arguments? If you say so, Colonel. We stared at each other for several seconds. I looked away first. I walked to Sandra's coffin and gazed into it. She was as lovely in her deathly state as she'd ever been in life. Tan skin, dark, luxurious hair, and body sculpted with the muscles of an Olympian. She'd had a mole on her cheek when we'd first met, but somewhere along the line the nanites or the microbes had decided to delete it from her face. I sighed and my shoulders fell. I realized I still had hope. While there was hope, I couldn't let her go. You've got me and you know it, I told my scheming robot. But I want you to stop shocking them. Find some other more humane way to get them to cooperate. Marvin's tentacles slipped away from the tank's release valve, he considered. All right, he said. I'm sure something can be worked out. May I proceed with my work? For now, I said. Report when you have something tangible to show me. Carry on. I turned around and left. Dr. Swanson's eyes followed me, but she didn't say a word. I couldn't imagine what she thought of the situation. I felt emotionally drained, but I kept my face impassive in the passageway. I hid my state of mind until I reached my cabin. There I sat on my bunk. It was the very same bed I'd shared many times with Sandra. I put my face in my hands. I had no idea if I was doing the right thing or not. How many microbes should die so that one human might live? Were a quadrillion of their lives worth one of ours? How much did it matter that the microbes were intelligent, or that we humans were bigger and had vastly longer lives? I felt overwhelmed by the weight of such ethical decisions. I figured that no one was really qualified to make the call. I searched my instincts for right and wrong. You had to go with your gut on stuff like this. My gut was churning. But I let Marvin keep doing his dark work anyway. I spent the next two hours in my bunk tossing and turning. Sleep didn't come. The bed felt cold and empty without Sandra. Painful thoughts of her mixed in with Jasmine, Dr. Swanson, and even Ensign Kestrel haunted me. Worst of all was Marvin and his vat of gurgling biomass, an image which seemed to pop into my mind whenever I was finally falling to sleep. Colonel? asked Jasmine's soft, disembodied voice. I had been dozing, but upon hearing her voice I startled awake and sat up in bed. Twenty-four-hour instant communication systems weren't always a good thing. As the commander of Star Force, I'd been forced to give up a lot of my private time. I cleared my throat and tapped the wall twice, unmuting the channel. Yes, what is it? I asked, trying to sound alert. I'm sorry, sir, but an emergency call has come in from Commodore Miklos at Welter Station. Patch him through. Miklos' voice came to my ears moments later. He sounded frazzled. Sir, Colonel Riggs. Yes, go ahead, Commodore. This had better be good. It isn't good, sir. It's bad. We've got a new macro fleet coming through at the far ring of the Thor system. How many ships? How do they fare against our mines? We've counted about fifty cruisers so far. But about the mines, no hits, sir. I paused, blinked, and frowned. I rubbed my face. Did I hear that correctly, Commodore? No hits at all? Nothing, Colonel. They have some kind of new approach. A ship led the way into the system, moving slowly and eating up our mines. They appear to have a mine sweeper. How does it work? We have theories, but no data. It's complex. I'll explain when you arrive at Welter Station. I can assume you're coming, yes? 
I realized at that moment that the ship was accelerating under me. It wasn't the full press roar that one felt on a destroyer or a cruiser, but we were definitely underway. The big carrier Gotter was somewhat underpowered, but there was at least an extra G weighing me down, despite the inertial dampeners. Looks like Captain Saren has made that decision for me, I said. We're underway and leaving the Blues' homeworld behind. We'll be out there in about twenty hours. Make that thirty hours, Miklo said. As you must recall, you removed several engines from the design, sir. I could tell by his voice he was still hurting about that. I rolled my eyes. Right, I said. We're taking the scenic route. Keep an eye on the macros and give me a count every hour. I could advance into the system, Colonel. The crustacean homeworlds are undefended. I considered pointing out that the crustaceans were technically allied with the machines, not us, but I didn't bother. In some ways, Miklos was right. We had a responsibility to the crustaceans. They'd helped me militarily when I called upon them to do so. They might well have permanently broken their alliance with the macros by firing on them. Sometimes it was hard to know for sure how the machines had judged an event. I'm sure the crustaceans were trying to deal with them, but that didn't always go as planned. A good idea, I said. But I don't think they're after the crustaceans. They're probably coming here, as the blues have been calling for them. If I had to bet, I'd say they were planning to take another shot at your battle station. Let's hope the third time is not the charm in this instance, sir. It won't be. We'll gather our entire fleet into a single fist this time. I don't want to split up my ships in the face of the enemy again. Wait for me. An hour after I reach Welter's station, we'll set sail for Thor 6 if we think we can take their fleet without the station backing us up. Very good, sir. We signed off, and I lay back down. Strangely, I found it easier to go to sleep this time around. Instead of worrying about Sandra or any other females, I had a war to fight. Battles were things I felt comfortable with. They were problems that could be solved. Chapter 35 I managed to get a good long night's sleep, knowing I had thirty hours before the carrier task force reached Welter Station helped me to rest. If bad news came in now, I wouldn't be able to do much about it. Every veteran knows that in wartime they should sleep whenever they can. I wished I could store up sleep now for the long slog I knew was ahead of me. Unfortunately, I hadn't figured out a way to do that yet. About ten hours out from Welter Station, we began decelerating at a stately, deliberate pace, the only pace Gotter was capable of. I was awake by this time and well-fed. I'd even begun a workout in the ship's cavernous gym. It was really an extra hold we were using right now, but with some well-designed ergonomic equipment, I was able to feel some strain on my muscles. A few of the cadet flyboys were watching me with interest. Under two Gs of centrifugal gravity, I could curl about two tons of weight and bench press more than three. I guess this impressed them. When I got up from the bench and mopped my brow with a towel, two of them applauded. One of these two ventured forward to talk to me. I bet you don't remember me, do you, sir? She asked. It was a common enough greeting from Star Force personnel. Usually they were right. But in her case, I did remember her. Not her face, but her name. Fleet Commander Becker. I'm surprised you're here. She smiled, pleased that I remembered who she was. The first thing I noticed about her was her reddish-blonde hair, which was cut short into what I would call a modified page-boy look. Her body was lanky. She seemed to be all arms and legs, but with the sharply defined muscle tone that tended to identify everyone in Riggs Pigs. Judging by her attractive but lined face and piercing eyes, I guessed her to be in her mid-thirties. Aren't you supposed to be out scouting around in the Helio system? I asked. As I recall, you took part in the effort to run down General Kerr in his battleship. Freshly transferred, sir, she said. By who? Captain Saren and Commodore Miklos. I tested out weeks ago on the new fighters, and I received a top rating. They ordered me to switch from the scouts into the fighter wings. 
I thought we'd replaced all our lost fighters from the Thor action. Commodore Becker shifted uncomfortably. The lines in her face became deeper. She put her long thumbs into the pockets of her flight suit. I could tell she didn't quite know what to say. We built new birds, sir, she said at last after an awkward pause. But not new pilots. Oh, of course, I said. I wanted to kick myself. Of all people, I should know that we could stamp out a new flying machine every hour, but pilots took twenty years or more to grow up and train. They were not so easily replaced. Well, I continued, I hope you're commanding a wing of them. Just a squadron, Colonel. I lifted a finger and pointed it at her, squinting. I remembered where I'd worked with her in the past. You were at the first battle at Welter Station, weren't you? I asked. Back before we even called it Welter Station. Yeah, that's right. I was scouting both sides of the Thor ring back then. You did a damned good job in the face of an advancing horde of enemy ships. I'm honestly surprised you survived that mess. Everyone who got out of that alive was surprised. My scout partner wasn't so lucky, however. He was taken out by the macros before they invaded the station. I nodded, vaguely recalling the reports. I'm glad to see you in this new position. A fighter jock's got to be a survivor. Yes, sir, she said and turned to go. I frowned, then said, Hey, would you mind showing me around your fighter? I haven't had a chance to check out the new model. She brightened immediately, and I could tell she'd forgotten about my slip-up concerning why new pilots were needed. I was still kicking myself about that one. I followed Becker to the hangar. I knew that if there was one thing all fighter jocks liked to do, it was show off their bird. I looked over the sleek craft with interest. The fighters had never been very big, and this new model wasn't any exception. If anything, they'd managed to make it more compact— it was built like a plane, but with very short, stubby wings. The wings could extend or retract to provide more lift if needed when gliding down into an atmosphere. The tiny ship reminded me of the old extinct NASA shuttlecraft, but on a smaller scale. The wings weren't the only part of the ship that could be reconfigured. The canopy was designed to coat itself with metal and turn opaque, or it could be left transparent like traditional aircraft. I knelt beside the ship and put my hand on the wing. The nanites inside shivered slightly at my touch. Looking at the undercarriage, I saw the ship didn't have wheels but used skids instead. With grav lifters for basic propulsion, I guessed the fighter would tend to land perfectly if you could get your airspeed down far enough. I ran my hand over the wings, and the nanites again buckled at my touch. Jumpy, aren't they? I asked. Yeah, she said. This is a brand new bird. They tell me the constructives will settle down and stop squirming soon. They still think they're in programming mode or something. I chuckled and stuck my head into the cockpit. There was only a single seat inside, but it was roomy enough. In space, a pilot had to carry more gear than aircraft usually did. You never knew where you might end up when you were flying around an uncharted star system. Big back seat, I said. What do you usually put back here? A bladder full of nanites or small explosives, maybe? Sometimes it's just for ferrying food or even a passenger. I nodded and realized I was looking at another of Miklos's elaborate designs. He had a different set of tendencies than I did. He liked to build craft that were capable of multiple mission types. I tended to build craft that were specifically shaped for a single purpose. His ships definitely provided more utility, while mine were slightly more deadly. I guess that can come in handy, I said. Do you want to take a ride? I looked at her, startled. I realized she must have thought I was hinting around, hoping she'd offer. In truth, I'd been thinking about Miklos and his overly robust designs— I didn't feel like telling Commodore Becker that, so I smiled instead. Uh, yeah, I guess so. We can circle the carrier a few times. She reached out, slapped the canopy, and it yawned open. She climbed in and ordered the ship to build a second seat. 
Less than a minute later, we were requesting permission from Control to launch. Captain Saren gave us the okay personally. I winced when I heard her voice. She knew I was taking a joyride. What was she thinking now? That I was out playing around or maybe even hitting on Commander Becker? Once we fired out of the launching tubes, however, such idle worries melted away. The fighter was much too exhilarating to allow me to think about anything else. I whooped when we hit Mach 1, and we hadn't even come out of the tube yet. Friction and heat roiled around the craft, making it vibrate. The roar was deafening. The launch tube was really a railgun system. If I'd ever wondered what it would be like to be fired out of a cannon, I was in suspense no longer. The launching bay was designed to get the fighters up to as great a speed as possible before releasing them into space. Accordingly, the tubes ran the length of the mothership from stern to bow. We fired out of Goddard's nose, as if we'd been spat into space. You can take the helm, sir, Becker's voice shouted in my helmet. Careful, though, the controls are... There was a sickening lurch, and I was thrown against the left wall of the craft. We flipped over and went into a two-axis tumble. Becker was barely able to speak, and I wasn't doing much better. Sorry, I grunted through gritted teeth. Outside the canopy, the big carrier, the sun, and about a million stars flashed in a repeating loop. The speed by which they did so was sickening. I swear I barely touched the controls. Let go, she hissed out. I did as she asked, taking my hands off the stick. The craft automatically righted itself after a few seconds. I laughed. That was great, I said. Becker craned her head around but couldn't quite look at me. Are you serious? she asked. Yeah, sure, I said. There's nothing to run into out here. No, sir, but a spin like that would cause many pilots to lose consciousness. You're not even a little sick? Nah, I said. I decided not to tell her I was cheating. Marvin had engineered plenty of fixes into the body of good old Kyle Riggs. My many physical edits had originally been planted there to allow me to survive extreme environments. But they also did well in keeping my brain functioning during a teeth-rattling brush with centrifugal force. Becker shook her head. You should be a pilot, sir. You'd be a natural once you got the hang of it. In fact, you're flying it again now, aren't you? Very smooth, almost feels like autopilot. I nudged the controls very gently. I thought about doing some hard banking rolls, but I thought I should wait a few minutes and give the girl's stomach a chance to settle down. Instead of violent turns, I did a long, even bank and pulled around to face Goddard again. Then I figured I'd gently cruised around long enough. I put the hammer down. The ship responded like the very best of sports cars, only infinitely better. Even I felt compressed into my nanite-formed seat as the G's built up. Got her is dead ahead, sir, Becker reminded me. I've got it now, Commander. I want to see what an attack run feels like. She stayed quiet, but I knew I had her worried. I didn't mind. I worried a lot of people. We buzzed Got her at about 30,000 miles an hour. At that speed, you really couldn't see the target against the black of space. You had to rely on your instruments. I twitched the stick up and then down again a tiny fraction of a second later. That was the only thing that kept us from smashing into the big ship and splattering ourselves like a big bug on Gotter's windshield. I could hear Becker's breathing over the intercom. It was labored, but to her credit, she hadn't taken the helm from me in a panic. I knew she could as the ship's pilot, but she'd held on and trusted me with her ship and both our lives. A few minutes later, we parked the fighter on the flight deck, and a half-dozen crewmen rushed out to service her. Apparently, an alarm had gone out. Jasmine, I muttered. What's that, Colonel? Becker asked. Nothing, Commander. Thanks for the wild ride. I think I should be thanking you. I laughed and clapped her lightly on the back. Unfortunately, it was difficult for me to measure such contacts. Nanites and all, she was staggered. I was used to Sandra, who could take more punishment than anyone I knew, with the exception of myself and possibly First Sergeant Quan. Damn, I said. Sorry. Didn't hurt, sir. She lied, rubbing at her shoulder. 
In a great mood, I headed down the winding passages toward medical. I could feel the stares of everyone on the flight deck behind me, but wasn't bothered. When you're in high-level command, you have to get used to things like that. The troops naturally stare. I'd long since stopped worrying about it. I headed back to my quarters and took a shower as I'd just worked out and then followed up with a thrilling ride in the fighter. Not even nanites could take the stink off a man. We still needed soap and water. After my shower, I felt good. I headed for medical to check on Marvin, Dr. Swanson, and whatever it was they were doing to Sandra. I didn't make it all the way to medical. A series of unexpected events began when a klaxon sounded, signaling all hands to report to battle stations. I did an about-face, and I headed for the bridge. Marvin and Sandra would have to wait. I could tell Gotter was already changing course and speed. First, I felt the engines cut out entirely. This threw me and everyone else onto the floor of the passage. We'd been leaning without thinking about it, and now that the G-forces were gone, we were disoriented. I sprang up again and brushed myself off, muttering curses. Then the ship began a slow spin, and I knew Saren was bringing the engines around to the rear. We had been decelerating, preparing to dock with Welter Station. When decelerating... Our ships had the main engines pointing forward in order to apply thrust in the direction of travel. This new move confused me. Could we be there already? I didn't think that much time had passed. After another ten paces down the central passage, a new application of force assaulted me. This was a lateral motion that made me walk at a slant. All around me, crewmen were walking on the starboard corner of the ship's passages— Everyone had been caught by surprise by the all-hands klaxon, and they were scrambling in their haste to reach their stations. To get past one another, we had to run up the walls. We looked as if we were playing some kind of bizarre game of leapfrog. I reached the command center, wearing a deep frown. The ship had to be making a hard, prolonged turn to cause such a shift in our center of gravity. We had stabilizing systems to prevent that sort of thing, but they were clearly overwhelmed. I knew that if Miklos could see me now, he'd laugh and remind me yet again that stripping components out of his designs had consequences. What the hell is going on? I demanded as I reached the bridge and found myself crawling on my hands and knees to my command chair. All around the bridge, staffers wore harnesses. They were rooted to the deck by the ship's safety tentacles, which the nanites grew up from the floor on these occasions. None of them looked happy. Some were white-faced and ready to barf. I've plotted a new course, Jasmine told me unhelpfully. I can see that, I snapped, sitting at an uncomfortable angle in my chair. Are we in some kind of spin? What's the deal with the centrifugal G's? This is a high-speed course correction, not a spin, she informed me. Her hands were clamped onto the navigational table— her legs were wound up with supportive black tentacles, and she looked as if she was standing in a nest of rigid snakes. Commodore Miklos informed me before I took command that this may happen under heavy maneuvering thrust, she began. I sensed a lecture, so I cut her off. Yes, yes, I said. I know all about the stabilizers. We remove them for good reasons. Maybe when we get to the station we can throw in a new generator and wire additional stabilizers into the lower hold. Negative, sir, she said, still not looking at me. Her eyes were glued to her navigational screens. We're not going to dock at Welter Station. Where are we going, then? I asked. Give me a sit rap. One moment, sir, Jasmine said. Anyone else who tried to shush me when I was in the kind of mood I was currently in would have gotten an earful of invective. But I knew Captain Saren very well, and I trusted her judgment more than most of my commanders. I waited quietly for her to brief me. While I waited, I became increasingly concerned. Something big was going on, and I was only in on half of it. I worked a tablet, paging through reports and incoming streams of data. Apparently the macros were on the move, and they were not behaving in an expected pattern. "'Can you talk to me yet, Captain?' I asked when she'd stopped spouting orders to her task force. "'I think so.' We're coming about now. We've made the course correction. I could feel the G-forces fade. It was a relief even to me. I got up and approached her table. Excited nanite snakes reared up to clamp onto me. 
I cursed and slapped them away. I taught them to accept such admonishment and to back off unless it was an emergency. Sorry, said Jasmine. We can turn those off now. Ensign, lower the alert level to double yellow. I glanced over the table. There was Ensign Kestrel looking disheveled and worried. She worked her part of the shared command console and the nanite tentacles and smart harnesses retreated reluctantly. Jasmine turned to me. Her eyes met mine, and they were deadly serious. The macros have gathered their fleet and gone to flank speed. We can't beat them. Beat them? Beat them where? They're headed for Thor Six, the crustacean homeworlds. I frowned, looking at the big picture of the Thor system. I examined the screen carefully. A large cluster of red contacts were indeed heading from the far side of the Thor system— toward the crustacean gas giant and its three life-giving moons. So they're not coming to smash their heads into our battle station again, I said. No, sir. What's Miklos doing? I asked, paging back to the Eden system. I almost coughed when I saw the entire fleet had launched from the station and was advancing on the ring to the Thor system. He's heading out there. I almost demanded to know why she thought she should make this kind of command decision without orders from me, but I held back, deciding I would have done the same thing. After all, they hadn't engaged in hostilities yet. They were simply gathering their forces together in the Thor system as quickly as possible. I could see by the dashed lines that predicted the path of every ship in both systems— that Saren's task force was going to blow right past Welter Station and shoot through the ring. Miklos's force was under hard acceleration and would beat us into the Thor system. But since they were moving slower than we were now, we would catch up to them and both fleets would merge about half the way to the Crustacean homeworlds. You two made the right play, I said. Jasmine's face is usually difficult to read, but I knew she felt relief when I spoke these words. She had been worried about giving a number of high-level orders without consulting me. There wasn't time for a meeting and a strategic decision, she said carefully. What are your orders now? From your actions, I gather that you and Miklos believe the macros intend to attack the crustacean homeworld. What else could their intentions be, sir? I nodded. I agree. They've decided to go for the crustaceans rather than us. I guess I should have considered this possibility. The lobsters are weak and the machines already made an attempt to drain their oceans. Just because we stopped them, they haven't given up on their original prey. They've moved on to Plan B, direct assault. There is one more critical detail that hastened our decision to act. Miklos found it first and insisted on flying out there as quickly as possible. Give it to me. She brought up the Thor system again and zoomed in on the enemy ships. Notice the enemy fleet composition, sir. I did as she suggested, and the anomaly was immediately apparent to me. I took a deep breath and let it out again in a sigh. I felt a new weight on my shoulders. They aren't escorting any invasion ships, I said. Exactly, Colonel, she said. The macros do not intend to invade the water moons. I met her stare with one of my own. That can only mean they intend to bomb them, don't they? To attack the crustaceans from space where they can't be reached. That was our assessment. When we realized what they were going to do, Miklos and I decided that we had to move all our ships toward them. Possibly they will be distracted by our threatened attack and will attempt to deal with us first. I nodded. A good move, probably the best you could make. But the macros aren't easily swayed from a path once they've decided on a course of action. I know that, sir. But we have to try, don't we? I didn't meet her eyes. I had a hard decision to make. The macro fleet was equal to our own. We might well beat them, but that wasn't a certainty. I don't know yet, I said. We have to weigh our options. Her eyes followed me closely. She was looking at me, but I didn't return her gaze. Instead, I stared at the command map depicting the Thor system. She took two steps around the table toward me and kept staring at me. 
I fiddled with the controls, recounting the macro cruisers. I reached the same frightening number every time. Jasmine was close to me now. She spoke in a quiet voice. The crustaceans attacked the macros because we insisted they do so. We owe them, sir. Are we going to try to save them? I didn't answer her question. Instead, I asked one of my own. What's our ETA? Twenty-one hours, she said. If we arrive as a single force. That's the only way I'd consider it. I know. Now I had to ask the question. What's the enemy ETA? Seventeen hours at current rates of acceleration. I massaged my jaw. It's the carriers, isn't it? They're slow. Yes, sir. I finally met her pretty eyes. They were big, brown, and troubled. We're going in, I said. We have to. They'll get four long hours to work over the lobsters before we get there, but it's the best we can do. I'll inform the Commodore, sir. Very good. And tell him that if we have any carriers left after this, they're getting more engines, more generators, and more damned stabilizers. Jasmine gave me a weary smile. That will make him happy, sir. Chapter 36 Charging across space toward an enemy fleet was an exhausting experience. In some ways, it made me envy the commanders of armies past. In a land battle throughout most of human history, you had little to no knowledge of the exact enemy position. You went on marching, and it took a long time. Long enough for you to almost forget that you were walking to what might possibly be your death at the hands of the enemy. Sailing across the open sea wasn't all that bad either. A ship's captain in the times of the Romans, through the colonial era, didn't know where the enemy was or when he might run into them. He could relax and sip wine in his cabin until the lookout spotted something. It was the capacity for long journeys without too much stress that I missed. In my era, war was often fought in space with perfect clarity of vision for millions of miles. I could see the enemy with my optics. I was forced, in fact, to watch him grow and grow in perspective as he drew ever closer. I felt the thrill of a baron leading a charge of knights across an open field toward the shimmering line of the enemy. But this was a charge that would go on for hours and days rather than minutes. It was stressful for everyone aboard. People naturally tensed up when battle was near, especially when they could see the enemy coming right at them. All around me, crewmen were rubbing their necks, wiping away sweat, and taking deep breaths. They were all under a great deal of pressure. Deciding I'd had enough of it after we'd crossed half the system, I retired to my quarters. Or at least I'd intended to. When I reached the door of my cabin, I found Dr. Kate Swanson waiting there for me. For a few seconds, I misinterpreted the look on her face. She looked vulnerable, almost shy. I immediately jumped to the conclusion that she wanted to talk to me about personal issues. That part was right, but I was mistaken about the nature of these issues. Colonel, she said. Yes, doctor. She looked down and licked her lips. I took a moment to admire her. She was about my age, and I found that appealing. She was a mature, seasoned woman who'd grown up in the era I had— she was also a medical doctor on a ship that had seen plenty of battles. We had a lot in common. Dr. Swanson straightened herself and looked completely in charge again. Sir, I think you need to check up on Marvin. We stared at each other for a few seconds. I realized then that Kate Swanson hadn't come to my cabin at night for reassurances about the coming battle. If she had, the meeting might well have turned into a glass of wine and a shared evening. Instead, she'd come because something had gone terribly wrong, in medical. What's he doing to her? I asked. She shrugged helplessly. I really don't have any idea. But it's not going the way anyone had planned, I'm certain of that. I nodded. It never does with Marvin, I said. It never does. Thank you, Kate. I walked with her toward medical. I didn't ask any more questions. I didn't want to, and I didn't have to. 
I knew I would see for myself how bad things were very soon. When I tapped on the door to medical, it didn't respond right away. The door wouldn't open. Frowning in immediate suspicion, I'm afraid I lost my temper. I punched through the relatively thin sheen of nanites that formed the door. Really, it wasn't hard to do. The metal was less dense than steel, and only about a quarter of an inch thick. A bullet would have gone right through it. In this case, my fist went right through it so far that I fell against the door and was left with my cheek pressing against the cool, trembling metal. The nanites, which had been put into lockdown mode somehow, were forced to recognize me and react to my presence. They remembered their programming, which was somewhat similar to that of an earthly elevator. When a human arm was detected protruding through the door from one chamber to another, they were compelled to relax and melt away. It was part of the safety protocol that kept them from accidentally slicing our bodies in half. When I stumbled into the dimly lit chamber, I saw Marvin immediately. He was in a new configuration I didn't recognize. Then, staring, I slowly came to understand what I was seeing. His central body structure was often cylindrical, but this time it was oblong and all in one piece, rather than segmented like a metal centipede. From this central box-like unit, all his tentacles and cameras extended in a halo of instrumentation. Oh, so nice of you to drop by, Colonel Riggs, he said. I stepped forward three paces, squinting in the gloom. Behind me, Dr. Swanson lingered in the passageway. She showed no inclination to enter, and I didn't blame her. I'd seen horrors perpetrated by Marvin when he got really wrapped up in a biological project. They were never pretty to human eyes. Where's... I began, but the word Sandra never left my lips. Because I saw her then, or at least I saw part of her. Her feet... They were visible through a small window that allowed one to look inside Marvin's body. I finally came to fully understand what I was looking at. Marvin had subsumed the medical enclosure that was Sandra's life support system. He had become one with the medical instrument and was literally all over Sandra. Oddly, this disturbing image eased my emotional state. Sure, it was frightening to look at, for someone not used to Marvin and his self-designing behaviors, it might appear to be something out of a horror movie. But I knew Marvin, and I knew how he operated. He liked to reconfigure himself inventively. Marvin, that's Sandra inside your belly, isn't it? An interesting metaphor, he said. But as I'm not digesting her tissues, it's not really apt. I would rather say that I've reconfigured myself into a convenient formation to better address my patient. Right, I said. Now give me a progress report. Marvin hesitated. That was always a bad sign. The subject is still alive, technically, he said. My mouth opened, then closed again, twice. I took a few steps toward him. This earned me the attention of several more cameras. His tentacles, which often whipped about in a frenzied fashion when excited, slowed. Only a few of them still rustled quietly. These few retracted toward his body like cords being dragged slowly across the floor. The subject, I repeated back to him, is technically still alive? Exactly. Marvin, that doesn't sound encouraging. Have you managed to repair her mind? Is your new science of, what did you call it? Necrological reconstruction. Right. Has any of that worked out? No. He stopped there, and so did I. For a long moment, neither of us spoke. I heard something behind me and turned my head. Over my shoulder, I heard Dr. Kate Swanson's retreating footsteps. She had left me here with Marvin and the thing in his gut which had once been my mate. What? I asked him hazily. Just for a moment, I thought I must not have heard him correctly. The science is a failure in this instance. You see, she's not a valid subject. What are you talking about? Can't you revive her? Technically, there is nothing to revive. What are you talking about? I demanded again, louder this time. Her organs are generally functional, but her brain has been erased. 
Sandra is brain dead. Worse than that, actually. I felt like I was falling, but I locked my knees and stood ramrod straight. I also kept my voice even, despite every instinct within me which wanted to scream and rave. I had to focus to speak calmly again. How can a person be worse than brain dead? I demanded. I wanted to scream at him. I began coming up with denials and rationalizations. I knew I was doing it, but I couldn't help myself. She has some kind of amnesia, I said. I understand that. People can usually work with that. They can recover. We have medical powers no one in the history of humanity has ever had. Just get her breathing and pumping her own heart again. Those were my initial goals. Unfortunately, I failed. Neither the microbials nor the nanites are capable of creating new neural pathways, especially without knowing exactly which nerve endings needed to be stimulated or by how much to cause the autonomic process to continue. I'm not getting it, Marvin, I said. People have lost their memories before. I understand she'd be a blank slate, but... The level of brain damage goes far beyond simple amnesia. She has lost all her motor skills. Her brain doesn't even know how to control her muscles. A toxin has eaten away her neural connections. The synaptic interconnection points between neurons are gone. Her memories, her instincts, even her motor functions in the reptilian region are gone. She can't breathe or make her heart beat without artificial aid, because her brain has forgotten how to do these things. As an analogy, if she were a computer system, she would have a blank hard drive, blank memory, and even blank ROM. What can we do to help her? Marvin shifted his bulky body. He seemed to lean closer to me, to loom over me and all around me. His cameras panned and zoomed. I've identified possibilities, he said. They all require that we start fresh. We could, in essence, use her cellular programming to create a new model. Cellular programming? Are you talking about her DNA? Exactly. Her DNA hasn't been damaged. It contains everything we need to build new components. There would be several advantages to this approach. Advantages? I asked, stunned. I've identified two distinct methods, Marvin continued. The first would be to utilize a new brain, which could be transplanted into the existing unit's cranium. I could tell he was becoming excited just by thinking about what he was saying. His tentacles were writhing with renewed vigor. A new brain? I heard myself ask. What, from a donor? Not advisable. Rejection would be almost certain. And the mentality of the individual would be very dissimilar to the original Sandra. Let us call her Sandra 1.0, even if we were able to manage the surgery. I stared at him. I was in a haze. I'd only felt like this once before in my life when my wife had died in a car accident. A calm, soft-spoken doctor had proceeded to lay out the grim facts to me then as well, and I'd felt like the earth had opened up and sucked my guts down into a black hole under my feet. How? How else would you get a new brain if not from a donor? That's where the project becomes interesting, Marvin said. Now that he was fairly certain I wasn't going to physically attack him, his tentacles had begun thrashing around with their normal vigor. Within every human cell is the DNA required to build any element of the body, with the proper differentiation during development. Really, it's an ingenious system. Okay, so you want to grow a new brain for her? Yes, that's option one. Still, I don't recommend it. Besides the obvious absurdity of the proposal, why not? There's a time factor. Even using chemical accelerants and hormone therapy, an adult human brain that could operate her body would take years to grow. When we were finished, her body would be in an aged state, making the final surgery more difficult. Okay, okay, I said. What's option two? Full replacement. I've gone over it many times, and really, it's the only option. I took a few seconds to take this in. You're talking about cloning, right? Yes. I looked at the feet in the tank. I couldn't even see her face. She's already dead, isn't she? She's been dead for a week, and I've been fooling myself. 
Essentially, Marvin said. But where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm fairly confident I can grow you a new Sandra. Let's call the new unit Sandra 2.0. I shook my head. But she would be a kid. The whole process would take years, wouldn't it? She'd have to be born, grow up, go to school. She wouldn't even be the same person. I disagree, Marvin said. As a machine intellect, it's possible I'm more comfortable with the concept of self-duplication. It would be Sandra, and much of her personality would be recognizable. I've delved into the topic, and according to the articles I've read on the Internet, over 70% of human personality traits are due to innate neural structures. She wouldn't have the same memories, of course, but she would look and behave in a very similar fashion. But I would have to raise her as a little girl, right? That's weird, Marvin. I would be old when she grew up. I couldn't have the same kind of relationship with her that I have now. Do you mean a sexual relationship? Well, yes. But you would have total control of her upbringing, Marvin said brightly. Why not prepare her appropriately? Youth is preferred when human leaders pick mates, as I understand it. Even if you were to select a new mate now, she'd probably be much younger than you. Statistically, political leaders... Just shut up, Marvin. It's not happening, do you hear me? Forget about it. Come up with some other bizarre science experiment to sate your curiosity. Stop tormenting me in my grief. You're going to have to leave Sandra alone. Marvin, I understood in that moment, was Frankenstein. He was a mad scientist fascinated by life and death. He wanted to create his own versions of both. But, Colonel Riggs, my intention was to eliminate your grief, he said. Is that not an honorable goal? Yeah, maybe it is, I said. But not this time. Wanting to do something and having the power to do it doesn't mean you should do it. That's not entirely logical. I don't care. Could you explain it to me? he asked. I looked at him. I could tell that he really, honestly, wanted me to try to explain ethics to him. I knew I couldn't, so I didn't bother to try. You're a robot, Marvin. There are some things about us you'll never fully understand. It took several minutes for Marvin to extricate himself from Sandra's medical unit. After he'd finally managed it, I opened the hatch, kissed her forehead, and said goodbye. Chapter 37 The next day I came to understand there was a curse upon my existence. The curse affected anything and anyone I came to love. These accursed individuals were doomed to die badly. All of them. I've presided over more official Star Force funerals than I care to count. This one began no differently than a hundred others like it. There was a somber crowd in perfectly creased smart uniforms. The medical unit, which had been designed to handily double as a coffin and disposal system, trundled down a preset path through the hold. We stood at attention as it passed us by. Quan was at my side, as were Marvin and Dr. Swanson, but not Jasmine. She'd asked to come, but I'd ordered her to stay on the bridge— after all, we were only hours out from inevitable contact with the enemy. I usually had uplifting words for my troops at these events, but I was an empty husk today. I fell back upon the classics, not knowing what else to do. I gave them our slightly edited version of the Book of Common Prayers. We commit her body to the stars, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless her and keep her. The Lord maketh his face to shine upon her and be gracious unto her and give her peace. Amen. Sandra's coffin still had a long way to go. The nanites that were programmed to very gently propel it toward the launching tube weren't speeding up on my account. Not wanting to make everyone stand around uncomfortably for several more minutes, I decided to force myself to speak further. Typically, I began saying the first words that came into my mind. Our Star Force members die their final deaths while fighting an alien machine. In this case, however, Sandra's death was not due to a clean wound 
delivered by an enemy on the field of honor. Instead, she was taken from us by the assassin's knife. A shot in the dark. Treachery. Up until this moment, everyone had been gazing at the coffin. They hadn't been really listening to me, but rather lost in their own thoughts. But I could tell that had changed. Heads swiveled to observe me. I kept my eyes on Sandra's face. I could see her through a small triangular window in the medical unit. I pulled the plug on her only minutes before this ceremony. The simple act of disconnecting her life support was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. But I felt I had to, as she has been taken from us, even if this vessel she's lived in so long still looks perfect to the eye. With help, perhaps I could keep it breathing and pumping blood forever. But I'm not going to do that. I turned toward Marvin, who looked dejected. His cameras drooped and his tentacles were still. And I'm not going to clone a new Sandra, or a new Sandra brain, either. Only a single camera met my gaze. I turned back to the audience, who were looking at me with wide eyes now. They hadn't heard about Marvin's strange plans, apparently. For disconnecting you, I said to the coffin. I apologize, beloved. She was passing me now, and the nearness of her form gave me an urge to save her, to push her from the tracks that bore her with relentless slowness toward the launch tubes. I stood firm, however, reminding myself she was well and truly dead. The third time was the charm, my love, I said to her. Perhaps your soul has been wanting to go all along. Maybe your time really came, back when Alamo dropped you into the cold, cold ocean. Or when we found you in a coma in space. I've brought you back to life several times, but no more. You must find your own way. Sir? Colonel Riggs, sir? My earpiece was buzzing. I recognized the voice. It was Captain Saren. I decided to try to ignore her. The coffin was only about a minute from the launch tubes. I paused and cleared my throat. You must find your own way back to the stars from which we all came. Stardust to life, then back again. It is the cycle of the universe. The... Colonel Riggs, I'm sorry, Jasmine hissed into my earpiece. There is no need to respond. I must report, however that the macros have fired a huge barrage of missiles. I reached my hand up to my earpiece, and my face changed to a frown of concern. Everyone stared at me. I knew they suspected I was losing it. I straightened up and tried to pull together my thoughts. The damned machines wouldn't even let me bury my girlfriend in peace. Sandra, I said, we're sending you back to the fires of this alien sun. The white star known as Thor will be your new home until such a time as your mass is transferred into space, and hopefully it will someday comprise a new living being. It is the immortality we know we all have, the immortality of the matter that forms our bodies. In the meantime, may God keep you. Someone began crying behind me. I thought it was Ensign Kestrel, but didn't look back to find out. I watched the coffin enter the launch tube. There was a click and a hiss. The tube was building pressure. My final comment to her was made in a harsh whisper as the external door melted open and the light on the unit went from green to red. I'm going to find the man who ordered this love, I whispered, and I'm going to kill him. I promise you that. I felt the darkness come over my heart and mind after the tube rumbled and released. With fantastic speed, the coffin shot sunward. I watched through the portal for a second or two, until she was lost from sight. I knew that Sandra herself could have probably tracked the projectile for a full minute, but my enhanced eyes had never been as good as hers. A hand touched my shoulder. It was a soft touch. I turned and faced Dr. Kate Swanson. I'm so sorry, Kyle, 
she said. Then she hugged me. The move caught me by surprise. I looked around and saw several of the females were crying. A few of the males looked misty-eyed as well. Maybe my eulogy, as lame as I thought it was, had gotten through to them. Quan was stepping from foot to foot, not knowing what to do with himself. He was no good to anyone in a situation that didn't require shouting and shooting. That was a tough break, sir, he said, talking over Dr. Swanson's shoulder. She was still clinging to me and squeezing me with grief. I didn't feel sadness, not exactly. I was pissed off, and in some kind of shock, but mostly pissed off. I patted Dr. Swanson with an overly cautious hand. I didn't want to damage the woman. She was being very supportive. Then she surprised me again. She stood on her tiptoes and put her mouth up to my ear, the right one, which had no earpiece sticking out of it. If you want to feel better, come to my cabin, she whispered. I pulled away slightly and gave her a look of surprise and confusion. She must have read this as rejection, which I guess it was. She looked flustered and took her arms off me. I'm sorry for your loss, Colonel, she said and moved away. A dozen others who'd been waiting around for the woman to let go of me now surged forward. Unlike Quan, they'd been waiting politely. Before they could tell me how sorry they all were, my earpiece crackled again. I'm so sorry, Kyle, Jasmine said. But the situation is urgent. I know the funeral is breaking up. Did you get my last transmission? Yes, I did, Jasmine, I said. Thanks for your condolences. How many missiles and where are they headed? We've been calculating with optics, sir. At first we assumed the barrage was targeting us, but the band of space that could be targeted is narrowing every minute. This fleet no longer intersects with the projected path of the missiles. I frowned. What does lie in their path? Thor 6, sir. The crustacean homeworlds. I froze with my hand pressed to my ear. I felt a chill. I'm on my way. I pushed through the crowd and headed for the passageway. I want everyone back to battle stations, now! The murmuring crowd stopped murmuring and rushed for the exits after less than a second of hesitation. The passageway was empty when I reached it, but behind me came a crowd of crewmen. When I reached the bridge, Jasmine surprised me with a hug. I returned her embrace with a tiny squeeze. It felt good to press her flesh against mine. Not just because I found her attractive— but because she was a real friend who'd shared a lot of pain with me over the years. When I released her, she coughed. Sorry, I said. It's all right. Take a look at the situation I'm projecting two hours out. I looked, and I didn't like what I saw. The missiles were going to crash into the crustacean home moons hours before we could get there. Have you warned them? I asked. Yes, I don't know what they can really do, however. Underwater strikes aren't like atmospheric bursts. The pressure wave will kill them. They don't have bomb shelters, and I don't think it would help if they did. Tell them to disperse, I said. It's their only defense. They don't want to crouch in the sea, massed up at any one spot. If they just swim away from one another, spreading out over the seabed at different depths and latitudes, more will survive. Maybe, she said. I looked at her sharply. What do you mean, maybe? She rubbed her face. I've done some math. There are too many bombs. The radiation will spread everywhere within days. The tides of the singular sea will carry radioactive seawater all the way to both poles. Maybe they can stop a few of the missiles. Transmit our methods of killing missiles with concussion in mid-course. We know they have their own missiles. Maybe they can stop the barrage. Already done, sir. Good. I'm sure the crustaceans will do what they can to save themselves. The question is, what else can we do? Have you come up with any options? Jasmine looked at me. Not much. But we do have six transports full of marines. A fair number of them are centaur marines. I looked at her sharply, and our eyes met. I shook my head. You want me to ask the centaurs to fly into the teeth of the enemy again? to sacrifice themselves and their tiny flying sleds? In an act of questionable ethics, I'd once sent the centaurs charging into enemy ships and exploding themselves. 
The tactic had badly damaged the Imperial fleet when it had finally broken through into the Eden system. We'd used the tactic on the macros, too, upon occasion. It's a matter of numbers, Jasmine said. There are billions upon billions of crustaceans out there, defenseless. A few thousand centaurs could do a lot of damage. We'd save a large net number of lives. Would you listen to yourself? A large net number of lives? I'm not an accountant, Captain Saren. You've told me yourself that this is a war to the death, to the extinction. We want the living beings to win, don't we? Yes, I said, nodding. All right, I'll look at the numbers. We examined them and determined the move would be unfeasible. Launched on their flying one-man sleds, the centaurs wouldn't have enough acceleration to get to the enemy missiles before they reached Thor-6. Almost as important, by the time they'd gone so far ahead of our fleet, they would be moving very fast. It was unlikely they could target and intercept the missiles and explode themselves at the precisely right moment. It was too much to ask anyway. I said. I have another idea. Jasmine cocked her head to one side. I could tell she didn't really believe there were any other viable options. This was proof to me that even my best officers liked to stay inside the box with their solutions. We could send our fighters, I said. She frowned for a moment, unsure what I was suggesting. Then her eyes widened. Oh, no, sir. I nodded my head, becoming more certain by the second that my idea was the right move. We can send the fighters in now. They have plenty of range and a much greater rate of acceleration than this slow-moving fleet. If we launch quickly enough, they might even be able to shoot down some of the missiles that are going to rain down on the crustaceans. She shook her head rapidly, making her non-regulation-length black hair fly. You can't do that. They'll be wiped out without fleet support. Worse, they'll be leaving the main fleet undefended. Never split your forces in the face of the enemy. Isn't that what you're always telling your officers? Yeah, I said. But this is about more than winning a battle as cleanly as possible. This is about preventing an extinction event. The crustaceans are an allied species, whether they want to admit it or not. And don't forget, I talked them into giving the macros a good look at their middle claw, which is why they're being targeted now. She crossed her arms and took a step back from the table. What are your orders, Colonel? She asked. Have both carriers launch two of their fighter squadrons. Each ship will hold the other half of their wing in reserve. The crew complements on our carriers were smaller than earthly carriers. Gotter only had a crew of about 200 service people, plus the pilots and a platoon of shipboard marines. I kept the command structure streamlined as well, and we didn't have a CAG officer. We had a tactical operations officer and a gunnery officer for ship defense, but Captain Saren was in direct and overall command of everything that happened on her ship, including the actions of her fighters. Jasmine relayed my launch orders to Miklos, who commanded the second carrier. I could tell her conversation with Miklos was heated, but after a few terse comments, he apparently accepted it. Then she spoke to Tactical Operations, who gave orders to the crews in Gotter's launch bays. Klaxons sounded all over the ship. Soon the deck began to shiver under our boots as the fighters were shot from the four long tubes once every fifteen seconds or so. It looked and felt a lot like launching a barrage of missiles. I wondered if Commander Decker was among the pilots, and if she would survive the day. I didn't bother to check the rosters. That sort of decision was up to the carrier captain, and I didn't want to interfere. I took a break once the fighters were away. I headed to my cabin and washed my face, which felt sticky from stress and sweat. Then I went to the ward room and was served coffee that looked like a mug of crude oil. The voyage had been a long one. The coming battle would be difficult, but we had long ago formulated our plan of attack. I had a little time to think. Sitting there, sipping my coffee and wincing with each bitter swig, I went over my long relationship with Sandra in my mind. It had been turbulent and exciting. I wasn't yet able to comprehend how life would be without her. At length, my mind came around to the subject of the unexpected offer I'd received from Kate Swanson. The doctor's cabin was quite near the wardroom, and... I figured she was probably in it at the moment. 
Medical was empty now that our single critical patient had been given a one-way ticket to the hot white star that irradiated Gotter's hull. I had sensed earlier that Kate might be entertaining ideas about forming a relationship with me, but I hadn't been sure. After the proposal she'd delivered at the funeral, she'd left no doubt in my mind. Her suggestion of companionship seemed a little crass in retrospect. After all, Sandra's body had barely cleared the funeral tube before the woman had made her play. She was a fine-looking lady, and the fact we were close to the same age held some appeal to me. She was sophisticated, educated, and experienced, a person of substance. But I told myself I didn't want any pity sex, if that was what had been on her mind. At least, not on this terrible day. Chapter 38 Our fighters didn't make it there in time to intercept the enemy missiles. We considered firing missiles of our own to form a force wall against the enemy barrage, but the physics of the situation were against us. In space, even a nuclear warhead does not form a large region of destruction. Firstly, because there is no air to push together into a moving shockwave, and secondly, because space was incredibly large. The enemy missiles were simply too far apart for us to kill more than a handful of them before they reached the water moons. I made the hard call, deciding I would rather shoot at the enemy ships in close battle than waste the ordnance now. When I returned to the bridge, everyone seemed more tense than when I'd left. I stepped up to the tactical consoles, and ensigns melted away to make room for me. I was wearing battle armor now, and Quan was still following me around. The staffers gave us sidelong stares. Can someone give me a sit-rep? I asked. Captain Saren turned to me. Both fleets are converging on the gas giant and her flock of moons. We're decelerating hard, as are the macros. How about turning off the engines coming about and coasting in? I asked. She hesitated. We thought of that, sir, but the idea has been rejected. My eyebrows rose high. Who did the rejecting? Miklos, who was on my view screen as a headshot, shook his head vigorously and leaned forward. His nose loomed into the camera alarmingly. I did, sir, he said. We could coast in and arrive earlier, but we'd have to fight the entire battle in one flyby if we did it that way. Due to our high velocity and inertia, we can't just do a U-turn. We'll have to zoom past the enemy and do a long turnaround to come back into range again. I know that, I said. The question is, what can we do to them in a single pass? Can you guarantee we can visit enough destruction on the macros to stop them from giving the crustaceans a death blow? In short, Miklos replied, the answer is no. We can't do it. Their ships are as tough as they've always been. What about the fighters? I asked. They can decelerate much faster than the bigger ships can. Let's get them in there and let them harass the enemy up close and personal. We can't do that, Colonel, he said. Then he hesitated. Let me amend that. It would be an unwise use of a limited resource. In fact, I suggest we recall the squadrons we've sent already. Explain. They can't stop the missile barrage, he said. We know that now. They... I want to know why that happened, too. Give it to me. We have time. Miklos' eyes traveled toward Jasmine, who met them. There was a tiny, unspoken communication... I could see it happening, despite the screens and the relative distance between them. I hated these moments when my officers tried to manipulate me. I had to fight to stay calm. I assured myself I'd get to the bottom of whatever scheme they had in mind and make my own decisions. I knew my staff, even at the highest levels, thought I was a loose cannon. Perhaps they were even correct in some instances, I'll give them that, but as the overall commander of Star Force, I wanted to be in the loop at all times. It was my job, and it was their jobs, to present the facts clearly and completely. Very well, I said loudly. Since you have no clear objections, I'm going to order— Please, sir, Miklos interrupted. Let me explain. I tried to cross my metal-encased arms. I was annoyed when I realized the movement was impossible. 
This new battle armor was too thick to permit it. Sparks flew from my gauntlets and bracers for a moment. Then I gave up and let them drop back to my sides. This did nothing to improve my mood. I stared intently at Miklos's image on my screen. The situation has changed slightly. Our optical systems have now pinpointed the enemy target. It is Princeton. I frowned. Princeton? All the missiles are going there? They're all headed for one moon? Yes, sir, he said. That is problematic for us. As you know, it is difficult to tell the exact flight path of a missile from this distance. They can retarget and shift. But now, due to their extreme velocity, they are past the point of no return. They can't shift their goal and hit anything else of value, not even if they want to. They're simply moving too fast to change course with the remaining time and fuel they have. I nodded, studying the tactical layout. Let me guess, Princeton is the farthest moon from our fleet, the easiest target for them to hit. But why just that world? This is a huge barrage. Surely they could knock out whatever military capacity the single world has with far less. Another glance was exchanged between Saren and Miklos. Again, I tried to ignore it. We don't think that's their plan, Captain Saren said. I turned to her, and I saw a haunted look in her eyes. I frowned. Not their plan? What, then? Ah. I understood suddenly. The implications were horrifying. The macros had no intention of disabling the crustacean military. They weren't planning to invade at all. They were here to kill the population. I swallowed and stared at the screens. We can't stop their missiles, and they're all targeting one planet. What are our damage estimates? How many civilian deaths? All of them, sir, Captain Saren said. Nothing will survive. Much of the ocean will be blown to vapor. The crust might even crack open. If they strike with enough fusion warheads along a single fault line, here... She went on for another minute or so, detailing how billions upon billions were doomed to die. An entire world teeming with life was about to be extinguished, and I couldn't do anything to stop it. I turned Saren's voice out as the finer points didn't matter. Get the crustacean high command on the line, will you? I asked when she had finished. It took longer than it should have, but soon I had someone who identified themselves as a research coordinator on the line. It was a male this time, and as far as I could determine, his name was Nagag. Marvin did the translating, and I did the talking. Coordinator Nagag, I said. It is a sad day, and I have grim news for your people. Please keep your comments terse and to the point, human, said Nagag. I'm involved in a variety of projects at the moment. I can well imagine... Are you aware of the approaching fleet and its intentions? Of course. Have you got a battle plan to meet the enemy? We have plans to meet all our enemies. Your actions will be repaid a thousandfold. Your young will boil in their nests tomorrow as surely as ours will today. I frowned. Perhaps there is some kind of misunderstanding. Our fleet is coming to help you against the macros. We will fight a great battle in your space to defend you. Do you understand our intentions? There was a hesitation. We will meet all our foes with equal ferocity. That's just my point. It may look like we are on an attack course against your world, but we aren't. Don't waste any resources shooting at us. The macros have launched their missiles, and they're all headed for you, not for us. We will destroy the machines for you, but we're requesting your aid to do so. As far as I'm concerned, Star Force is allied with the Crustacean people. We can't accept an alliance on a permanent basis. I rolled my eyes. These people were impossibly difficult to deal with. They were facing their own destruction as a people and still wanted to maintain neutrality. All right, then, how about we ally for the next twenty hours— after that, we'll break it off. Is that temporary enough for you? 
Another hesitation ensued. This one was longer than the first. At long last, the crustacean returned to the phone. We would like to address the process. It is not being adhered to. Proper protocols have been established and shall not be breached unless... Unless what? I demanded suddenly in exasperation. Is this not enough of a circumstance for you to break your bureaucratic vows? There are no such vows as you term them, Nagog said huffily. But we will accept your offer of a short-term peace. Any violation of these terms will... Yeah, right, I said. Good luck to you, too. Just aim your guns at the machines, not us, and we'll do the same. Rigs out. Captain Saren turned to me reproachfully when the connection closed. We should coordinate with them more closely than that. I threw up two gauntleted hands. What am I supposed to do? It took me ten minutes just to get them to agree not to shoot at us while we defend their worlds for them. I'm not going to waste another minute trying to tell them how to best use their own defenses, whatever they are. These people are impossible to deal with. It's all about procedure and protocol. I'm surprised some predator didn't eat them all a million years ago. Jasmine looked at me with her lips pursed in disapproval. I turned my full attention back to the screens. All right, I said. I'm trying to look at and get the sense of their grand strategy. Whose? Captain Saren asked. The macros. I mean, let's look at this from their point of view. First, they tried to kill a planet full of lobsters by draining it. Half of them are still alive. I nodded. Only because we interfered. But in any case, their next move was to send in a fleet. They don't have any invasion ships, so their goals lean toward extermination rather than subjugation. They fired a huge number of missiles, all targeting a single world. Those crustaceans are pretty much cooked now. That leaves us Harvard and what's left of Yale. What are you getting at, sir? Where are their ships headed? What do the optics say? She brought up the report and I examined it. The data was clear and undeniable. Their entire fleet is heading for Harvard, she said, glaring at the trajectory. I suppose they could change it. But they won't, I said. They haven't changed a thing since they started. Their intentions are very clear. They've managed to kill one and a half worlds. The main body of the fleet will kill another. All that will be left is the half of Yale's population that we managed to keep alive. Captain Saren looked at me in pain. They mean to kill them all. Yes, I said. Exactly. The question is, can we stop them? I don't see how, she said. Have you recalled the fighters yet? I asked suddenly. Yes, sir. They're still decelerating, but... I've got new orders for them. We're flying out there at flank speed. We've got to hit them as fast as we can, but only when they're over Harvard. What are you saying, sir? You heard me. Come about and stop decelerating. Prepare to launch more fighters. How many fighters? All of them. We have to get to Harvard before the macros do. They're going to erase the crustaceans, Jasmine. They're going to remove them from their home worlds. Every last lobster will die if we don't get out there and fight with them. I began stripping off my heavy armor. Inside, I was wearing a smart flight suit. The cloth smoothed itself out like unfolding paper once it was free of the armor. Jasmine watched me do this with eyes that were big and dark. Her face was lit up from below with blue light from the screens. You're going with them, aren't you? She asked quietly. I gave her a thin smile. You know me too well. I left the bridge and marched down the central passageway. I took a lift to the launch bays. Before I got there, the klaxons were sounding. I wondered if I would ever hear the battle cry of a big ship like this again. What I was doing was pretty crazy, and I knew it, but I was acting on a hunch. I'd done it before, and if this one panned out, I planned to do it again. Jasmine caught up with me on the flight deck. I heard her feet running lightly after me. I turned around, knowing it would be her. This is unnecessary, Kyle, she said. I knew you guys had talked about something before I got to the bridge. I also knew you two had to make a concerted effort not to call me back up there when this data came in. It took me a few minutes to figure it out, but I finally did. 
You don't have to do this, she said. Yeah, I do. I screwed the crustaceans. The macros are going all out to kill them because I gave them the excuse they needed. I talked them into attacking the macros. Their extinction is all because of me, and you and me close know it as well as I do. The sad thing is we didn't even need their help down on Yale. We would have won without them. She bit her lower lip and nodded. It was an unusual, vulnerable moment for her. I could see she was conflicted. I sighed. I've been doing a lot of thinking, you know. Since Sandra died again, for the last time. I've been thinking of all the people who've tried to take me out and why they did it. Remember Barrera? He was a good, solid officer. But he turned on me. He did it because he thought it was the right thing to do for humanity. Maybe he was right. No, he wasn't, she said with sudden emotion. He was full of himself. Crow was, too. Always these smaller, meaner men come to hate you. They don't understand that you might not do things by the book, but you win. In the end, that's what humanity needs out here in space. A winner. I'm still going. She looked defeated, then took a deep breath. I know. I chuckled. She hugged me, and we kissed lightly. I felt a dozen eyes on my back, but I didn't much care right then. Let them talk. Let them say Jasmine really poisoned Sandra to get to this moment. I couldn't stop them because they were going to say crap like that anyway about any woman I touched. So I kissed her back, more firmly. Then I let her go and looked at her face. I thought I might have bruised you, I said. I'm fine, she said with a smile. Go kill the machines. I nodded, turned, and marched to a bird they had ready for me. I saw Commander Decker standing there beside it. Is this your fighter? I asked in surprise. Yeah, she said. I figured you already knew how to fly her, so why make any of my other pilots miss out on the fun? Thanks, I said, climbing into the cockpit. Good luck, Colonel, she said seriously, looking up at me. Across the hangar, Jasmine was still lingering at the elevators. Then I frowned down at Decker. You're a survivor, I said. That's why you're staying here, and I'm making this flight, right? Decker opened her mouth, then closed it again. She gave me a little shrug. I laughed, put on my helmet, and began the launch sequence. I really liked the feel of the fighter under my butt. It felt like power, speed, and trembling potential. Chapter 39 I have to admit I was roaring almost as loudly as the engine itself by the time the tiny fighter fired out of the end of that tube. I felt like it had been too long since I'd flown a ship solo, and this one was the most vibrant piece of machinery I'd ever had the pleasure of piloting. Now that Commander Decker wasn't around to temper my judgment, I felt free to fly the bird the way Miklos had intended— violently. I had little choice in the matter, as I was the last one launched. The rest of the squadron was already en route to rendezvous with the first squadrons we'd launched over an hour earlier. Meeting up with the other fighters wasn't as hard to do as it may sound. The first wave of fighters only had to coast, while we kept accelerating all the way in. The tricky part would be the deceleration— we were going to have a rough time of it to get our speed down in time to make a single mass and meet the machines as an organized strike force. Captain Sarin and Miklos had worked hard on the math. We were going to rendezvous only minutes before meeting the enemy. In fact, we'd be inside their gun range when we did mass up. That was cutting it closer than I would have liked, but we didn't have any choice at this point. For their part, the machines had so far ignored our fleet entirely. They hadn't even bothered to ping us. We knew they could see us. We were making no effort at stealth, moving at flank speed with blazing tails of flame behind every vessel as we accelerated and decelerated. We looked like a swarm of comets, visible with the naked eye from just about anywhere in the star system. Despite all that, they hadn't targeted us with missiles or sent us so much as a warning message. It was almost disturbing how focused and cold the enemy could be. 
It was when they behaved this way that they seemed entirely alien to me. Even the blues would have said something as we charged to war. The joyride of the fighter lost some of its thrill after the first hour of hard acceleration followed by hard deceleration. My teeth ached in my head, and I could taste blood. It rolled down the back of my throat in a steady trickle, and with every swallow I felt like gagging. I knew the other pilots had to be experiencing similar side effects, but none of them mentioned it. Perhaps it was my presence that kept them from complaining. Fighter jocks were a proud bunch. I could almost hear their thoughts. If this old man who barely knows how to fly his bird can endure the G's, then we can damned well do the same. I had time to think, unfortunately. Time to think about Sandra's dead face, Marvin's excited probing of her body, and Kerr's expression as I had let him die in space. I thought about Jasmine's kiss, Dr. Swanson's whispered proposal, and a dozen other pleasant things as well. In a way, I was disappointed. I partly volunteered to go on this flight so I wouldn't have time to think about recent events. In that regard, I'd miscalculated. But as with all things, the journey came to an end. The water moon we dubbed Harvard came into view. It was blue, white, and purple. The waters weren't pure, I knew, but the beaches were. They told me to expect the purple, as there was a lot of manganese garnet particles in the water of this strange moon. The colorful parts were the shallow areas, or the regions dotted with islands. The spectrometer readings from fleet had given me the heads up, but really, you couldn't understand what you were going to see until you saw it with your own eyes. The purple went in curving streaks, covering the island areas with magenta stripes that extended into the sea until the blue of the water took over. What a lovely world it was. I thought it would be a grand shame to let it be destroyed before a single human had the pleasure of walking one of those warm beaches. Sir, do you read me, Colonel? It was Jasmine, and by the timing I knew it wasn't going to be good news. Go ahead, Captain, I said. The missile barrage just hit Princeton. The warheads were fusion, as expected. The yields appear to be high. I closed my eyes for a second in silent prayer. I couldn't see the third moon, as it was far from our position on the other side of the gas giant, but I knew those bombs were killing millions. Any casualty estimates yet? Not yet, sir. What about the crustaceans? Are they showing any signs of having a viable defense? Yes, sir. That's partly why I'm calling. They launched a number of missiles at the approaching macro ships. They've also sent up a flotilla of their own ships. Good, I said, slamming a hand down on the fighter's dashboard. A few instruments dimmed in protest, making me wince. The smart metal dash began unfolding itself. Unfortunately, the macro minesweeper ships seem to have stopped most of the missiles. We think it operates with some kind of magnetic pulsing field. In any case, the missiles managed to destroy that ship, but only a few of the cruisers were damaged. What about their own fleet? I asked. You said they have ships. We've got new data on those ships. They all appear to be transport. I frowned, checking my instruments. There wasn't anything to see there yet on my screens. One weakness of these small, fast ships was their lack of long-range sensors. There just wasn't room for that kind of equipment aboard. We should be meeting up with the first fighter wave soon, I said. Where are these crustacean transports? Maybe we can combine our attack and cover them. I think it's possible, sir. The transports are all converging on your position. They're heading to Harvard. I think they're trying to save that last untouched world. A brave move, I said seriously. They don't have much, but they're going to make their play here. Well, we'll do what we can to help them. As a final point, the enemy ships are now in range. I mean, you are in their range. Roger that, I said. Any sign of incoming fire yet? It might be there, but we can't see it yet. You're too far away, about five light minutes. You'll know before we do if you're under fire. That's great, I said. Thanks for the update. Rig's out. 
we'd been communicating with a small ring resonance unit, which allowed instant communications. It was strange being able to talk directly to another ship, but having them be so distant their sensors could not yet have picked up what was going on around my position due to the limitations of the speed of light. I imagined that eventually I'd have to invent sensory equipment that could relay its findings instantly using the ring resonance technology, but that improvement would have to wait for another day, if I should be so lucky as to live to see another dawn. Now the excitement of battle finally fell over my mind. This was what I'd been seeking all along by coming out here, I realized. A clear enemy, a clear goal, and a planet that needed saving. No ethical dilemmas were about to present themselves to me out here. Destroying machines was always good. The first of our fighters was hit about three minutes later. Analysis by my shipboard brain boxes assured me one of my wingmates had been nailed by incoming point defense fire. Countermeasures, I ordered. Everyone spread out. Random pattern on the approach. We're too far out and too small for them to get a bead on. If we can keep their AI guessing, we can get in close enough for a pass with very few losses. It felt like bullshit, but it was good bullshit. The squadrons broke up and began weaving around like drunks. The bolts of light coming at us were invisible until they reached us, but they could be measured as they passed. The machines had finally taken official notice of us. Two fighters blew up over the next three minutes and then one more. I looked at the numbers. We were still out of range. Let's put the hammer down, people, I said. The enemy have no fighters. They are big, slow targets. Pair off and make a high-speed pass aiming at their engines. All around me, powerful little engines flared in the endless night of space. I followed suit, and we were all plunging forward toward ships we couldn't even see yet. I checked my instruments every few seconds, but the brain box had no firing solutions for me yet. I chose a wingman and followed him on our first wild pass. We were going too fast, that was obvious to any observer. But we had engaged the enemy before they'd expected it, and I knew I was buying time for the crustaceans to make whatever play they had up their sleeve. I hoped it would be a good one. Less than a minute later, the macro cruisers were in visual range. There were about two hundred of them. They had more cruisers than we had fighters. It was a daunting realization. The main body of my fleet was nearly an hour behind us. I was in this alone with the crustaceans, about a hundred fighters against two hundred cruisers. For the first time, I felt as if we were doomed. To their credit, every Star Force pilot followed me into that mess without a complaint or a moment's hesitation. My Marines often thought of themselves as the braver men, true warriors who fought the enemy as close as the sights of their rifles. But these fleet pukes were impressing me. Now that the cruisers were visible, I could see their weapons firing as well. Huge cannons blossomed with round after steady round. All of this pounding went down, down to Harvard itself. None of the big weapons were aimed at us. They were all blasting the helpless planet beneath them. I bared my teeth, angry with the cold calculation of the enemy. They knew they weren't likely to hit a fighter with a heavy weapon. Instead, they were going to take out the civilian population below us. The cruisers swelled in size in my canopy. We were already in the middle of the pass, and I felt all of my insane speed as we drew close. The cruisers looked like they were standing still in comparison. When my ship finally started firing its primary weapon, it kind of shocked me. The fighters were armed differently than other ships I'd flown. The small hulls didn't have the size to operate a heavy laser. Basically, there wasn't room for a large enough generator. The only laser aboard was about the size of a Marine's rifle, and was useful only for defensive purposes. It couldn't damage anything bigger than an incoming missile. The ship had waited until we were in close— to use its single primary armament. I'd laid in firing orders long ago. The fighters used kinetic weaponry, essentially a gatling gun of six barrels, each of which accelerated a stream of depleted uranium pellets up to fantastic speeds. The result was a deafening ripping sound. The cockpit shivered with the recoil. 
The canopy flared white, and for a second I thought I'd been hit. Then I realized it was just a gush of flame washing over my bird. There was no smoke, as we weren't in an atmosphere, but the released plasma byproduct more than did the job of obscuring my vision. It was hard to see what was happening when the gun fired. Fortunately, I was moving very fast. The moment the firing stopped, the canopy instantly cleared. I could then see for a few seconds and retarget, if necessary, before the next burst began. To allow the ship's gun to cool down, the weapon fired in short bursts. Our first pass was short and violent. Fighters took fire and exploded. Any hit was pretty much fatal in these thin craft. Our only defense at this range was our speed. We made a fateful pass by the rear of the enemy column, spraying millions of rounds into the enemy engines. The results were dramatic. Seconds after the first fighters reached optimal range, the cruisers were hit with what looked like orange-white lines of flashing sparks. It was like watching a spray of incendiary tracers, but the streams traveled faster than that, and they were burning from their initial launch, not because of friction with any atmosphere. More streams of bullets appeared. They grew in number and intensity. More and more of my fighters had reached effective range. The cruisers were no longer sedately sailing along, looking impervious to attack. They shook with internal explosions. Engines flickered and died. Blue exhaust choked off on several ships. Suddenly being stricken and thrown off balance by uneven thrust, they went into spins. Two of the cruisers slammed into one another as we completed the pass, creating a very satisfactory explosion. Three more dropped down into the atmosphere of Harvard and began to burn. I personally counted six kills, and I was sure there were more outside of my range of vision. Still, as we roared past the enemy fleet and shot to the far side of the planet, I knew that we hadn't done enough damage. Wing Commander, I called out. There was no response. Squad leaders, do I have anyone? Here, sir, said a voice. I'm Commander Fireball. We've lost some people. I'm in charge now, sir. Congratulations, I said. You're from Defiant, right? I'm taking tactical command of Goddard's squadrons. Um, okay, sir. Here's what we're going to do. We're out of range now on the far side of Harvard. We're going to make a quick orbit and make another pass, but we're going to do it differently this time. How's that, Colonel? We're going to slow down and we're going to engage. Sir? We can't dogfight with cruisers, sir. I know that. Listen closely. We have less than six minutes before this orbit is over and we're back in range of the macros again. Commander Fireball was quiet for a second. I waited impatiently. Colonel, if we decelerate, their point defense lasers are going to shred us. I'm well aware. That's why on this pass... We're going to feed our ships different target priorities. We're going to take out the enemy laser turrets. We're too small to hit with missiles or their primary guns. They won't be able to touch us if we take out their PD turrets. There was another, longer hesitation. I felt a familiar red heat rising up my neck. I didn't like to be ignored or to be kept waiting in the midst of battle. Commander, I began when I couldn't wait any longer. I'm not accustomed to... Sorry, sir, I was just checking with Commodore Miklos. He suggests that... I don't care to hear his suggestions, Commander, I said loudly. Here are your orders. Have your pilots retarget and decelerate for the next pass. We'll stay engaged, working from the top of the enemy fleet, where most of their weaponry can't come to bear on us unless they turn upside down. They'll just invert and burn us out of the sky, sir. No, they won't. Trust me. Rigs out. Reluctantly, the commander relayed my orders. In my headset, I heard a number of bitter complaints from the pilots. They were brave, but they weren't stupid. I didn't go on to the general chat. It was enough that they knew what they were supposed to do. About two hundred seconds later, we came screaming around the southern pole of Harvard and plowed right into the stern of all those bombing cruisers. I had to hand it to the macros. They hadn't missed a beat. They were pounding the world below us with relentless firepower. The purple beaches were now speckled with black pits. 
The fighter swarm was moving slower now, and we were much more vulnerable to incoming fire. I watched tensely as the big ships ahead stayed on course and continued their relentless bombardment. They were killing millions. But they were also giving us the time we needed to get into effective range. By the time we caught up with them on that second pass, we'd only lost six more fighters. We had nearly seventy percent of our force left, and we were all over them like a swarm of angry hornets. Chapter 40 Within five long minutes our fighters had taken grievous losses, but we'd managed to trim off nearly all of their defensive armament. They had nothing much left to hit us with, but I was down to less than two full squadrons. Still, I was alive and determined. The world below was pockmarked with glowing craters, black burnt scorch marks, and white water impact points. Tidal waves were sweeping around the planet in every direction. The surface of the single, endless ocean resembled a puddle in a rainstorm. But I knew that although the crustaceans were taking a beating, they would survive if I could disable the rest of the bombarding fleet. Without thermonuclear missiles, the macros needed many hours to render the planet uninhabitable. Possibly days. The tidal waves were bad, but the native species was aquatic, and should survive if they spread out and crawled along the stirred-up bottom. Barring a direct hit from above, they could not be easily taken out. Suddenly the battle shifted. The macros rolled over, turning their belly turrets up into space, rather than aiming down at the planet below. This move took me by surprise, but I ordered the pilots to stay on task, destroying every laser turret they could. When we finished that, we could work on their engines and bring them down one at a time. They've inverted and are going to blow us out of the sky, sir, said Commander Fireball. I thought there was a hint of I told you so in his voice, but I let it slide. Dive below their formation, I ordered. We shifted our attack, moving below the enemy. I waited for Fireball to tell me they would just turn over and bring their guns to bear on us again, but he didn't. The macros, for their part kept firing out into space. Sir, called Commander Fireball. Those big turrets are firing up at great range. They must be shooting at something. Whatever it is, it's not us. Nothing on sensors? Negative. Our main fleet isn't close enough yet to engage them, so it isn't our ships they're firing on. I'll talk to Saren. Maybe she can see what's happening. Should we disengage, sir? asked the commander, hopefully. No, damn it, keep on them. I hailed Gotter, and Jasmine answered quickly with happy news. It's not us, she said. It's the crustacean transports. They're coming in and unloading borders. They're clearly planning to storm the macro cruisers. That is fantastic news, I shouted back. For once, I'm glad these lobsters are so good at copying our tactics. I was beginning to think we were going to win this. Then the crustaceans finally arrived, and I became certain of it. Another minute passed, during which we didn't lose a single fighter. Every gun the machines had was spamming fire at the approaching transports. I couldn't see the damage they were doing, but I was sure the crustaceans were taking a beating. Despite this, I was elated. I could taste victory now, and it was sweet. We'd all come so far and lost so much. Taking out these machines would make my day. Sandra's sacrifice seemed more valid to me, given the number of lives we were saving. A moment later, I could see the transports. There were at least a hundred of them. And much closer, I could make out dark, tiny shapes falling like a shower of sand. These shapes were individual crustacean marines. They fell in a cloud over the macro fleet. They crawled over the surface of every vessel like cockroaches. I'd never been so pleased to see a thousand little crawling monsters before. Then the macros shifted their tactics again. Their missile ports opened. My heart pounded as I fought the controls on my ship and the communication system in my helmet simultaneously. Jasmine! I shouted. 
Get through to the Crustacean High Command. They have to stop those missiles. They haven't got half their Marines down yet, and I'm sure the macros mean to take out the transports and any flying troops that haven't landed on their hulls yet. The cruisers might even scorch one another to burn the troops off like fleas. Relaying, she said. I waited impatiently, looping around a cruiser, seeking a valid target. The enemy ships had very few laser turrets left. I would have fired on their engines, but my main gun was out of ammo. These small ships had drawbacks. Colonel, Jasmine said, coming back on the line. I'm sorry, sir. They say that transports can't stop them. I cursed and switched over to the tactical channel. This is to all pilots, I said. Break off and chase those missiles. We have to take them out. Dozens of engines flared blue, white, and drew streaking arcs on my canopy. The fighters disengaged and charged after the missiles. But we couldn't catch them. We took out one or two with our lasers, but the majority streaked away. Our ships were fast, but a missile was nothing but an engine and a warhead. It was designed for speed and little else. We couldn't catch up. I cursed and gnashed my teeth until my gums bled. But it was all in vain. My fighter was no faster than any of the others. A moment later, the flock of missiles intermixed with the incoming transports and shot past them. I stared, dumbfounded. I contacted Jasmine again. Captain Saren, am I missing something? No, sir, she said. The missiles went right through the crustacean line without detonating. They're still flying and accelerating. There's no chance you can catch them, Colonel. The question is, where are they headed? We're plotting that. But it is so early after launch, they have options. If they're coming at your fleet, I think the enemy has made a mistake. I would agree, sir, but we don't know that. I order the fighters to turn around and go back to harassing the enemy cruisers. Almost immediately, Commander Fireball was back on the line. I looked at the beeping light for a second in annoyance before answering it. What is it, Commander? I demanded. Sir, we need to return to the carriers. We're out of effective ammo. I know that, but we can still help the crustaceans by distracting the macros and taking out the last of the enemy point defense systems. I disagree, sir, he said evenly. We're as likely to burn a lobster in the back as kill another turret now. There are hardly any left in any case. I respectfully request that we return and let the native marine troops do their work. They can finish these cruisers on their own. I gritted my teeth, but finally agreed. All right, break off to the enemy stern. We'll return to base. I heard a great deal of relief in the commander's voice as he relayed the order to his pilots. We fell back behind the fleet, letting them glide away from us. They had turned back over now and were again bombing the helpless world below. It was galling watching them fire so many deadly salvos without being able to stop them. Colonel, Jasmine asked in my helmet. Go ahead. We've plotted the course of those missiles. They're all headed for Yale. I froze, staring straight ahead. Suddenly I got it. The macros had never changed missions, never for one second. They had started this attack by draining the seas of Yale in a scheme to kill all life on the planet. When we'd stopped them, they'd moved on to Plan B, the direct invasion of Yale. Now they were taking another shot at it with the last of their missiles. I understood in a flash that they didn't care about my fleet or any fleet. They weren't here to win a fleet battle. They were here to annihilate a biotic species entirely— burning their three home worlds to rubble. Can you get in the way of that barrage, Captain Saren? No, sir, she said. We've already plotted it out. We're out of position. We'll arrive shortly and probably destroy the last of the cruisers, but we won't be able to save Yale. I did some quick math in my head. The macros had already wiped out one world, Princeton, with the first missile attack. Yale was half dead and they were going to finish it now. The last world was Harvard, stretched out below us with scarred purple beaches and churning seas. Contact Crustacean High Command, I said. Tell them what the machines are doing. Tell them they have to stop these cruisers or they might be extinct within the hour. How, sir? Just tell them. 
As she relayed the message, the macro cruisers made their next move. They broke up, splitting the fleet apart into a hundred and fifty separate units. The ships spread out in every direction. Then they began dropping, dipping down into the atmosphere of Harvard. Their hulls turned orange, then white. What are they doing, Colonel? Commander Fireball asked me. I stared at the scene before I answered. I was humbled by the magnificent purity of the enemy. They had the single-mindedness that only a machine could have. They didn't care if they lost a fleet or a hundred fleets. They only cared about taking us out. I had the feeling they'd gotten tired of dealing with us and changed their strategy to a new one. Extermination. Biotics were to be destroyed wherever they could be found. The war had entered a new stage. They're killing a world, Commander, I said sadly. The friction will burn off the attacking Marines, but they won't stop falling. They know our fleet is bearing down on them, and they can't stop us from destroying them. So they'll come down in a hundred separate locations and ignite their cores. Just to kill the lobsters? The commander asked incredulously. They'll sacrifice their entire fleet? Taking out an enemy species is worth more than any fleet. The machines are winning today. I watched, as did we all. There was little else to do. Within a few minutes, I had my answer. I'd hoped I was wrong, but I wasn't. One by one, the big ships exposed their cores and detonated themselves. The cruisers blew themselves up in a chain of explosions. Each blast was huge and devastated a new spot on the beautiful world below. Soon the purple sands were gone. I couldn't even see the great ocean a minute later. The entire planet was shrouded in vapor and airborne debris. Still, the explosions went on. Beneath the thick clouds, huge orange flashes continued to rock the world. From my lofty perch in space, the impacts were silent, terrible, and unreal to behold. Chapter 41 the surviving fighters limped home to their respective motherships. The pilots inside were as drained physically and emotionally as were their ships, power systems, and ammo magazines. Of the two, the ships were the easier to repair. The pilots were damaged goods. We'd sacrificed so much and yet failed to defend the last crustacean world. We'd all witnessed the death of a lovely planet, and we'd never be the same afterward. I kept thinking of Sandra. That seemed selfish, in a way. What right did I have to lament the loss of a single woman after having presided over this failed attempt to save a trillion individuals? The human heart has no sense of scale and balance, however. I would have probably traded them all to have my woman back the way she'd been a week ago. But that was not an option. I was haunted in particular by Sandra's scent. It had been a unique thing. What was the source of the memory that lingered in my mind? Her shampoo, her perfume, or even her sweat? Possibly it was a mixture of all these things. I don't know, but I'll always remember the way she smelled when I drew her close in my arms. And I'll miss it forever. Fortunately, there were a thousand things that desperately needed doing. It was perhaps the single blessing awarded by a war of desperation— a man didn't have time to dwell and grieve. I buried Sandra and all my thoughts of her deep in my mind. I carried on because there was no choice other than to go completely mad. Sir, Jasmine said, signaling me. I looked up and forced my eyes to focus. I was standing on Gotter's bridge, eyeing the tactical display. The big ship had come through the battle without a scratch— the machines hadn't been gunning for our fleet this time. They'd wanted blood, and they'd gotten it. What is it? I managed to say to her. I could tell from the look of concern on her face she must have been trying to tell me something. I searched my memory for some hint. My mind was a blank I hadn't heard her words. 
Then my eyes strayed to my comm link, which was blinking urgently. I picked it up. Who is it? I asked. The crustaceans, Jasmine said. Great, I thought. You mean they're high command? She pursed her lips, then gave a slight shake of her head. I don't think they have a high command anymore, sir. Right. Well, whoever it is, I owe it to them to answer the phone. Patch them through the translation circuits. Done. Colonel Kyle Riggs here, I said into my comm link. An oddly watery voice came to my ear a few moments later. To me, it sounded as if their own equipment had malfunctioned somewhat. It sounded as if their microphones weren't good at handling the transition of audio from their aquatic environment to mine. I couldn't fault them for that. Whatever tech they had left, I was sure it wasn't their best. Colonel, the voice said thoughtfully, you have survived. Yes, I said. The individual had not identified himself, but I didn't have the heart to demand that he do so. I wasn't quite sure what to say next. There was a lull in the conversation. I thought of a million things to say. I could give him my heartfelt apologies. I could tell him to buck up. Tomorrow would be a better day. I could talk about humanity's losses against the machines and commiserate. But I didn't have the energy for any of these approaches. They all sounded like bullshit to me. So we both fell silent for several seconds. You have gotten what you wanted, the voice said at last. No, I said. I wanted to defeat the machines. I wanted to stop them from damaging your people and your worlds. I've failed to achieve my goals today. This was a great defeat for the side of the biotics, for our shared side. That's not what I meant, said the voice. You've won our allegiance, our unquestioning loyalty, and effectively our obedience. We are at your mercy. What is your will, my ruler? What? I want to help you. Tell me what you need, and I will attempt to provide it. There is no need for further deceptions, great one, the translator warbled. The slave does not dictate to the master. We accept our role, and wish only that you will in turn allow the few remaining members of our species to survive this day. We will grovel if we must. We will scrape our shells from our flesh, if that is your will. I was alarmed and saddened. Not only did these people seem crushed, they were certain I had wanted it that way all along. They believed I had personally plotted their downfall. After having dealt with the crustaceans for years, I knew they were not like us. They did not understand actions taken out of benevolence. Such behavior did not cause them to reciprocate. It only made them suspect a trick. Perhaps this was because they were not mammals. Maybe they didn't have a layer to their brain that allowed for interspecies compassion. My mind raced, unsure as how to proceed. I fell back on my past experiences with alien species. Often it was best to be adaptable, as they usually weren't. If my mind could flex... The two races could come to an understanding for the betterment of all. When working with the centaurs, who were hung up on the concepts of honor and herd values, I'd learned to talk to them in their own idiomatic way. This had allowed us to form a tight, valuable alliance. This situation required more of the same adaptability on my part. Accordingly, I took a deep breath and went for it. I've considered the matter, I said loudly. Around me, the staffers watched and listened intently without seeming to. I've decided to accept the capitulation of the crustaceans to Star Force, I said matter-of-factly. This elicited a series of gasps and twitters around the bridge. I ignored them all. I didn't care about them at the moment. I had to save the crustaceans from extinction. 
If they wanted a strong leader who was so terrible that he must be obeyed, I'd give them one. At least they could understand that relationship. What are your terms, Colonel? There are no terms, I said firmly, other than total obedience and servitude. We accept your terms. We beg for our lives. They are granted. Now you must answer a series of queries. No omission or deceit will be tolerated. None shall be offered. Ask us what you will, Master. I stumbled upon hearing them call me Master. My staffers seemed scandalized as well. The level of background whispering swelled dramatically on the bridge. I glanced toward Jasmine, who was looking at me reproachfully with her arms crossed under her breasts. She appeared to be shocked by this turn of events. I had to stay in character, so I turned away from her. It helped me to think clearly. Are any of your worlds habitable? No, Master. You will address me as Colonel, not Master. Is that understood? Absolutely. Our apologies are profuse, Colonel. We did not mean to offend. Can you use your transports to salvage your civilian survivors? Very few of them can be reached. The radioactive tides are rolling around the worlds, killing everything they contact. The atmospheres are so turbulent they are leaking away into space. I closed my eyes, then opened them again. The scale of this disaster was incalculable. You will gather every strong, fit individual that you can with your transports, I told them. You will do this immediately, and keep in mind you must create a breeding population. Where are we to go when we have saved all that we can? You will come with us. We have a world in the Eden system that is warm and largely covered by one vast ocean. It will be your new home. We must abandon the Thor system for now. Once you reach Eden, you will be on the safe side of our battle station, and Star Force will protect you from further attacks by the machines as best we can. Your wish is our command, the voice said. Your command is our prayer. Jasmine touched my arm and pointed to the screens. I could see their transports moving off in several directions dropping down into the turbulent atmospheres of their dying worlds. They would gather as many as they could, and they would come to a new world with me. It was the least I could do for them. We'll talk more when you've gathered your people. May I say one thing, Colonel? Asked the voice. Yes. Let me offer my sincerest praise. You have played this game masterfully. We were fooled from the first by your feigned idiocy. Now we see the true genius behind your actions. I have awarded your people eleven full points on the cognitive scale. No species has ever scored so highly. I blinked and almost smiled, but I couldn't quite do it. The whole situation was too horrible to be amusing. A moment later, I realized who this individual I was talking to must be. I'd spoken to him before and talked about humanity's cognitive score at that time. Is this Professor Hoon? I asked. That is my designation, unless you want me to change it, Colonel. The title fits you, Hoon, I said. Keep it. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you. Chapter 42 I was in my anteroom just after the day shift ended when a visitor rapped at my door. Of all people, Captain Gaines had come to see me. Congratulations, I told him after inviting him in. You survived the great failed campaign of Thor VI. Billions of others didn't, but you did. Yes, sir. May I ask why you're here? I think you know, sir. I frowned, but then nodded after thinking back. I promised to make you a major, didn't I? I said. And now you're here to collect. That's right, sir. I waggled a finger at him. All right, I said. Zap! You're a major now. 
Next time you wade into combat on some rat hole, you'll command a battalion rather than a company. Are you happy now? He stared at me thoughtfully. No, sir. I don't think happy correctly describes my mood. I snorted and shook my head. I figured he would leave once he had his promotion, but he didn't. He lingered, looking troubled. I took in a deep breath. I wasn't really in the mood for having a heart-to-heart, -heart, but sometimes a commander needed to provide guidance to his officers. I realized this was going to be one of those times. Accordingly, I reached down under my desk and opened a small hatch in the floor. A number of chilled, squeezed bottles of beer were stashed there, I scooped out two of them and pushed one across my desk to Gaines. The bottle left a streak of white ice crystals on my desk, and he caught it neatly. May I? he asked, indicating an empty chair. I nodded and opened my beer. He did the same. We quickly gulped down our beverages with greed. There was something about a perfectly chilled beer. It demanded to be consumed with gusto. When he was done, he set down the bottle and nodded. Thank you, sir. Again, I waited for him to leave. He asked me a question instead. This man had asked me a hell of a lot of questions since I had first met up with him on Yale. But this one surprised me. Colonel, he said. Why don't you just make yourself a general? I mean, come on, get real. You command big armies and fleets. You're at least a general. That's a good question, I said, pulling out fresh beers for both of us. I slid his to him and saw that the trail of ice crystals the first beer had left hadn't even melted to droplets yet. You see, I said, I just made you a major. That process felt real, didn't it? It felt real because I'm in authority over you. Everyone accepts that state of affairs. So if I give you a rank, everyone accepts the rank. In my case, things are different. I don't have anyone above me at the moment to award me a higher position. I'd have to just declare it, without anyone having approved anything. That would make it feel wrong, as if I'd cheated somehow. Gaines squinted at me while he worked on his beer. I did the same. He seemed to honestly understand the nature of my problem. How about we all get together and vote or something? He asked. What if we all vote, and whatever we come up with, that will be your new rank? Not a bad idea, but I'd be a little concerned I'd end up as a dog catcher if I did that. We both laughed. It was probably the first real laugh I'd had since the lobsters had gotten collectively boiled. Gaines had made me realize I had a problem— a problem with my legitimacy. Upon what basis did my authority rest? I wasn't sure. I'd frozen my rank long ago because I didn't feel I had the right to give myself a higher rank. Someone else had to bless it or it wasn't real. Back when Crow had at least been nominally in charge, I'd felt that I'd earned the promotions he'd given me. I'd believed there was some validity to my rise in rank. Maybe I'd been fooling myself, but I'd felt it. The promotions had seemed right. But now Crow had gone and declared himself an emperor. What would separate me from him if I made myself a general, king, or even a god? What right did I have to do that? What would separate me from Crow if I pulled a stunt like that? And so I'd stuck with the rank of colonel. These aliens... I said when we'd reached beer number four, or was it five. They came at night, they plucked us from our beds, and they made us what we are today. They made us organized to fight for them. But there's no nation behind us. I understand what you're saying, sir. You want to know what makes your power legitimate. I think I have an answer for you. The fact that people follow you. Maybe. Maybe that's the best answer of all. Damn straight it is, he said with feeling. If you shout an order and people obey, who's to say that you didn't have the right to give the order in the first place? I understand what you're saying, I told him. But I'm seeking more legitimacy than that. Napoleon crowned himself emperor, you know. 
He took the crown from the Pope who stepped up to his throne and he placed it on his own head. He did that because he figured if the churchmen crowned him, that meant the church had authority over him. I feel the opposite urge. I don't want to be the man who crowned himself ruler. I want a body, a group, a legitimate organization of some kind to decide who I am and what I deserve for my efforts. He nodded in understanding. His fingers made a scratching motion on my desk and I automatically fed them a fresh brew. I looked at him suddenly at that point in our conversation. You didn't come here and hang around my office to ask for advice, did you, Gaines? He shook his head. A wintry smile played on his lips. You thought I was the one that needed to talk? I asked. That's right, Colonel. Well, let me ask you this, Major. Who has the right to rule, and why? I don't know about that, sir, Gaines answered. But I do know that someone has to be at the top, and right now, that's you. I couldn't argue with the man, so I handed him another beer from my stash. He smiled as he received it. I've got another story for you, I said. Did you know that Genghis Khan had a rule concerning his officers and drunkenness? What was it? That no commander of his could be caught drunk more than once a month. If he was caught drinking hard more often than that, he would be reduced in rank. Gaines appeared concerned. Seems like a good rule, he said. But is this your way of taking back my promotion? Have you gotten drunk yet this month? No, sir, he said, shaking his head with mock sadness. Unfortunately, no. I've got an easy solution for that. He grinned, and I rolled out more icy drinks. Much later, I found myself slumped over my desk. I dreamt of Sandra. She'd been carried off by a marching row of metal ants on a sunless world, and I couldn't find her in the darkness. When morning arrived, Major Gaines and I were in a sorry state. Even the nanites had trouble cleaning up my office. Fortunately, my kind recover quickly from physical neglect. It is our minds and spirits that heal slowly. The way I saw it, my enemies had given me a difficult choice. Which one of them to destroy first? Both the Empire and the Macros had landed heavy blows that demanded retribution. Crow and his baloney Empire had snuck into my territory under a flag of truce and killed my lady love. I thought of revenge against him constantly. The Macros had slaughtered three worlds full of biotics. They were impossibly dangerous and evil. And in addition to these two sworn enemies, there was a third that was rising as a potential threat. The Blues. We'd been observing strange phenomena from their gas giant, Eden-12, for months. The activity had increased, as had the level of energy releases. According to Marvin, they now regularly generated more EM output than the entirety of Earth. What in the nine hells were they up to? I'd begun to suspect in my heart that I'd misjudged them. I'd always thought of them as neutrals that could possibly become future allies. I'd believed them when they'd said they'd released the machines by accident. But possibly I'd been duped. Some I'd spoken with had expressed regrets, while others had been remorseless. They hadn't cared about the billions their creations had slaughtered. Perhaps they weren't all of one mind on this topic. But again, maybe that was by design. How do you conquer the universe without loss? Well, you get someone else to do it for you, and you back them in secret, and you play dumb when questions are asked. That way, the dirty job gets done while you maintain your ivory tower innocence. My mind was finally eased the day after Gaines and I had gotten pissed drunk together. Relief came from an unexpected source. Miklos came into my office with a large file on a tiny portable data chip. The chip was about the size of a nickel and glossy black. He flipped the coin-sized chip onto my desk. Immediately, the desk sensed it, linked with it, and began dragging files out to display. He paged through them with his fingers expertly, searching for something. I watched him with raised eyebrows. I'd been sipping a fresh beer, my second of the afternoon. 
I quietly dropped the bottle on the floor between my feet, and the ship's deck swallowed it. I knew the squeeze bottle of delicious liquid would be released into space, where it would freeze and drift away with the rest of the debris our ships dumped every day. I didn't like wasting beer like that, but I didn't like letting my officers know I'd been drinking before dinner time lately. To what do I owe this visit, Commodore? I asked him. I have it right here, sir. One moment. Ah, here it is. He flicked a particularly large diagram out onto the desktop. It dwarfed the rest, and I realized in an instant it was a ship design document. The ship was big. Very big. Another carrier design? Exactly, sir, he said. We already have a pretty functional model, I said. Let me guess, you want permission to upgrade? No, sir, he said. I want to leave the two ships we have as they are. It would not be cost-effective to upgrade them, other than possibly adding a few components. These new ships will form an entirely new class of carrier. I examined the diagram, expanding it with my fingers to fill my desk. This thing is huge, I chuckled. Why should I build such a monstrosity? Miklos smiled at me knowingly and leaned on my desk. This ship will allow us to extend our reach, he said. This is an attacker's weapon. It can perform many tasks, but most importantly it is effectively a floating battle station, like this one, only mobile. What are you calling it? A supercarrier. How many do you think we should build? One, sir, to start with. Then another and another. As many as it takes. As many as it takes to do what? To carry the attack to the enemy. I stared at him thoughtfully. And who do you think that enemy should be? Miklos raised his hands with his palms up. I don't know that's not my job. I fight the battles, you start the wars. But these ships will take out anyone you aim them at. I sat back in my office chair thoughtfully. He had me there. I did want to attack. You're right, Miklos, I said. For years we've sat out here in the Eden system far from home, We've built up an independent colony, but no one recognizes our right to exist. We've been on the defensive, while waves of enemies attempt to destroy us. They haven't managed to strike a fatal blow, but they are certainly wearing us down. We've faced battle after battle on two fronts for too long. I'd hoped the macros could be stopped by my battle station. I'd hoped the Empire would come to its senses and normalize relations with Eden. These hopes have not borne fruit. I stood up as I spoke and walked to a window I'd installed in the far wall. It was a real honest window, made of lead-impregnated glass. The nanites had to work overtime to keep it from fogging up, but I enjoyed gazing through it with my own eyes and seeing the universe outside as it really was. View screens could only approximate reality. I'd hoped they'd come to accept us. I continued. But our enemies have done nothing other than plot and work to bring us down. They've hurt me badly, not just my plans, but me personally. The macros have slaughtered trillions of sentient beings and made me carry the weight of those deaths on my spirit. Crow and his Imperial Earth sycophants took away the woman I loved. Miklos stepped up and gazed out of my window beside me. He spoke quietly. That's right, Colonel. And no matter what you choose to do now, attack the macros, the Empire, or just sit here and hold on, you'll need a massive fleet. I nodded in agreement. All right, I said. Build your carriers, Miklos. Improve the fighters, too, and build thousands of them. I'm hereby ordering that 90% of the nano and macro factory production be turned over to fleet construction. Go crazy. 
but do it right. Thank you, sir. You will not regret it. He ran out of my office before I could change my mind. I didn't even turn to watch him go. It is they who will regret it, Miklos. I said quietly to the stars outside. The way I saw it, both the macros and the Empire owed me. The only question in my mind was who was going to pay the bill first. The End This has been an Audible Frontiers production of Annihilation, written by B.V. Larson, narrated by Mark Boyette. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright 2013 by B.V. Larson. Production Copyright 2013 by Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.